Let us pray. Almighty God, who in thy wisdom and goodness has appointed the offices of rulers and parliaments for the welfare of society and the just government of men, we beseech thee to behold with thy abundant favor us, thy servants, whom thou hast been pleased to call to the performance of important trusts in this land. Let thy blessing descend upon us here in this house assembled, and grant that we may treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to promote thy honor and glory and to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and of those whose interests thou hast committed to our charge. Amen. Pray be seated. Honorable Prime Minister. sitting be exempted from the provisions of the standing orders, hours of sitting. Honorable members, the question is that the, the proceedings of today's sitting be exempted from the provisions of the standing orders, hours of sitting. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable Prime Minister. And I speak out of an abundance of caution. I beg to move on the standing order 12.5. Sorry, I beg to, yes, on the standing order 12.5. Oh, we just, oh, we just did that, yeah. yes. I want to, out of an abundance of caution, Madam Speaker, I would indicate to give the advice that if we are coming close to completion at Two o'clock thereabouts, we may, be, we may extend and take a late lunch. Because we have two bills here, um, which I don't believe we're going to have a lot of. I don't think there's much controversy about them. Um, so I, I, I don't know how long we will take. But I just make that suggestion. Very well. Madam Clark. Oh, and and oh, Madam, Madam Speaker, may I just table these uh, minutes of the Select Committee? Yes. In, both, in relation to both bills today, the Criminal Code Amendment Bill and the Firearms Amendment Bill. Orders of the day, Criminal Code Amendment Bill 2024. Yes. Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, we had already had the first reading of this particular bill, and it had gone through um, select committee. So indeed, what we are simply doing is moving the second reading. I beg to move that a bill for an act to amend the Criminal Code, Chapter 171 of the Laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Revised Edition 2009, be read a second time. Honorable members, the question is that a bill for an act to amend the Criminal Code, Chapter 171 of the Laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Revised Edition, 2009, be read a second time. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. Aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Debate on the bill. Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker. This bill to amend the penalties 
for various offenses, sexual offenses, under Chapter 8 of the Criminal Code. This is a matter which I believe that all of us here and all right-thinking persons who are listening would know that the public, the general public, certainly right-thinking persons in the public, have been asking that these penalties be reviewed and be reviewed upwards. A second concern in the public domain has been, in addition to amending penalties, to look at an overall review of sexual offenses. For example, in this modern world, and we are seeing certain changes taking place, behavioral changes, this was felt that, for example, the, the definition of rape, which currently excludes anal sex without consent. That is not part of the definition of rape. The, the penalty for rape through vaginal intercourse is the only way under the law it can be committed. That is to say vaginal, vaginal intercourse without consent. And the penalty for that is life. But the only penalty in relation to anal sex, and anal sex, which I'm addressing here now, regarding without consent, you can only get the maximum which is prescribed for buggery, which is seven years. So that's one example. Um, there are others. Madam Speaker, we had been doing a review, but it appears that the consultant... ...offenses. It's a blight on our country. And it is something that we can address. So, now that the signal is sent, that penalties... You do this thing, you are going to suffer a more serious penalty. That is the right signal. But we also have to say, you do this thing, we are going to make sure that you are caught and that you are prosecuted. That is the only way that these penalties are going to mean anything to anyone who commits such an offense. And so that means, Madam Speaker, it has to be bolstered with increase effectiveness of the sexual offenses unit in the police service and the police service overall in our social agencies to ensure that the message that is being conveyed here is reinforced by these various other mechanisms that are necessary to convey the message with credibility. Do we have to do the investigation in a way that is sensitive and effective in sexual offenses against women and girls? Indications are, Madam Speaker, that we are falling short, very much so, in these areas. And when we do this, Madam Speaker, of course, the harm is irreparable. It is still pervasive within our society, for people to think 
that a sexual offense, that rape, sexual touching, any sort of sexual offense is conflated with sex. That it can be fixed by simply talking through the situation, the problem, so that it doesn't happen again. By offering money or some inducement so that the matter goes away as if that fixes the problem. The harm that is lifelong is not fully appreciated still within our society. This is where the education comes in. In our schools, young boys in particular, exhibiting behavior towards the female members of their class that is inappropriate should not be treated as just something that kids do. We should start the process of changing attitudes, of recognizing the seriousness of this offense that goes beyond penalties. There are some crimes, Madam Speaker, for which penalties can't make you whole. And the literature on sexual offenses point very clearly to the fact that this is an area where the penalties may deter, but it can't fix the harm that was done. So our emphasis has to be on preventing the harm from occurring in the first place. That, Madam Speaker, is a cause to which this parliament must commit itself and one that you would have the full support the members of this side of the house. Madam Speaker, the attitudes by what you would call, you say, grown men towards young girls The suggestion that somehow they bring it upon themselves because they're acting older than they should. We have to let it be known, Madam Speaker, that that sort of thinking that's for under the rock. That is simply not acceptable in this day and age. So, the overall problems, the broader problems, societal problems, which will not be addressed here today, and I'm not blaming the act, I'm just simply saying that we are committed to having that process not just started and proceeded, but accelerated. That is something, Madam Speaker, for which the time has come. In fact, it's overdue. The prosecution of offenses, Madam Speaker. I said earlier that penalties only matter if people think they're going to get caught. But we also have to look at the time frame that it takes to prosecute sexual offenses. The complaint I hear is that many of these cases take too long. Four to five years is too long. And that too needs to be addressed to see how that process can be accelerated so that Persons who are culpable, that they are held accountable, and that they are they pay whatever the law prescribes, and that the resources are allocated to help the victims to as much as possible heal. 
That, Madam Speaker, is something that we must accelerate that process as well. Madam Speaker, I note that a number of the offenses, I'm looking at the bill, they deal with penalties for offenses related to prostitution. And I think there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight offenses, I think, in the bill that are dealing with increasing the penalties. The clauses deal with increasing the penalties for those offenses related to prostitution. Well, of course, again, Madam Speaker, this is a broader societal problem. And we need to address the issue of, you know, do we have records? Do we know whether the incidents is increasing, declining, what support is there to prevent women, primarily, from engaging in prostitution. Madam Speaker, we are not naive people in this chamber. We don't live in a bubble. And so we know in the society some of the stories that you hear of the level of the basement that some women undergo for economic reasons. That it's a way to make ends meet. So then, Madam Speaker, when we acknowledge that, this is why I said we have to see whether the incidents are going up or down and relate that to the broader societal conditions. The economic conditions in our country, the opportunities for work, that doesn't require selling one's body or doesn't encourage it. Nothing requires it, but doesn't encourage it. Madam Speaker, as I was reading the report from the Select Committee, and the Prime Minister mentioned it, that this bill as important as it is, was put out for comment and that no one responded with a comment or came to address the select committee on the matter. That is disappointing, to be honest, because of the gravity of the social problem that is reflected in the exercise that we are undertaking here today. This is something that everybody should be interested in. You talk to people casually in the street and they tell you, well, oh, we need to make this illegal. You need to have the punishment for these persons and so forth increased. Well, punishments are being increased. But there are other issues as I've addressed here. The age of consent was discussed here earlier. I know that's a matter of concern to a lot of people as well. It would be good to have that is an input into the bill. Madam Speaker, this is only the beginning. I want to know that this blight, this scourge, Of our, on our society, on life in our country, this threat to the well-being, particularly of young girls, 
that it is addressed urgently? And effectively, too many stories are stories of heartache and heartbreak that could be avoided. I do hope, Madam Speaker, that the publication of the increased penalties will initiate a serious and urgent discussion, broadly speaking, that will send a message that enough is enough. As a society, we are going to deal with this problem. Because it is not just a problem of the individual or particular family. It is not normal behavior. To be targeting young girls and vulnerable women. To exploit for sexual pleasure because of the particular circumstances. That is reprehensible behavior that should be denounced, punished, and by any means necessary and available to us to be prevented. Madam Speaker, we talk about the situation of vulnerable girls, young women. But there's also the pervasive problem in the workplace of sexual harassment, sexual exploitation because of uneven levels of um, power within the organization and because of economic exigencies. That has to be part of the overall reform of the sexual offenses legislation in this country. The sooner we do it, the better. I'm obliged. For the debate, for the debate, I recognize the honorable member for Central Kingston. Yes, Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Yes. I rise to make a small contribution to this debate for the, for the main part uncontentious. I think we have fairly well captured this in the presentation made by the Honorable Prime Minister as a mover of the debate, the discussion, and in the support and elucidation given by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. I accept and agree that in the Select Committee there was fair unanimity in that, as the Prime Minister has said, we should signal the society of the no-nonsense approach that we in this Parliament will take to these sexual offenses identified and walked through today by the Honourable Prime Minister. Having said that, Madam Speaker, I can't help but to repeat what is a fairly common statement in our society. 
what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his soul? And more often than not, when that statement is raised, it's a biblical or a Christian context. But the direction also relates, Madam Speaker, to those of us who have an interest in shaping public policy on national development. What does this profit us as a society to have great gains, economic, financial, and otherwise, but at the same process, lose the social fabric of our society. And the fact that we have, with some haste, justified haste, brought this legislation here this morning for discussion, is more than an acknowledgement that we have a challenge on our hand and that the challenge is of a non-political nature because when the rain falls, it doesn't fall, as I said, on one man's house. And there is more than justification for our fears and our apprehensions because they are captured in the criminal reports by our law and order forces, the police. Sometimes it is sick and saddening to see what dominates our weekly newspapers, the extent to which crime, violence, in particular those of a sexual nature, dominate the front pages, not too often the back pages, they leave that for sports, but page one, two, and three, and occasionally into the editorial columns. It is obvious, Madam Speaker, that this is an item to which we must be at Edom, we must be at one to do what the Honorable Leader of the Opposition said. Not just recognize the penalties, but to stamp out the scourge in our societies because it is real, very real. And speak if I make a, just a temporary departure, but relevant to my conversation. I've had the experience as an international traveler in some far off lands where you go to conferences, symposiums, summits, call them what you may. And in the very elevators that you're riding up and down, there are women who are positioned and are involved in solicitation. I'm sure the Prime Minister knows of this and have seen this and others who have traveled have had these experiences. And there's those great temptations. And sometimes, we, even when they get up into a high rise building, they look down on the street. You see the ladies of the night parading. And some places, sometimes you're told that it's, it is the culture. Sometimes you're told that also, don't get tricked, don't be misled. Some of them are going through this process and exercise for the purpose of paying for their education and doing X, Y, and Z. And you should have a different view to what you're witnessing and experiencing. But it's real, Madam Speaker. It's real because sometimes we have stories within stories. Right here at home, not so long ago, we had another heinous crime. A young girl, I think it's about the age of 17, who was murdered, tragically. And you hear that report, and you naturally are offended 
turns you upside down. What's worse, Madam Speaker, is sometimes when you also hear that within that story, reports, and allow me to move away to that, from that specific example so that I don't get caught in personalization, but sometimes that you hear that within our society, Mothers sell the girls. You hear that? You hear those stories. And we can't be naive that we don't hear these talks or those conversations. Quite a few months ago, I had referred to a prostitution statement and experience, and I was taken to task and pieces of it. But it is real. And I may make and repeat my comment when I speak on the Deferred Arms Act. Because one of the things that we have to come to grips with in this parliament, that so often the agendas that we are properly attending to, the seriousness that occupies and troubles our spirit, we are a little less sensitive to the fact that there is in society a too high number of people, and I'm being guarded to qualify it as to whether it is young people, old people, or, or middle-aged or different people, but too high a number of people who have little or no concern to what we're talking about or addressing. They're not even of this world, of this conversation, of these concerns that we're talking about. They have long taken leave of societal norms. All the crazy. Let me do my own thing. This is my business. And they develop a lifestyle that presents all of us with, with problems. Invariably, something ends before the court. Many end up in prison, many end up in the cemetery. But it's an alternative lifestyle. And maybe it's, it may be the responsibility of the government to start to dig deep and to, to get those who are better trained or specially trained in those areas of criminologists, of sociologists, of psychologists, of behavioralists, to do the research and to see if we could come to grips with how much our cultures are changing to manifest and reflect the departures from societal norms in which we are losing our soul. Very delicate, very delicate and very important discussion conversation. I use an example, Madam Speaker. Not directly related to this criminal code conversation, but maybe a, a close cousin. We have, or the government has, for example, in try, trying to address crime and violence in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, promoted the notion, for example, of pan against crime. Has it worked or hasn't worked? Maybe the jury is still out. But Trinidad and Tobago is the land of the steel ban. They invented the steel ban. You can't like pan more than Trinidad and Tobago. But the crime, sky high. Sports and development as another avenue. Jamaica, the Caribbean king and queen of sports. Jamaica, crime, violence, sky high. We need not so bad on his crime reports. We don't know what they're doing right or if the benefits or gains are accidental. We don't know. 
In short, there may be a case and an argument for deeper research, be it our universities. We don't know. It must be troubling, as the Prime Minister identified and Dr. Friday, the leader of the opposition, um, expanded, that this particular piece of legislation went out for invitations, for commentary, and for guidance. And the churches, I'm not going to Christian Council, didn't think it was of the moment. The Bar Association didn't think it was of the moment. Those in charge of a women's movement didn't think it's of the movement of the moment. The educational educators didn't think it's of the moment. John Public didn't think it's of the moment. That's Ralph and them business, Friday and them business. They had nothing to do. But we had a problem with punishing those who offend the law. But it's clear to all of us who are in here on both sides of the house that the solution to this a multifaceted, it's interdisciplinary, it's all embracing. It involves you, Minister Brewster, social development. It involves Minister Curtis King, who is not here in education. It involves the Minister of Finance. It involves the Minister of Public Health. It involves the Minister of um, National Security. Those who are in the productive sectors, in tourism and in agriculture. Urban development. And so we have our work cut out for us, Madam Speaker. You know, recently there was um, a news experience that I had that I found particularly revolting. Because the news item actually disclosed a young man, and I know him well, he's from my constituency. I thought he was rehabbing, but clearly uh, in that report, he hadn't made any progress. But they called him by name. And the offense that he committed. But what saddened me is they called the people who he offended. In a news item. You set out to name and shame a worthless man. You have to reference the woman whose home was violated. I mean, nobody couldn't thought, could not have thought through that. That's that name not to be in on television or on radio or in a newspaper. Are you with me? I mean, why her name has to be there? Has been violated in the way described by this scum bag. Because that's what people like that are. We've got to pay attention sometimes when we're addressing some of these matters that we take responsibility for all the course of our actions. So, Madam Speaker, I, I accept because that's the direction that the, the, um, the Prime Minister started on and, and Dr. Friday, leader of the opposition, um, developed. These are signals but this is more than signals. It's an indication that we are taking not giant steps, but important steps to deal with a societal scourge. In this case, sexual violence for the main part. The problem is far too pervasive the social and moral decay on steroids and we must address it the best we can and deal with it summarily even if singularly and singularly here I mean without those who should be lending us a helping hand in the exercise Although, of course, it would be better if we are all on the board, all hands on deck. But we must deal with it. We must send these serious signals and we must work even harder to understand 
that all parties who can contribute to that, including the judicial system, three, four, five years to address these matters. It's too long. And we talk about them here as standalone events, you know, buggery and um, kidnapping people, like these are my words, and taking advantage of people. But invariably, one leads to that sometimes it actually led to a murder, a crime. It doesn't, you know, that's what happens sometimes. We have to deal with it. We have to demonstrate that on some matters, we have one voice. And on this matter, we in this chamber, we in this house, would move expeditiously and leave no stones unturned in arresting the social decay in our society. And as is captured in one of our songs, set out to build a better St. Vincent. Much obliged, Madam Speaker. For the debate, as I recognize Honorable Senator Bob. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it would be remiss of me not to rise and give my full and unwavering support to these impending amendments to the criminal code. I am pleased to see. I'm not hearing you so clearly. I don't. Continue. Yes, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to see and to say that this government is a problem solving government, in that we saw the need for increasing penalties to the Sexual Offenses Act. We heard the cries of the public in relation to more stringent penalties. And of significance, Madam Speaker, is the expeditious manner in which we tackled this issue. And for that, I'm very pleased this morning. It follows to say, Madam Speaker, that this government is in tune with the people of the nation, and there's no disconnect in that we continue to deliver when required to do so, and thereby progress in our government, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Madam Speaker, Allow me to give a little background information. So my first thing coming out of law school was at the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions where I was Crown Counsel prosecuting many criminal offenses. And Madam Speaker, 85% of the matters which I had conduct for were in fact sexual offenses. And in relation to that 85%, Madam Speaker, 90% of these offenses would have been against victims under the age of 18 or at least 15 and under, Madam Speaker. So these amendments are very dear to me. In fact, my first matter that I did as a prosecutor was a sexual matter. And it was a solo matter. I was supervised then by the no. Magistrate John Bala, and I realized then that we had some serious issues in relation to sexual offenses here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and especially in relation to, to special needs persons, Madam Speaker. So at the time, the criminal code was like a Bible to me, and I am very pleased this morning that we are here having this debate so as to assist or facilitate um, the getting justice for these victims, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in my mind, the aims of punishment, the aims of sentencing, 
comes to the forefront, Madam Speaker, because I would like to think that when we approached this issue, our main aim was deterrence of these offenses in our society. So the idea is that the stronger the penalties, the more deterrent of a factor it would play against potential offenders or repeat offenders. So the idea again is that the harsher the punishment, the more it is likely to discourage the offenders, Madam Speaker. And also accountability comes to mind because we in fact have to hold ourselves accountable and give accountability to our victims, Madam Speaker, because they are the ones that are significantly impacted. By imposing these severe consequences, society would signal that sexual offenses are unacceptable and that the victims deserve justice and that we abhor these offenses, Madam Speaker. And the main thing for me, Madam Speaker, is the protection of vulnerable individuals because I have worked with a lot of victims of sexual abuse. And I realize that in at least almost all of the instances, the victims were vulnerable individuals. So when I say vulnerable, I mean minors, children under the age of 13, even under the age of 15 who needed protection and society failed them in some way, their family failed them in some way, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it is difficult. There are challenges in the system, yes. And I am, we have made some steps towards making it easier for these victims in that we have, I heard the opposition leader speak about not having like a specialized unit in the police service, but we do have the sexual offenses unit that deals specifically with sexual offenses and they are in fact experts. They are in fact experts in that area and it makes it a lot easier for prosecutors to work with these victims, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it is difficult to get a child 10 years, 8 years, 12 years to go on a stand in court in front of a nine-member jury to give a recount of what happened. So sometimes when we see the delays in the system because a matter takes three, four, or five years to prosecute, it's not because it's deliberately being delayed. It is because there are challenges, challenges in that some victims do not wish to come and give a recount. They're not ready to give a recount of what happened. They do not know how to deal with it, even though they are given counseling. And I speak from experience because, like I said, my first matter was a sexual offenses matter. She was a special needs student. And at the time, that matter took seven years before it came to the court, before she realized that she was capable of coming in front of persons in society to give evidence and to recount what had happened to her. So, yes, we now have special med measures in place, so victims are now able to give evidence from separate locations, locations via video link, and that, to me, is a major step in facilitating justice here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, I would also like to, 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 touch on, to touch on the point of domestic relationship because we normally overlook these types of relationship and sometimes the victims are in relationship with the offenders, with their partners and because of the stigma, the shame that is attached to these type of offenses, they do not want to come forward, they do not want to come forward to say, this is a person I trusted, this is a person I would have had a relationship with who offended me in this way. And it goes back again to educating society, yes, but we also have to uplift our women and recognize when there are need, there's a need for assistance in getting them to the point where they need to be. So our offenders, yes, they, they take advantage of the vulnerable women, they, they do what I like to think of Mavado in my head when he, when he sang Tom Parrop. 
So they want to thump her up literally and figuratively in the bedroom. And that also should not be acceptable in society, Madam Speaker. I also would like to touch on concern physical and mentally disabled students. And I am so grateful that I saw, I was so happy when I saw the increase in penalty to the section which um, concerns intercourse with a defective, Madam Speaker, because these are the persons who are incapable of protecting themselves and require protection from family members, from relatives, and from the entire society as a whole. We often overlook them because they are not able to come forward and to say, this is what happened, Madam Speaker. But now that it is out there in the public, there's a bit of exposure on this section. I am hoping now that we, we see more cases coming to the court in relation to these types of offenses. Madam Speaker, we talk about the need for increased effectiveness with stakeholders. However, like I said, because of the challenges with the nature of the offense itself, the shame, the stigma that, that is attached, we do not, sometimes we do not understand what goes on in a, victim, a victim's mind because they are abused at a young age, for example. And then at the time when they are abused, their peers may not know because they are too young to understand what is happening. But they go through life with a stigma attached to them. They go through life with certain shame attached to them. They become antisocial persons. They don't, they, they don't trust persons. They, are distrust. they do not trust the public at all, Madam Speaker. And we... We overlook these situations sometimes because they do not speak and say, what is the issue, Madam Speaker? However, Madam Speaker, I believe that each of us have a part to play. Yes, there is a need for education, but each of us have our own part to play in that growing up, I would have seen, I would have seen a false hand instance where a brothel was being conducted in my neighborhood. And at the time, I didn't know. And I knew someone there because I went to school with the person. And at the time, I never knew there was an offense. We as a society, we go about, we say, this is not my business. In the same case of domestic relationship, they would say, yes, that is a man and a woman's business. But we need to realize that it is everyone's business if sexual offenses are so prevalent in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And we need to have those numbers in relation to victims reduced. It is everyone's business. We need to report, make reports, and we need to encourage persons to make report and stop shying away saying, okay, yes, I am not getting myself involved in that because we become part of the problem, Madam Speaker. And when I heard that there were no feedback and the bill was sent out into the public, I was very disheartened because of this exact reason because normally when something comes out in the public, we hear a lot of public outcry. We hear that the government isn't doing this. Okay, they're not supporting us. But at the end of the day, when we require feedback and support, it, it is not given to us, Madam Speaker. And we need to realize that each of us have a part to play. I encourage everyone to recognize and to do their part, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in this day and age of social media and technology, it is very difficult to keep these types of offenses private. It's very difficult to keep things under wrap. And the fact that when something happens to a particular victim, it is out there in the public, it goes to significant psychological, emotional impact on that victim. And we love to talk about proportionality in relation to offenses. But we need to also realize that the more, impo the, the, the more significant the impact on the victim, then the more stringent that the punishment needs to be. So yes, we talk about rehabilitation of offenders in our aims of sentencing. But Madam Speaker, we also need to talk about punishment of offenders because yes, we want to rehabilitate them, but 
in the in the long run they would be back out on the streets these victims would be seeing their offenders living a, a normal life and they are still not able to live a normal life because they are scarred for life they cannot function in certain environment and i like to think of it that they're figuratively speaking that they are basically the living dead so figuratively to me it would be like murder you have committed murder against someone because they cannot live a full life but you are out here living a full life therefore madam speak i was so happy to see these increase in penalties because the longer we keep them away from the public the the more we create a safer space for victims who are recovering and recouping from these types of offenses the like i said before madam speaker prevention of these offenses it the onus is on all of us here today to help victims to go forward with their lives and we need to encourage our peers, our friends, our families, our relatives, our co-workers, Madam Speaker, that when we have these issues in the public, you give feedback in your own personal space. When it, but when it is required in a public space, we shy away. And that is very necessary, Madam Speaker. We need to be able to hold ourselves accountable. Madam Speaker, Yes, we might argue that these excessive prison sentences might want. We, we put a strain in our prisons, Madam Speaker. But we have to always do a balancing exercise to ensure that. I like to say in law, well, there's a saying in law that justice must be done. Justice must be done, must not only be done, but also be seen to be done, Madam Speaker. And when we have, when we have these persons back out on the street, in five years time, 10 years time, what kind of message are we sending to our victims? They're the ones who don't want to come forward because they're like, yes, the, 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 the system has failed me. Madam Sikai once did a matter, it's not related to any of the amendments here, but in relation to buggery, where the offender was close to 40 and the victim was a nine or 10 year old special needs student, Madam Speaker. And at the end of the day, having gone through a full trial and doing everything that I had to do, this person got five years, <laughs> six months imprisonment. And that is very ridiculous to me, Madam Speaker. It shows that we really need to put on the wheels in getting these penalties for these types of offenses increase so that we can show that justice is being done here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, I do not wish to speak long and <laughs> winded on this topic because it is really non-contentious, but I would love to, to acknowledge the work that we are doing, that the government is doing in rising to the occasion and I like to use this term now because at the last budget debate when we didn't get up, Madam Speaker, to debate, I saw the opposition leader said, yes, these um, young senators, they failed to rise to the occasion, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, I will always rise to the occasion and it will be proven to them. Our ministers will always rise to the occasion. This government will always rise to the occasion. And contrary to what is believed on the other side of the house, Madam Speaker, being over there for 23 years demonstrates to me and indicates that they have failed to rise to the occasion. Madam for the Speaker, debate. Those are the extent of my oh, sorry. arguments. I'm obliged. For the debate. I <laughs> I recognize the Honorable Member for West Kingstown. Thank you. Uh, Madam Speaker, it was not my intention to participate in this important discussion. 
on the bill before us. Let me begin by saying, like the leader of the opposition, I do support this bill 100%. But Madam Speaker, Uh, yes. uh, Madam Speaker, when uh, one comes to Parliament to debate matters of these kinds, kind, it ought to be done in an atmosphere devoid of silly partisan politics. Mm -hmm. To hear from a young, trained female Vincentian wishing to give applause to the government for a late, very late, small effect bill is very discouraging. I join with the leader of the opposition in recognizing the importance of going beyond increasing the penalties to make it obvious to our population that we are seriously concerned with these kinds of criminal activities and that therefore in the process, Madam Speaker, put mechanisms in place that can really address these vexing issues of sexual offenses. And I wish to make one small recommendation along those lines today. I have done it in, on radio and in other forums before, and I think I can't miss the opportunity to say here today that for me as a man, as a parent, the number of occurrences in this country of young girls going to the hospital and delivering children of very immature age is far too frequent and seems to be happening without anybody being alarmed. The ministry puts out statistics the Ministry of Health, about how many young people under 15 and under what have delivered babies at the hospital. That's it. That's it. Madam Speaker, I am going to make a recommendation to this House, which I hope will be listened to and acted upon. I am going to suggest, Madam Speaker, that where a child under the allowable age gets pregnant and have a child at, at hospital or at home or wherever, several steps be taken. One, that that child must become a ward of the state of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. First step. Secondly, that like the procedures of crime bill, where there is reasonable grounds, the members of that household and persons who have been associated with that child must be DNA tested where there's reasonable ground. And once and if there is a connection, that individual must be charged for the crime, must be charged. The state must go further, Madam Speaker, to provide for the welfare of the child and the mother, and where possible and necessary, make sure that the father is a major contributor to that. In fact, I wish to recommend even to go further, as is done in the, in the procedures of crime Bill, if the father is of means 
to seize property, to seize resources, and make it available to make to show that the the mother and child are looked after from from those resources. Madam Speaker, I make this recommendation after very careful consideration. And I do believe that in our society, we need to send the right signal to act as a deterrent. And I tell you from whence I draw this conclusion. When I was managing the CWSA, people were disconnect, were using the water supply, taking off the meters, and carrying on as if nobody cared. We introduced some very stringent regulations. And I tell you, Madam Speaker, some of them we never had to use. Some of them, as soon as we demonstrated that we are serious, immediately we saw a complete change in people's behavior. Complete change. So, Madam Speaker, the, the point is we need to demonstrate to all and sundry that this kind of behavior is unacceptable and the state cannot sit by and simply say that six underage children, uh, children had children at the hospital because these young ladies don't have a chance at education. The state must ensure that these victims as children who become mothers must be given the necessary support to continue their education and to become regular citizens in society. Madam Speaker, I, I do not intend to be long on this bill. As I said, I support the measures of punishment, but I pray that this proposal receive a listening ear because St. Vincent and the Grenadines need to change and to change seriously. I thank you. For the debate, I recognize the Honorable Minister National Mobilization. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I am very happy to be making a contribution to this bill today in this Honorable House. And I must say immediately that I'm happy as well that we have support on both sides of the house. And Madam Speaker, these amendments today are critical and they are also timely. Madam Speaker, I would say that they are timely because when I looked at the amendments within this bill, I noticed there are sections that were amended that relates to child or children. And this month, as the Prime Minister mentioned earlier, is the month where we celebrate, where, where we recognize and put whatever measures we can for the deterrence from children being abused here in St. Vincent. And it is also the month where it is recognized globally as Child Abuse Aware and Prevention Month. And Madam Speaker, I just crave your indulgence. This year, I just want to just quickly 
mention the theme for this year that states, don't let abuse be your child's story. Make a change, end child abuse. And Madam Speaker, on the issue of abuse as it relates to the child or children here, I want to mention briefly, according to the data collected by the Child Development Division in 2023, we received approximately 241 reports of children being abused or neglected. And this was a slight increase from the year before. Um, and I want to break it out. Approximately 43% of the reports were classified as victims of child neglect and abandonment. 37% as victims of sexual abuse, which relates to this bill and 17% as victims of physical abuse, and 3% victims of psychological abuse. Madam Speaker, it is important when we are discussing the amendments to, these, to, the, to this bill specifically, that we highlight from whence we came. And it is not about being partisan or about scoring political points. But in order for us to know where we are going, we must be able to acknowledge from whence we came. And with those critical information, we can make decisions to know how we move forward in the very near future. Madam Speaker, as the minister with the responsibility for, for gender affairs, these amendments to this bill is related very closely to that division within the ministry. And Madam Speaker, these amendments is a form of empowerment for women and girls. There are some who may highlight the negative aspects of these amendments. Yes, we might need more years. But I must always rem remind us that Rome was not built in one day. And as a child, there are stages in development. A child don't come out of his stomach and stand up immediately. There are stages. But from whence we came, Madam Speaker, I must say, before this government, there was no gender affairs division. There was a woman's desk. There was a woman's desk with one person seated, seated at that desk that had to deal with a multiplicity of issues touching and concerning women. And Madam Speaker, this government saw it fit that over the years we have expanded and developed this aspect of the ministry as it relates to women and girls here in our country. And this bill that is before us today is also a signal as to how much we value our women and girls here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, in the amendments, I want to go into the bill very quickly. Clause 15, Section 138, which deals with the procurement of a woman by a woman by threat. We see there that they're moving the penalty from two years to seven years. Clause 16, also an aspect to protect our women and girls. Procurement of a woman by false pretense. And they're moving the penalty 
from two years to seven years. And Madam Speaker, these are very important. These two increases in the penalties. What is this saying to us? It is saying to us here in this house and to our country that we value our women. We value our women, and not only by words, but what we are seeing here today is showing action. And we all know the saying that action speaks louder than words. Madam Speaker, the bill also points to protecting our children here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And Madam Speaker, we cannot run away from the fact that the public has discussed this before. This is a public issue. Whenever we have situations where there is an underage child being sexually abused, we hear commentary from all the media houses. We hear commentary from the other side of the house that there, there, there needs to be more, more needs to be done. And this today is part and parcel. It is not the con it is not the entire solution, but it is a step in the right direction, and it is showing our intent. Madam Speaker, I want to touch uh, on a few of the clauses because maybe when Prime Minister highlighted it, some folks were not paying attention. Clause 2 of the bill, intercourse with a girl under 15. And Madam Speaker, this is a significant increase. And we are moving the penalty from 5 years to 15 years. But there is one, Madam Speaker, that is very close to my heart. And that is clause three of this bill, section 126. And the Honorable Senator Bob highlighted it before. Intercourse with a defective. Madam Speaker, this is a serious issue. This is an issue that affects our country on a whole. And as the minister with the responsibility for persons with disability, I know that the organization, the organizations that helps with the disabled here in our country, they, they would be happy to know that there is going to be an increase for, for perpetrators and offenders who commit these heinous crimes. And, Madam Speaker, they're moving the penalty on this one for intercourse with a defective from five years to 15 years. And this is, this, is, this, is, this is fundamental. And I'm happy that we have support. But what I'm not happy about is that this bill went out to the public for commentary. And we have so many organizations here that work, that work with women and girls, with persons with disabilities. We have a lot of NGOs. And I'm very disappointed that we did not get feedback from many of these organizations. 
But we have to do our work. We have to do our work. We have to make sure that even though some folks may not be paying close attention to this, we have to make sure that we do our work. So whenever a situation of this sort comes up again, there are measures in place to combat these issues. Madam Speaker, I listened to the leader of the opposition as he mentioned that, yes, the penalties are, the increase in penalties are needed, but they are just a mere deterrence from, from, from the real thing that, 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 and we must pay closer attention. Yes, there are, there, there are areas that we must pay closer attention. But they are not just mere deterrents. And I want to highlight several reasons why the increase in these penalties are important. Deterrence being number one. Madam Speaker, higher penalties acts as a stronger deterrent to potential offenders. And that is a fact. That is a fact. Because it sends a signal that there are more severe consequences. And this, in turn, can dissuade individuals from committing such acts. But, Madam Speaker, these penalties, the increase in these penalties, are also an area where justice is being served for victims. It's not just a deterrence, because you have to remember the victims in these situations. And Madam Speaker, more substantial penalties. It shows the victim that we recognize that what was done to them, we are not taking it as a sleight of hand. And Madam Speaker, you may ask why. This is important. Justice for victims are a part of the healing process. Many times, victims are not satisfied because justice was not served. But an increase in the penalties, we are showing that our 12 victims that we are supporting them. Madam Speaker, the increase in these penalties also is a prevention mechanism for reoccurrences. So it's a deterrence, it's justice for the victims, and it's a prevention mechanism for reoccurrences. Madam Speaker, as mentioned by Senator Bob, some offenders are comfortable because the penalty is so low that, you know, I can repeat the thing. But I am sure that they're going to think twice now before they repeat such offenses as it relates to those that we are seeing in this bill today. Madam Speaker, also public safety is also a critical aspect as to why we are increasing these penalties. Higher penalties show society that we are trying to eliminate the threat of persons being potential victims. It ensures the offenders are either incarcerated for longer periods and this reduces their opportunities to offend again. Madam Speaker, also this is also critical because we are showing social condemnation. And they say, as there's nothing like a woman's scorn. And it is important that we show 
as a society that we are condemning these acts perpetrated against our women and girls. But also, I don't want us to lose sight that there are males involved in these bills and, and our boys as well. I don't want us to lose sight as that, of that. So, Madam Speaker, this is sending a, a message of social condemnation to all the perpetrators. Madam Speaker, you might ask, what has the government been doing to help to tackle and combat these issues? Madam Speaker, when we have such cases, there are various mechanisms that we put in place. There are various programs that we put in place to help with this issue. Madam Speaker, over the years, the Ministry of National Mobilization, we have been doing victim support programs. And we've been doing these with various entities and organizations, such as the churches, schools, non-governmental organization. Madam Speaker, I have been at graduation ceremonies and you would not see these because we do not want to highlight the faces of some of the persons who were victims. But we have been doing empowering programs to help women and girls who were abused and affected to get back on their feet. Madam Speaker, we've been doing parent education programs throughout the schools to work with the parents, to, to, to let them know how to spot these issues with their, with their, with their girl, child, or, or children. And Madam Speaker, we have also been strengthening the mechanisms for reporting and supporting. Madam Speaker, before, there was no clear pathway. You had a case, you go to the police because the women's desk could not handle that back in the day. But Madam Speaker, this government, we have made it mandatory that any person who is affected sexually or abused sexually or molested, there is a referral pathway. It is between the Ministry of National Mobilization, Ministry of Health, Ministry of National Security with the police, and we have opened up the area where you can go and report. You do not have to go directly to the police. You can come to the ministry. You can start with the ministry. You can start at, at, at health. So there is a pathway created where victims or persons who are abused can enter it at any point. So, Madam Speaker, yes, we are doing a lot to help in these instances. Is it enough? It will never be enough because there's always room for improvement. But, Madam Speaker, we have to be realistic about some of the shortfalls. And I want to echo while I'm making this presentation. Madam Speaker, many times, and it hurts me as a parent and as a father, we have persons, young girls, who comes to the ministry with these cases. And Madam Speaker, we activate everything that we have within the ministry. Get all the necessary closed door, the, the necessary support in closed door because they don't want it to be public. And Madam Speaker, we go through all the processes. And lo and behold, a week, two weeks later, when you call to follow up on this case, to move this case forward, we hear on the other end, oh, we are not bothering with it anymore. And that is one of the reality we have to deal with. And I want to make an appeal. Do not shelter 
the offenders and perpetrators of these heinous acts. We are doing our work from the government side. But like the member from Central Kingston said, it is all hands on deck in order for us to combat and to tackle these scourges on our society. This is not about pointing finger, about scoring cheap political points. This is a serious issue and we have to address it in a serious nature. So Madam Speaker, I'm happy today to make this contribution to this bill. And I implore the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to pay more, to pay close attention to these things. And let us do this work hand in hand. Madam Speaker, I'm obliged. For the debate, yes, I recognize Honorable Senator John. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And uh, I also rise to make my contribution to the debate on this bill, Criminal Code Amendment, the Amendment to the Criminal Code Bill, Chapter 171 of the Laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, uh, a bill which seeks to modify the penalties for sexual offenses, and what I can see here, penalties ranging from, well, amendments ranging from 10 years up to 20 years. And, uh, Madam Speaker, the issue of sexual offenses is a vexing one for mothers, for concerned citizens. And I'm, as the Leader of the Opposition stated, Honorable Leader of the Opposition stated, we on this side support these amendments. Again, Madam Speaker, there is nothing that we should bring about here that should be political. Persons who are affected when they are affected, they do not see red, yellow, black, or blue. It's the psychological impact on them and the society that they have to face and the perpetrators that they have to face, Madam Speaker. That is what affects them. So on, in this chamber, I'm happy that we are one when it comes to this. And Madam Speaker, you know, over the years I have been in this chamber, I have been calling for increased penalties and, and, and also to look for us to look at ways in which we can address the issue of sexual violence, sexual assault on a whole domestic violence for the citizens of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, this does not start here, and as the Honorable Minister of mobilization stated a while ago, there are stages. So this started way back when we talk about the rape and when we talk about uh, abuse, biblical days. If you remember, those of us who read our Bibles well, the issue of Dinah and what happened to her when she was raped. And there were punishments for that. Her brothers punished that, that, that tribe so we have to take it here as well, Madam Speaker, when we, when we are discussing these issues. And we talk about 23, 24, 25, 30 years ago, we had a woman's desk. Woman's desk dealing with issues, stages of development, Madam Speaker. So there was none before. Then we have a woman's desk. More issues come to hand. We need more hands on deck to deal with these issues. So there is a ministry established for that gender affairs. And as the Prime Minister alluded earlier, we will have further discussion on even more of the, the, the regulation, regulations 
in terms of other things, and you talk about LGBT, etc. So, obviously, at another stage, there may be the need for another ministry to deal with more of these issues. So we have to look at that carefully, Madam Speaker. I am concerned, and I'm sure everyone in this honorable house is concerned about our little boys and our little girls, our precious gem, Madam Speaker, and the way in which we have seen a trajectory. Over the years, when we look at the front page, what we are seeing under the age of two, under the age of five, being assaulted and abused. And Madam Speaker, we questioned why. What is it that can cause a man or woman to look at a two-year-old child and do what they have to do in that manner? And I throw this question out because, Madam Speaker, when we look at the persons who are the abusers, they are persons who are close to these children. They are men in high society, teachers, doctors, lawyers, the man on the street too, politicians, we have them. Madam Speaker, they are not immune at all. And I'm happy that it starts here in this Honorable House where we have increased the penalties for these type of social ills, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, when we look at it, the old people say an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. And whether I'm happy that it takes a, a, a certain amount of time, so I'm thinking that some deep analysis was done on the government side to now bring this to the Honorable House. Because there have been public outcries. Four years penalty for a man in our justice system, which was never accepted in our public domain. But Madam Speaker, we must look at some of the factors. We cannot shy away from it. And I'm happy that the Prime Minister said further down, we will have more discussions on even preventative measures that can be taken to make sure that we see a reduction in the amount of sexual abuse cases that are coming to the public. And Madam Speaker, I heard the minister say 37% last year um, of the 241 reports that were made were victims of sexual abuse. That is not to be slighted. 37% is a high amount a high number that we have to deal with in a small society. And we know, Madam Speaker, that this cause goes some time way beyond what we can imagine. But we can also relate to it, Madam Speaker. And sometimes, Madam Speaker, we have to look Look at the conditions in which these children, these women, these little boys, the condition in which they are living. Some of them are exposed, Madam Speaker. And let's face reality. There are some young boys, little boys, little girls who are living in disadvantaged homes. And they are, Madam Speaker, when we look, they're raised in uh, the care of sometimes stepmothers, stepfathers, 
who can become very abusive. We also look at the case where some of them are only in a single bedroom home with probably five, six, seven children sleeping in a single bed. These children are exposed to sexual behaviors. And they may think, they may think that it is acceptable, Madam Speaker. This is something that we must address in ensuring that prevention takes place before we have this cure of 15 and 10 and 12 and 7 years. Madam Speaker, we can also look at our little girls and boys. They are vulnerable. The love and the care that the big men show to them, they think that it is something and then they just fall for it, Madam Speaker. How do we address that issue? That's the question we have to ask. Because if we are going to get 17 and 20 years, we must take these and we must break them down. Ministry of Social Mobilization has been doing their do, and we must commend them. But, Madam Speaker, we need more. 37 percent means that something is wrong somewhere, and we need more to address this issue of sexual act, uh, violence. In our homes too, Madam Speaker, there is normally a lack of communication about your sexuality. And uh, when we look at that, it suppresses a child from expressing his or herself. And that's why we would have cases where even though it is reported, that child, we, or, or, or that child does not know how to express his or herself. Madam Speaker, I have been in the teaching service for a long time, and it has come to me many times. The, I, and we are in small societies as well, Madam Speaker, where we hear of these things. And you know, one of the main problems that suppresses the report is that it is one where these children or this child who makes the report must go back either in the same home or to live with a, a relative. And because of the economically disadvantaged situations, you would hear in our own colloquial term, boy, shut up. You want to put your daddy in jail? These are the things that we are going to, we are hearing. And therefore, the child just has to keep quiet. If a teacher or the nurse or someone don't Push this, it ends right there. And especially if the, the, the abuse is in the home or if the abuse is with someone in high society, it is covered down, Madam Speaker. This is bad for society. This is bad for our children who has to live with this scourge, Madam Speaker who from time to time are reminded daily because of the small societies in which we live. They're reminded daily of what transpired, what took place. And yes, we are in child's month. And I know of, I, I think it was Break the Silence campaign that took place a, a couple of years ago, Madam Speaker, where a number of from, from the area in which I, I came, a number of our students were happy for that opportunity to speak out. Again, Madam Speaker, even though they speak, they speak, our laws are there and they must be educated as to what road 
they can take to ensure that the abusers are apprehended, that they are brought to justice. Madam Speaker, when, the, when we met at the select committee level and uh, the Prime Minister made the observation that, you know, he has not received any, any further um, interest from any other parties on the bill, I took it upon myself to invite a group of young people and went through, I went through the bill with them. Age range from 15 to about 20. And Madam Speaker, it was surprising to me of the, at least one of these, one of them had experience. But nothing was done because they were not aware and they were fearful. They were not aware of the laws. They were fearful. And you hear the stories, Madam Speaker, not only from them, because that is only a small proportion, a small sample of our population. It means that within our population, a number of them are affected. Madam Speaker, so we can talk 10 and 20 years, but we have to get back to the roots. Get our children to know their rights. Get our parents to understand that, hey, this is not in your hand anymore. This is the law and the justice system will deal with it. Whether you want to take it back or not. Madam Speaker, as a concerned mother, there is no way in the world you can imagine any of your children being touched inappropriately by a man, and I will say hard back men or women, Madam Speaker. The things that would go through your own mind. It is not easy to deal with, Madam Speaker. And, and honestly, we are human beings. So, Madam Speaker, when you look at it, I have my little princess, and I cherish her dearly. Today is her birthday. You know? And, Madam Speaker, when I watch her grow every day, I say, thank you, Lord. But I know. And that's where I leave it. I say no more to that, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, when we are looking at this, sometimes we have to look at our mothers who are covering up these situations. And the laws should deal with them. We should not leave them like that. Not because of financial gain mean that you're going to sell your daughter or your son. We should have laws in place dealing with that if there is none. Because I didn't read that, the, the chapter there in full detail. And I'm sure in the wrap-up of the Prime Minister, he would deal with that. Madam Speaker, when we look at it, we also realize that the individual not only is affected... But we also have the society being affected as well. And we know that when we have cases of sexual assault, rape, it affects the workplace. It affects productivity in the workplace. And when productivity is affected, a country's GDP will obviously be affected going down as well. So if we don't deal with it, we are going to have a country where our GDP will be affected. Little, little the 1% and the half percent is very important when it comes to a country and the GDP and our people and its productivity. We have stress faced by these people. Madam Speaker, we have the mental health of these people that must be looked at. 
And uh, when we talk about mental health, Madam Speaker, we must look at our health sector because that's where the strain is. We have to now find the resources to deal with, with these people. And Madam Speaker, in countries where you have the health sector running down already, it's additional burden on our taxpayers. So these are things that we must take closely to our heart, Madam Speaker. It is not easy. All of us may want to play blame games. Sometimes we hear, oh, the person's dress was too short. Or we may hear she was in the wrong place. But there is no excuse when it comes to issues or to us, sorry, addressing the issue of sexual abuse. Whether you're scared too short or whether you're too exposed, there is no right for anyone to come and violate you. And you know something, Madam Speaker, and what, 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 what when we look at it, the victims, you know, they know their accusers. They can tell you who they are. And because they are so afraid, as in our minors, Madam Speaker, they live with that sometimes for the rest of their lives. So in addition to that, Madam Speaker, I do hope that when we really get to the root of this, that we will look at an angle where no matter how, length, how long that length of time is, when that victim decide to speak, that the laws will deal with them. Madam Speaker, I'm much obliged. For the debate, I recognize the Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, Honorable Members. I rise this afternoon to give my full support to the proposed amendments to the Criminal Code, Chapter 171 of the laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And Madam Speaker, I do so, I celebrate today, but I can't celebrate without reflecting. And please permit me, Madam Speaker, to reflect on the many Fridays when I looked at the, front, at the front page of the newspaper and the caption had to do with something touching and concerning sexual offenses. Madam Speaker, please permit me to also reflect. And for persons who are listening to us here in Parliament today, Throughout the length and breadth of this country, in the different villages and the communities, what we are discussing here today, from time to time, will come up in what we consider to be the village gossip, spoken about on persons who are traveling on the vans, about women who are being abused, and children also being abused that fall within the context of the persons who will be impacted in the debate. And also permit me, Madam Speaker, to reflect on those parents who cried outside of the courthouse 
realizing that after the judgment, that when they realize that the term of imprisonment, the maximum, was so low, they left the courthouse with a view that they did not receive justice. Madam Speaker, when we have a discussion, and as we are seeing here today, as is shown in Clause 2, intercourse with a girl under the age of 15 years old. And in my presentation, I'm going to only focus on the children, vulnerable group extremely vulnerable. The increase from five years to 15 years. And I must commend this increase and it is something that I fully support and particularly so since in the year 2005 I had the opportunity to be a prosecutor. And Madam Speaker, I remember turning up to court sometimes on a Monday morning, prepared to address issues of justice. But when you are looking for the victim, you hear in the corridors of the courthouse and in the courtyard that something happened and this person today is going to be a no-show. Madam Speaker, I've paid very careful attention to all who have presented before. And there is a consensus that this is a problem. And not only a problem in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but a problem, I'm aware, to study in the law books throughout our region. And I am happy today. That is why I'm celebrating today, because I know this is a part of breaking the silence. Because there are many mothers <coughs> and fathers who are out there wanting to take the justice in their own hands. As the Honorable Senator Chevron John alluded to. Madam Speaker, I want to, however, focus on our schools, and particularly so because the state has a very important role to play in our schools. And our teachers are placed in a position of trust. And I remember situations years gone by. A situation may arise with a male teacher. And all you hear the next day is that the teacher was transferred from one school to another. This is a part today we're doing our role here as policymakers is to ensure that those persons out there who are listening, who may be thinking of hurting another child, hurting another woman, or harming another boy, that when they hear that the penalties are increased, as I, put, as I am addressing clause two, from five years to 15 years, those persons will start to think again. And it will be a deterrent because definitely five years, Madam Speaker, was far too low. In fact, some persons who may be in a position to do a comparative analysis as to what pertains in other societies they may tell you that even 15 years 
is still low. But it is a start. I want to commend, Madam Speaker, the hard work and dedication of the Ministry of Education over the years, recent years, in ensuring that we have counselors in the schools. And I want today to recognize these counselors for the work that they continue to do in bringing to the fore and highlighting many of the dark sides in our schools and our school system. I want, Madam Speaker, for significant public relations to take place on all of these changes which from the, the energy that I'm feeling, it is going to, we are going to see this bill, these amendments enacted. Because it's not only just for us to discuss it here and for those who are listening to us, but if we are here, Madam Speaker, to defend those who are voiceless, this must resonate through a serious public relations campaign throughout our country. I also, Madam Speaker, I want to commend the hard work of the Sexual Offenses Unit Because when we look at the statistics, there are many persons who but for that unit would not have had an opportunity to feel comfortable that they could take these persons to the justice system. I agree with the, the verbiage from the Honorable Member for Central Kingston that we need to stamp out the scourge. And also the Honorable Member for Central Leeward that we must not shelter these perpetrators. Madam Speaker, I fully support these amendments and I wish this bill a safe passage through this Honorable House. For the debate, yes, I recognize the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to make my contribution as it relates to the Bill of the Moment, the Criminal Code Amendment Bill of 2024. And I also rise to give my support for this very important bill. Madam Speaker, I'm hearing a, a, a I'm just song. about to, um, if audio. We're having an issue with it. They brought it to our attention this morning. Audio, give me a signal when you're ready. Madam Speaker, should I? No, it's not. Oh. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I was saying before that I, I rise to give my support to this bill and to make my contribution because it is a very important bill. Madam Speaker, before becoming a senator and a minister, I was always vocal on issues of sexual offenses. 
And since then, I've been just as vocal. And it would be remiss of me if I did not rise and make a contribution on this matter. It seems for me that my career somehow always involves the law. So for the first decade or so, I advised persons on the law. And primarily, as it relates to family law, many issues, including sexual offenses, featured in the advice that I gave to clients. And now, in this fair, I am part of a collective of policymakers known as Parliament, where we have the duty, the responsibility to create, and in many instances, as we are doing here, to amend the laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So it's safe to say that we are a country of laws, and it baffles me every time when I hear persons say, this country has no laws. It baffles me because laws are here. But I, I make the point all the time that laws have to be triggered. They do not operate on autopilot. They are not an automated system. It has to be triggered by certain events. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Prime Minister has traversed the relevant sections that are being amended, but I, I wanted to highlight for emphasis some of those sections because of the prevalence of the offenses that exist in our society. So, for instance, we see an amendment to section 125 where intercourse with a girl under 15 has been tripled to 15 years. Intercourse with a defective has also been increased to 15 years. Indecency with a child has moved from one year to 10 years. Madam Speaker, section 129 is being amended as it relates to permitting the use of premises for intercourse. And the penalty has been increased from 14 years to 15 years. But what we have also done with the amendment as it relates to premises is to give a clear what I would say definition or explanation as to what premises are. And this is very important because perpetrators day by day are becoming more creative and the law has to keep up. So premises in the normal sense, people may consider premises would include a house real property. But in the act and in this amendment, we've expanded premises to include vehicles. And we know, all of us here know that vehicles are one of the tools used in the commission of these sexual offenses. Vessels are also included aircrafts, and any other conveyance, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Section 130, Subsection 1, has also been amended as it relates to causing or encouraging the prostitution of a young girl under the age of 15, and that has been increased from 7 to 15 years. And it has been mentioned during this debate that it is known in our society where young women 
are being encouraged to prostitute themselves. And in the fight against sexual offenses, Madam Speaker, it has to be a collaborative fight. The responsibility to fight sexual offenses or any other type of offense for that matter does not lie solely with the government. It does not lie solely with law enforcement. All stakeholders of the society have to play a part. And as legislators, from time to time, we have to review the legal framework that exists. And Madam Speaker, we are reviewing the framework which exists as it relates to sexual offenses. And I am very pleased that we are doing so because the time is now and we cannot wait any longer. Madam Speaker, I want to set the context of the manner in which this administration has been approaching the issue as it relates to violence against women and violence against girls in particular and children. What we do as an administration, Madam Speaker, doesn't happen in a vacuum. And nothing is really isolated. In 2021, I led a delegation to Geneva, Switzerland, where we conducted, where we conducted the Universal Periodic Review, which was facilitated by the United Nations Human Rights Council. And during that review, as the minister representing the country, I gave a report and I indicated that as it relates to legislation, over the last several years, attempts have been made and we have been very successful in marshalling the necessary strengthening of the legal framework. And I'll give you an example, Madam Speaker. It is not directly related, but it is related. In 2015, the Domestic Violence Act was passed. In 2016, the Cybercrime Act was passed. And I mention these two pieces of legislation, Madam Speaker, because within the operation of those legislations and having advised clients over the years, issues of sexual offenses creep into those types of situations. So in many instances where domestic violence is present in a home, oftentimes it will be laced with some semblance of sexual offense. Madam Speaker, as it relates to the Cybercrime Act, I remember when I was in practice and the bill was brought before Parliament, there was a lot of discussion about an attempt to muzzle freedom of speech on, on social media and elsewhere. But when I looked at the bill and I looked at the provisions, this act is encompassing. So, for instance, in sections 14, 15, and 16 of the Cybercrime Act, Madam Speaker, there were provisions relating to violation of privacy, child pornography, and harassment via electronic means, as we call cyberbullying. And I mention these legislations, Madam Speaker, because oftentimes women 
are at the disadvantaged end of situations where they find that intimate moments are shared for all to see. Intimate moments that are sexually explicit in many cases. And I'm mentioning them because it shows the manner in which this administration has been developing the legal framework for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So it's not a case where we are just starting. It started a long time ago. But as has been said by the Minister of National Mobilization, everything happens in stages. And we are now at the stage where we are looking at amending the laws relating to sexual offenses. And I know that the Honorable Prime Minister has mentioned that there will be other discussions going forward. And I know that members of the public, members of this Honorable House, are pleased to hear that. But we have to address these issues and we are addressing them now. And for that reason, Madam Speaker, I give my support to this bill. Madam Speaker, in addition to the work that is done by the Ministry of National Mobilization, the Sexual Offenses Unit, I also want to highlight that there is a collective mechanism referred to as the National Human Rights Monitoring and Reporting Mechanism, which is chaired by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. And following the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review Cycle, and the completion of our presentation to the United Nations, which ended in March of 2022, we have had meetings to discuss the next steps. Because as part of that cycle, member states of the United Nations would give recommendations, and I'm happy to say, Madam Speaker, that 90% of the recommendations have been accepted by St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Within that mechanism framework, Madam Speaker, last September, I convened a meeting of the core committee of that mechanism to discuss next steps as it relates to laws under review. And the main topic that we discussed was that of sexual offenses. And it would be remiss of me, Madam Speaker, if I do not take the opportunity to thank all the members of the core committee for attending that meeting. We spent the entire day my brother, the Minister of National Mobilization, was also a part of that meeting. He and his team were there. The Commissioner of Police and his team were there. My team was there from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. And other stakeholders were there. The Attorney General's Chambers, very importantly, was there. And I want to thank each and every one of them for making the mechanism work. And admittedly, there's still a lot of work to be done, but I am satisfied that for the period in which we had to report to the United Nations, the work was done and we received commendations by our peers for the work that was done, particularly as it relates to the Domestic Violence Act, and the Cybercrime Act. So, Madam Speaker, I am mentioning all these things because, as I said, they are not directly related, but they are interconnected. And it shows the manner in which we have been developing the legal framework. So, as the legislature, we make policy. But 
there are other stakeholders in the society who have to assist with this collaborative effort. We have law enforcement, and this administration saw it fit to create a sexual offenses unit, and I would like to take the time to commend the unit for the work that they've been doing. Persons on that task force, I know personally, and I know the level of dedication that they have. Apart from policymakers and law enforcement, we have organizations within the country, civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations. Everybody has to do their part. And Madam Speaker, while I appreciate that oftentimes it is difficult for victims or virtual complainants to come forward and to tell their stories, we have to create that support system to encourage them. So the Ministry of National Mobilization provides the necessary support. And I can attest to that, Madam Speaker, because during the decade long I practiced family law, this was a ministry that I interacted with on a frequent basis. So I am not just saying that because I am here now as a member of government. I know the mechanisms exist and people just have to know that they are there and use them. But apart from the government agencies, we also have to look at the family structure. We have to look at the community. Many instances of sexual offenses are known by members of the families of the victims or virtual complainants. It is known by members in the community. And there is this famous line that the United States utilized when they ramped up their fight against terrorism. If you see something, say something, where you see something looking at odds in a public place. And we need to speak up for our victims. As I said before, Madam Speaker, the law does not operate on autopilot. It has to be triggered. It has to be triggered by a complaint. And family members, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, cousins, who know that something is happening, they need to speak up and provide that necessary support. Communities need to speak up. I have had instances where, and there's one that was very troubling to me, where someone reached out to me to tell me, to give me what I would say, maybe third-hand information about a particular issue. And there were people who knew and had evidence to put the perpetrator away. And they refused. So, Madam Speaker, if we want to stamp out the scourge of sexual offenses, we have to be prepared to act. We have to be ready. We cannot be shy about these things. Otherwise, perpetrators would become emboldened. And they would go about doing what they are doing. So, Madam Speaker, I am throwing out a challenge to my fellow Vincentians. If you see something, say something. And this is not just in relation to sexual offenses. I am speaking about all offenses. We have to come together, Madam Speaker. We have to collaborate on these issues. They are of national importance, and we ought to treat them that way. Madam Speaker, I wish this bill safe passage through this honorable house. I am very much obliged. For the debate, for the debate, recognize the honorable prime minister. Madam Speaker, honorable members, I want 
to thank all honorable members for their contributions to this debate. <clears throat> and we have heard today a veritable unanimity across this parliament on this bill. And we have heard some speeches of varying quality, but some have been quite outstanding. And I want to commend those members without naming them. <clears throat> there are some matters which I'd like to address which have arisen from the debate. Madam Speaker, I come to this subject within a wider deliberation, given some of the comments which have been made, apart from the specificities of the bill, with an experience with the criminal justice system for over 40 odd years. Called to the bar 40 odd years ago, I've been a practitioner for 20 years or so, including in the criminal courts. And since then, of course, in government, in opposition too, but in government, I would have read every single bill that has come to this parliament in the last 30 years. <clears throat> and in my current capacity as Minister of Legal Affairs and Prime Minister, I've had an obligation additionally, not just to read the bills, but to study each and every one of them. Because I am the chair of the Cabinet Subcommittee on legislation. I want to highlight a few innovations and supports for this particular bill, which reside already in the criminal justice system, reforms which we have made. I will mention very briefly, maybe a dozen or so. Madam Speaker, we all agree that the law is one thing. We have to have the detection and the prosecution and if the persons are guilty, the conviction. And there are many processes along the way which can help or hinder. We have these penalties. How do these penalties, which we have in the books, how do they manifest themselves in specific cases? And we have had several comments here about victims and their families walking away from the magistrate's court and the high court, feeling that, they are, that justice was not done. Even when somebody is found guilty and a penalty is handed down. One of the most difficult things in a magistrate's and judge's life and work, how do you sentence someone who is guilty? I know from being in a student, you know, studying law for many years, 
that it is not something in the legal education on which you spend a lot of time. You know the broad brush. Sentencing. But this is something of great significance in practical terms. And we have had two major improvements. One, ongoing judicial education on matters relating to sentencing. And indeed, magistrates and judges may fail to advance in the system if they stand askance from judicial education, which is formally organized under the auspices of the Chief Justice. And secondly, the Chief Justice has issued sentencing guidelines. Many individuals have argued that these sentences, sentencing guidelines ought to be reviewed because some may well be flawed, but more important than the review of those sentencing guidelines, the application of those sentencing guidelines. That though the sentencing guidelines make it very clear that the, these are guidelines, these are not to be applied as though they are mosaic law, that they are handed down on Mount Sinai, on tablets of stone. And some magistrates and some judges appear not to apply them with the degree of flexibility which the Chief Justice herself has indicated ought to be applied in respect of the sentencing guidelines. So that from time to time, right thinking people see reports of sentences which are, first of all, completely out of whack with the offense which has been committed and in relation to the circumstance of the individual who has committed the offense. Because clearly, an individual who is a recidivist would be expected to get a higher sentence than someone who is a first offender. But it also depends on the nature of the offense itself. Some offenses are so heinous that it is very difficult to find any feature which may act as an indicator to have a diminution of sentencing. In other words, the aggravating features of this offense may be such that the way <laughs> counterbalance, overbalance, whatever discount you may get otherwise for pleading guilty or first offense and the like. So I think that is something which there has to be a healthy discussion on in the profession and in the judiciary. Secondly, there is an amendment which was made during our time to the law where the prosecution, the police, and the DPP could appeal sentences except those related to offenses which have a, if you have a death penalty, for instance, you can't appeal against a sentence from the high court if the judge didn't sentence somebody to death. And you th the DPP thinks that it should be, to, to, you should be sentenced to death. You can't appeal that. But you can appeal other sentences. And you can appeal, the police couldn't appeal sentences handed down by the magistrate. Because sometimes the sentences are so low that there ought to be appeals. And the police and the DPP 
need to pay attention, greater attention, to that particular amendment in the law. Parliament did not act here in vain. Parliament acted in this manner because there was a mischief to be addressed. And it seems as though the presence of that law is not making the impact that it ought to have because it has not been drawn to my attention that there has been a use of that particular amendment when sentences are patently wrong. The, if, the, if the sentence is excessive in the view of the accused, you can expect that the lawyer for the accused will, will appeal. But when it goes the other way, well, if they have a lawyer, you're quite right. But the number of lawyers you have nowadays, and without me saying anything about negative about lawyers, you can pretty much get a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> so, but there are some sentences, in my view, that the, the police, or, neither the police nor the DPP could say that they think the sentence is too low and, and, and let it go by. If you really think that it is too low, I could see if you think, well, I think perhaps it could have been a little higher, but maybe... If I go on appeal, it would be the same. But there are others in which I'm urging from the floor of the parliament. You may wonder, you may ask, why I don't get interfere with, I don't, why I don't interfere with this? Well, I don't do that because there's a separation of powers. I don't get involved in that business. But as a parliamentarian here, I can express my view on the floor of the house that parliament acted in a particular manner in that regard and the police and the DPP ought to pay attention to that particular provision, that particular amendment. Madam, Madam Speaker, in the criminal justice system, this government has also sought with an amendment to tilt the scale a little bit away from all the protections given to the defendant or the accused. And one way in which we did this is by repealing the application of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. The Police and Criminal Evidence Act is a piece of legislation which was introduced by the Tony Blair administration in the United Kingdom. And even nowadays, persons are saying that that piece of legislation ought not to have been put on the books and it should be amended. But of course, the, there, a, there is a sufficient number of libertarians and human rights lawyers to say, no, leave it as it is. But we bit the bullet here. And when we repeal the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, which provided for a whole set of technicalities, because mind you, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act was not expressly brought into our legislation by any particular statute. It was felt that by many lawyers that the general provision in relation to evidence that where you have it absent in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, that the law of England and Wales should apply. And lawyers tested this issue and the Court of Appeal said that yes, the following sections of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of England and Wales applies. But there was total confusion. You didn't know 
when the police, there are certain provisions you weren't so sure. And it created great ambiguity. And a number of persons got off on certain technicalities. And we went back to the, straight for, the most straightforward certainties of the Police Act and the common law arising from the 1948 judges' rules. For instance, to prevent, Madam Speaker, anybody given a statement by oppression, under oppression, or involuntarily, and we thought that those rules were adequate to our own circumstances. But when that was done here, it was as though the government was going to take away people's fundamental rights and freedoms. It was none of the case. We were just tilting the balance a little bit. Or we also tilted the balance. We passed an amendment of doing away with unsworn statements from the dock. Traditionally, when an accused person is to give his defense, he could either do one of three things. One, say nothing. Two, give evidence from the dock and give evidence which, upon which he or she would be cross-examined to test the, the truth or falsity of the statements. Or he or she, the accused person, could have stayed in the dock and make an unsworn statement. And with a jury, an unsworn statement, without being tested, in the hands of a clever lawyer who coaches the accused, can be an impressive tool to aid their, their acquittal. So, what was done? You should talk to the, to the, the honorable member from West Kingston with some proposals that he has put. No. So that what we did, what we did is, what we did is, you're an accused person, you can go there and say nothing if you want, but you can't go, or, or you go up, give evidence, and you're cross-examined. But what you can't do is to go up in the witness box as though you're a Sunday school teacher, have a nice jacket and tie on. Rest well the night. And follow what your lawyer tells you. What your lawyer had coached you. Of course, lawyers would not coach you. That's not, that is not anything which a lawyer will do. But we know what happens. So we, that, that was also, we took that out. You, could, you can't do that anymore. You can't do that anymore. You either stay silent or you go in the witness box, give you evidence, and you can be cross-examined by the prosecutor. And the jury can ask you questions too. Then, we introduced a number of measures. Well, before I go to some of the other measures, um, bail. The general statement in the law is that bail is a right of the accused because you're an accused person, you are presumed to be innocent, but of course legislation exists and, and, and common law, judges' decisions, that, that right is circumscribed, and rightly so. I have noted in recent times that bail is offered in cases where, properly speaking, At the magistrate court level and at the high court level, the person involved, given his antecedents and the nature of the offense, 
ought not to have been granted bail. Because what happens practically is this. And I'm, I'm, I'm going into the belly of this issue. No. <laughs> but I, I know you appreciate what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, I know it's half an hour. Yes. I'm being reasonable too. I'm being reasonable too. I know at this hour you want to go and have something to eat. Yes, yes. But bear with me because it's an important subject I'm, 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 I'm into. I will never do that. I'll never do that. Madam, Madam Speaker, the evidence shows that when you have particular individuals behind bars during the time of bail, during the time after you have somebody and you don't give bail, that certain offenses in relation to housebreaking, burglary, sexual offenses, robbery, in particular areas, you see a decline when particular individuals are behind bars. There's a, so when a magistrate sits and a judge sits, of course the lawyers would make the most impassioned pleas. But bail from, and I'm speaking for the constituency of North Central Windward. Indeed, I'm speaking for the whole country, I think. That magistrates and judges must be more careful in the granting of bails for certain persons who are recidivists or where or where no this is a matter for judicial discretion you can't you and I know you can't do certain things in a particularly mandatory manner I'm making the point Madam Speaker Madam Speaker the judiciary Justice is not a cloistered virtue. And the judiciary is open to reasonable and respectful criticism. And that is established law. And I, all I am doing is urging that care and consideration be given in that particular area. And the honorable member in Central Kingston will know what I'm talking about too. Madam Speaker, then we have done a number of things. We have passed laws in relation to protection of witnesses. We send, we, we send witnesses overseas. Of course, the challenge is this, is that sometimes when you send them overseas, is to get them back. They don't want to come back. <laughs> but we have provision. No, I, I, am, I, am, I, am, I, am, I am making... I am making, you see, if you are in the belly of this thing, you know, you, 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 you know what this thing is about. I didn't want to get into all of this when I opened the debate because, but colleagues have raised these questions, so I uh, uh, touched them in some manner, so I have to point out. Then, interviews by, by, by interviewing by video, as pointed out, the Cybercrime Act, the Domestic Violence Act, the Child Care and Adoption Act. The Honorable Member for West Kingston mentioned something about children under the age of 15, girls under the age of 15 who give birth at the hospitals. And these children also go to school. But not only are the protocols in place, but I'm talking straight the legal framework now. Under the Child Care and Adoption Act, which we approved here, there are provisions placing obligations on teachers and medical practitioners to report these matters. We have strengthened the law in that regard. And I want to say that the existing law, generally speaking, does not prevent Honorable Member, Honorable Senator John, does not prevent 
a judge or indeed a DPP in the case of a mother or somebody who doesn't want to give evidence or tell their child not to give evidence, the court can insist that the evidence be given. And they're in pain of certain consequences. That evidence has to be given. Of course, the evidence may not be given in a manner in which the judge. But the point is this. And there are areas in which that, that could perhaps be strengthened. But I want to say with great respect that there are there would be some challenges from a constitutional standpoint in respect of one or two of the proposals made by the Honorable Member of West Kingston. I know it can't be business as usual, but one of the things which we have, for instance, without debating it, you can't go, if you have a reasonable suspicion that a father or a brother or an uncle or a nephew or somebody who living in the household has committed the offense, is to arrest them. On what level of suspicion are you going to have to enforce a DNA testing? They, they, straight away, um, Israel Bruce, as, le as lawyer, will go to constitutional motion on that question. Straight away. So that I hear the proposal and I see what you want to talk about, but I am not... There, there, there are some challenges. I, I just say that just... Then, Madam Speaker, there are some other things. We have increased the number of magistrates, increased the number of judges. I want to say, though, I want to say this. We brought a second criminal judge. And... It is true that over the COVID period, there was a challenge, there was a problem. But the output of that particular, that, that particular court, I don't know whether it has to do with the judge, whether it has to do with the lawyers, I don't know what, whether it had to do with the prosecution, the output in that court was far less than one would normally expect. Let me... I was going to use different language, but let me be careful. Um, then, we established there have been improvements at the DPP's office in every material particular. They set up the Sexual Offenses Unit, enhanced role by the Ministry of National Mobilization, um, including the provision of psychological treatment, um, the, we built a new prison so and then we could help with rehabilitation. Um, the, the, the question of the psychiatrist, I heard you, you say that. We, we recruited a psychiatrist and from India and she stayed maybe six weeks, two months on the job. And then, no, a, a, a medical school Took her. And I, could you imagine the, 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 the I, I could have had, the challenge I had is to deny the work permit. To say, no, I'm not giving you the work permit to go and work with this medical school. I said, well, maybe even though she's here and I am not happy that she left, she may be still be of some use in some way or the other. And I, I, I and uh, we, are, we are actively trying to recruit psychiatrists and I'm using some other persons in the region and here even in medical schools to help me to get and what I'm also exploring is the question of seeing if we can do some psychiatric evaluation for some matters which are before the court by virtually because some of that has been done and we can see how yeah there, there, there are there's, there, there's literature on this too. I, I have to explore everything. I mean, I, uh, we, 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 we have to because now, Madam, 
Madam Speaker, it is pleasing to note that on this matter that we have had, as I said, near unanimity. And I think we have had today in this honorable court, in this honorable house, far less of parliament as a theater. There have been fewer theatrical performances than one would normally have and a more serious consideration of a matter which a matter which touches and concerns um, everyone in this community. So I'm very grateful to all honorable members that I support the legislation. I brought it. <laughs> No, 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 no. I, no, no, no. I, I was just about, because I don't have to go to select committee, and to facilitate your consideration of early lunch. Accordingly, Madam Speaker, I beg to move that this bill, the Criminal Code Amendment Bill 2024, be read a third time by title and passed. Honorable members, the question is that a bill for an act to amend the Criminal Court, Chapter 171 of the Laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Revised Edition, 2009, be read a third time by title and passed. As many as are that opinion, say aye. Aye. As many as are the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Madam Clerk. Prime Madam Speaker, yes. I didn't anticipate that the bill earlier this morning would have taken us until 1.30. But I think since we are here at 1.30, I think we just have to come back by 3 o'clock and take the luncheon period. Because I, I, if it takes another two hours, it would go to 2.30. You think it may take as many as four hours? I, 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 no, I don't think so. Um, so, Madam Speaker, I beg to move that this Honorable House do stand suspended for the luncheon period until 3 p.m. Honorable Members, by my watch, it is 1.31. Honorable Members, the question is that this Honorable House do stand suspended for the luncheon period until 3 p.m. As many as are that opinion, say aye. As many as are the contrary opinions say no. The eyes have it, the eyes have it. House stands suspended.
Prayer be seated. House stands resumed post the luncheon period. It is three o'clock. Honorable Prime Minister. My, we that we call the bill so we can proceed. Honorable Prime Minister, Thank yes. You. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, the, the, um, the Firearms Amendment Bill 2024 was sent, had a first reading, and was sent to a select committee. The select committee report was tendered this morning, and we are now at the stage to have the second reading. I beg to move that a bill for an act to amend the Firearms Act, Chapter 386 of the Laws of St. Vincent and Grenadine be read a second time. Honorable members, the question is that a bill for an act to amend the Firearms Act, Cap 386 of the Laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, be read a second time. As many as are that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Debate. Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, the Firearms Act of 1995 is being amended. This is not the first amendment, but this amendment is about increasing penalties for the offenses and to, in to include two other offenses. 
Again, Madam Speaker, this bill was published in the three newspapers, open for public discussion, sent to particular stakeholders, and the only stakeholder who responded with a comment to the Attorney General is the Office of the Commission of Police. Again, I say I conclude that because there were no commentaries, no request to appear before the, the select committee by anyone, I concluded that this bill again is something which the public, the general public, they're in agreement with and they had been calling for <clears throat> increased penalties in the context where, Madam Speaker, the, there is an increased incidence of gun crimes. I should point out, Madam Speaker, that an amendment which had been made by this government to increase some penalties and make some other changes, including definitional changes, that and one would see if one examines the, these blue volumes, you will see references to particular amendments or those who go online and access the online publication of the laws. The last occasion when there was an increase in penalties, it was done at the urging of the appeal court. There's a judgment of the Court of Appeal. Then Chief Justice Dennis Byron presided that the penalties, for instance, for the possession of firearm, what we have in section four of the laws here, that it had a penalty of just one year maximum. And the matter had come up for consideration. And Sir Dennis, had done a review of all the laws comparatively across the region in respect of penalties and found that the, the penalties then were by far the lowest and he considered the penalties not at all to fit what he considered the danger from illegal firearms. And the parliament responded during the time since we, I'm prime minister and increased those penalties. And we increased the penalties more or less at the midway level, Madam Speaker. The public has been calling for a greater bundle of penalties and these penalties I've been advised are not at the highest in the region but they have moved from the middle range reflecting the public's serious concern about gun crimes and reflecting too I believe the consensus in this honorable house like the bill this morning, for, from all the discussions, including my own presentation, Madam Speaker, on the bill this morning, and my wind up on the bill would indicate that there are wider issues 
of a social nature, of individual, personal, psychological nature. Um, there are series of regional and, in the case of IAM, regional and, and um, global circumstances, and we're living in a dangerous neighborhood. And issues touching and concerning um, drug trafficking and increased criminal activities of one kind or another. And they all impact. And I'm not, Madam Speaker, going to canvas all those wide range of issues again. Some of what I said this morning can be imported with the requisite amendments to this afternoon. Of course, I will have an opportunity when I wind up to address any particular concerns remaining of honorable members or queries which have been raised. But I think I've said enough by way of an introduction, Madam Speaker, to set the backdrop. I want, as I did this morning, to see if I can assist honorable members and the, and the public who are listening as to how we are proceeding with what is the extent of the increase in penalties and what are the new provisions. Clause two of the bill, Madam Speaker, amends section 4.3. And section 4.3 of the bill, this is the section, those who appear, those who are before the court, they, they would know that is the section most frequently used in the prosecution of persons who have a firearm without a permit, without a license. It reads, well, section four in the law, Madam Speaker, addresses licenses and permits. And you deal with firearm users licenses, firearm dealers licenses, Firearm import permit and firearm export per, export permit and section subsection three of section four says this: any person who has a firearm or ammunition in his possession without a license or permit or forges or counterfeits any license or permit issued under this act, unknowingly uses any forged license, commits an offense, and on summary conviction is liable to a fine, and it's the current one is not exceeding $20,000, or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding seven years, or both. And as you notice, that that amendment to seven years, and the number $20,000 occurred in 2004 because the penalties were less in the 1995 Act. These, under the amendment, $20,000 now goes to $25,000, and seven years is now 10 years. You would notice that this is a summary offense, which means that this is heard before the magistrates. This is not the first time in our law that the magistrates, the, that the magistracy would have the authority to impose a sentence of up to 10 years. In recent times, particularly in relation to drug trafficking offenses, for example, a magistrate can go to that level of penalty. I've read that particular act, that particular provision, Madam Speaker, so that I can, so that the public will understand that this is the 
the main provision under which persons mainly are charged. So it would mean that when somebody now has a firearm, and let us say, applying all the sentencing guidelines, a first offender and everything like that is not used in relation to the, the commission of a crime. He has this in his possession without a firearm license issued by the authority. With all the discounts and pleading guilty, Madam Speaker, they would probably get three years. Sometimes you see they get 18 months. Very rarely you see them go beyond three years. But if you get three years and the maximum was seven years, and sometimes you may go up to four years in particular cases, it would be clear with this signal, with whatever application of the sentencing guidelines, it would be a number closer to five years. That is, I'm not a judge, I'm not a magistrate, I'm just as an intelligent applier of the the, regula the, the guidelines and in relation to what the parliament says, of course, if it's a second offender or if, if there are circumstances in which the gun is used um, in particular ways, different circumstances arise. I'm talking about simply the possession of a firearm without permit. But throughout the law and the amendments, Honorable members will note references are made to ammunition, which has a, def a definition, automatic firearm, which has a definition, firearm separately, which has a definition, imitation firearm has a definition, prohibited weapon has a definition, and it's a different offense to have a prohibited weapon, and we'll come to that. And a prohibited weapon is defined as prohibited weapon means any automatic firearm, be any grenade, bomb, or other similar missile. And if you read the definition for ammunition, you will see includes ammunition for any firearm, restricted ammunition, grenades, bombs, and other similar prohibited missiles, whether capable of use and a firearm, capable of use with a firearm or not. So you'll notice reference in the definition also to ammunition for any firearm, restricted ammunition, or other things like gr grenades, bombs, and other prohibited missiles as within the definition. And then of the prohibited weapon, and then there is a definition for restricted ammunition, and there's a definition for restricted weapon. A, a restricted weapon means any weapon designed or adapted for the discharge of noxious liquid, gas, or other substance. And you can see from the various definitions of prohibited and restricted why we see most of the firearm offenses which come under the general 4-3, which has been, the penalty has been increased, the fine has been increased to $25,000, and the term of imprisonment to 10 years from 7 years. Then, Clause 3. A new section is introduced after Section 11 of the Principal Act. The following section is inserted. Without prejudice to any other provision of this Act, a person who being the holder of a license or permit contravenes any of the terms or conditions of the license or permit, commits an offense, and is liable on summary conviction of a fine not exceeding $2,000 or to an imprisonment for a term 
not exceed in six months of boat. This is where you have a license. But there are terms in the license. Like for instance. You. The term of the license. You either have the gun on you. Or you have it in a safe place. That's why. The, the firearm license authority asks you to have a. A safe. For you to keep your gun in. But if you don't do that. You can be charged with an offense. But clearly you have a license, Madam Speaker. You wouldn't charge the person for the same way as if they didn't have a license. They breach a term under it. So that's a, much something much less. There's a fine and imprisonment for six months. There are some people. This is a practical measure. You may leave your vehicle and a number of persons... They go into the supermarket or somewhere, they have the gun on him, on them. They put the gun, or even when they get in the car, they put it in the inside pocket of their car. Well, they're not supposed to do that. That's a breach of the terms of the license. And somebody comes in, breaks your car, or sees that you leave it there, you leave your car open, you, 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 you're negligent. Of course, the prosecutor may decide in the circumstances not to charge you for the offense because they, they, they would wish you naturally to give evidence for the most serious offense. But the penalty is there for the person who has actually broken into your car and taken your gun and have, and have it um, without a license. So that's a very practical provision which is put into the law. There to be used in certain circumstances. And then we go along now. Section 14 of the Act. 14.4. Which is. Clause 3 amends it. Clause 3 of the bill. <laughs> and. It begins in clause 4.1. No person may be in possession of a prohibited weapon. Save as authorized by statute have to be authorized by statute to hold this prohibited weapon. Weapons of a description which, for instance, the police would be able to hold. But which a citizen can't hold a specific person unless them or a class of persons are given that um, authorization. Same thing, 14.2, no person may be in possession of a restricted weapon save as authorized by the minister under section 6.2. And then goes on and then addresses penalties, which is where I want to take you. I just want to, because many persons may read this bill and haven't read the act and don't know the structure of the act. And it's important to understand the structure of the act, how it is held together. And the options which are available to the prosecutor depending on the type of weapon that you may have and when you're not, whether you're an authorized person or not, whether you have a license in the case of the, the firearm under 4.3 or particular permission which you would have as the law prescribes in relation to prohibited or restricted weapons. 14.4 in paragraph A Summary offense, you will move from 10 years to 15 years. So the magistrate will be able, summarily, and this is a big sentence for a magistrate to give, would be up to 15 years because this is in the magistrate court. This is for a prohibited weapon. Or if, it, if it's on indictment before judge and jury at the high court, it's 20 years currently and it would then be 25 years if i may say parenthetically only for the purposes of mentioning it but it's a substantive discussion otherwise there's a strong case for particularly particular offenses including firearm offenses to be in the in the high court to be dealt with only by a judge with expedite matters i mean it would be 
strange that you can give a magistrate such powers, but when you come to the judge, you need a judge and jury. And, and, and the, the, most people would say that is not something which is particularly logical. So that is a question which in, in the reform of criminal justice, and I've raised it before publicly, whether we should not do away with trials by judge and jury and only for the judge, but there would be circumstances in which you will, you will, um, you will contain that particular um, amendment if, you, if, if we decide to go that way before judge-only trials. And there's a movement for that. And there are variations as to how that can be done and what are the conditions under which that ought to be done. So that's prohibited weapons, summarily and indictably. Then clause 3B deletes in paragraph B1 of the principal act. You delete summarily $10,000 and put $50,000 and the, penalty, the jail term will move. You'll be liable instead of five years, you, that would be doubled to 10 years. So that is for prohibited weapons. I've just said earlier in terms of where we deal with the years, summarily 10 to 15, indictment, before judge and jury, 20 to 25. In the case of restricted, move from five years to 10 years summarily. And on indictment, you will move with a fine, $25,000 to $75,000, and 15 years to 20 years. Those are the penalties summarily and indictment, respectively, for prohibited weapons and restricted weapons. And in any other case, Clause 3D, amending paragraph C, Roman numeral 1, summarily, before the magistrate, the fine will go from $20,000 to $25,000, and from seven years to 10 years. And then on indictment, that's in any other case outside of the prohibited or the restricted, would be on indictment, the fine will move from $20,000 to $50,000 and the term of imprisonment from 10 years to 15 years. I hope if honorable members are following I think I'm, I don't know if I'm, am I going too fast, Madam Speaker? Am I, am I, am I, because I want to help colleagues who may not have gone through it in this particular manner. And I want the public to, 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 to have um, a, a clear perspective on this. Then there's the offense, which is amended, Section 18 of the Principal Act. It's amended by Clause 5. And I will read that offense. Section 18. Possessing firearm with intent to injure. It says, any person having his, in his possession any firearm or ammunition with intent to endanger life or cause injury to the person or property or to enable any other person to endanger life or cause injury to person or property, whether or not that injury has been caused, commits an offense, and is liable on summary conviction, currently $10,000 fine would go up to 15000 and instead of five years before the magistrate, you will get seven years, and on indictment, by deleting $30,000 and inserting $35,000 and moving the years from 20 years to 22 years. Now, this is a very serious offense because you notice you don't actually, act, you don't actually have to injure the person, Madam Speaker. Once you have the firearm, 
with intent to injure the person or to endanger the life, the offense is triggered. So you, you could be charged for possessing the offense, the, the weapon, and you could be charged for having the weapon with intent to injure or endanger, injure the person or endanger life. And then if you actually injure the person, depending on the nature of the injury, if you injure the person and you cause the person grievous bodily, bodily harm to disfigure, disable, or maim, maim, disfigure, or disable, that carries, that's what is called the GBH, the grievous bodily harm. That would carry under the law with a different offense under the criminal code, imprisonment for, I think, GBH is currently life. So, um, the prosecutor would have several different options. It depends on what they will, they will do, um, given the facts of the case. Then, section 19.2 is amended by clause 6. This is where you possess an imitation firearm with intent to commit an offense. Summarily, before the magistrate, that goes from five to seven years. Indictment, it goes from 25 years to 30 years. It's a serious business to have a firearm of imitation. How do you define an imitation firearm? Because somebody would bring an imitation firearm, pull it on you, and tell you hand over all what you have, <laughs> including pulling it on you and, and tell you that they're demanding sex. And in, instead of charging you under one of the other offenses, under the, 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 the sexual offenses part of the criminal code, they could charge you here. That's an option which is available. Criminal law is a very intricate architecture. You know, Aristotle said that law is right reason. Occasionally, the law is an ass, but by and large, overwhelmingly, law is right reason. And it is structured in a manner where the prosecutor has options available. So when you look at this statute, the statute is in itself, but you have to look at it in its interconnection with other criminal laws, which would be available at the disposal of the prosecutor. The imitation firearm means any toy or object having the appearance of a firearm, whether or not it is capable of discharging a shot, bullet, or other missile. I know the question will come, what about a little, what about a boy who has a little water gun? Well, I don't think water guns look like um, is capable of discharging a shot, a bullet, or a missile. And, and in any event, the prosecutor would be quite silly if they prosecute somebody with a water gun. Unless, of course, the circumstances if a person brings a water gun to you and you think it is, and they rape you, then you'll, they'll charge you for the rape. They'll, they, they depend on the nature of the firearm, they, they, they just maybe leave that alone. Huh? Yes, yes, yes. That's why I'm saying it's, it, 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 um, the, the law has to provide the framework and the prosecutor will then decide as the facts, um, the facts fit, fit, the facts fit the circumstances. And, 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 to, to persuade the judge and the jury. I'm, I'm, I'm myself, I must tell you, I'm very partial to a series of offenses, 
to go before the judge alone rather than judge and jury. And firearm offenses are, are one set of them. There are others too. And I don't want you to ask me to enumerate all of them. But it is a way in which you can cut down um, the, the, the time for um, you, that you spend in the, in the courtroom. It is generally known that before juries, trials tend to take a longer time. Because the counsel is always seeking to persuade the tribunal of fact, that is to say the jury. The judge will hurry you along and say, listen, I, I know all that. You don't have to do the drama with me. I'm, I'm, I'm following the evidence, you know? The clause seven, after section 19, you insert the following 19A. This is where technology has caused the necessity and desirability of putting in another offense, a new offense. Possession of a ghost gun or a 3D, 3D printed firearm. You have in that a, an increasing number of those things are happening. Um, with ghost guns or 3D printed firearms. And, and the, the, a 3D printing process means 3D printing or additive manufacturing, which is a process of making three-dimensional solid objects from a computer file and includes any of the various processes in which material is joined or solidified under computer control and create to create a 3D, a three-dimensional object with material being added together, including liquid molecules or powder grains. And a ghost gun means a firearm including a frame or a receiver that lacks a unique serial number engraved or cased in metal alloy on the frame or receiver but does not include a firearm rendered permanently inoperable or that is not required to have a serial number. So there, there are a number of persons throughout the region and, and, and um, you're seeing it creeping in here too that you have ghost guns, 3D firearms, three dimensional. Yeah. Who, made, who made guns, you know? And uh, you have the computer, you have the materials, and you make yourself the gun. That's, that's, that's where, so we have to have a, a particular offense to meet these new technologies. When the, when, the, when the original firearm act in 1950, well, the one before 1995, 1956, that was not in place. 95, that was not in place. But no, different technological days. So a person shall not manufacture, sell, transfer, purchase, or possess a ghost gun or a firearm produced by a 3D printing process. On summary conviction, you get up to 15 years. And on conviction before judge and jury, a term not exceeding 25 years. Those are stiff penalties. There's also a new offense under this clause, clause seven, it's a 19B, and it reads, a person who has in his possession two or more firearms or prohibited weapons in contradiction of this act is deemed to have the firearms or prohibited weapons for the purpose of trafficking. So if you have two or more firearms or prohibited weapons, you deem to have them for, for purpose of trafficking, the firearms or prohibited weapons, unless the contrary is proved, the burden of proof being on the accused, and such person commits an offense. A person who commits an offense of this kind, on summary conviction before the magistrate, a fine not exceeding $200,000, or to imprisonment of a term 
not exceeding 15 years or both, or an indictment, conviction on indictment, to a term not exceeding 25 years. Very important. Now, this section, in this section, trafficking includes importing, exporting, acquiring, delivering, selling, or transferring the firearms or prohibited weapons. So, a person who has a firearm who is charged under 4-3. He could also be charged now, when this passes, if he has in his possession two firearms, because the, just this morning, the police reported to me that they went to a particular local, I'm not saying where, because it would be pointing to the individual. And there are two firearms. He, he had two with him. No, unless he would be able to show that he didn't have it for trafficking. He will get more than what you will get under 4.3, under this new section, because under summary, he could get up to 15 years and under indictment, 25 years. So I want those who are having one and who are having two weapons to understand that this bill is not a joke. And we have, Madam Speaker, structured this matter in a way. We have Honorable members, an amnesty running from March the 1st to May the 31st. You have your gun, give it in now. Because when this comes into being, the penalty is going to be stiffer. And if you have two in your possession, you could be out of circulation for a very long time. Incidentally, as I said, we had put this for the public for discussion. Nobody responded. So I assume that they're saying, fine, Parliament, go ahead with that. Because if they were, if they were riled up about it, they would have sent something to say they're riled up that the penalties are too harsh. But I would repeat, the penalties alone, not stopping, and I don't want to rehash that, the discussion this morning. Penalties alone are not going to stop it. Like, for instance, guns which are coming in. We now have at, at Camden Park, operational, um, which, which I believe the Minister of Finance has a lot of details on because it's very expensive. For, for detection and the one is being put in together for Kingston and we have also facilities out at Argyle so and it is painful for me to see young people especially the bulk of them are overwhelmingly almost 100% of them young males getting involved with this fascination with guns. I say to you, you're mashing up your life if you have a firearm. You're mashing it up. And when you use it, I'm saying to you, the evidence is all around you. You're either going to go to jail or you for a long time or you're going to die or you go to jail and when you come out if you continue you're going to die before you reach your allotted period of time so 
I, I just want the young, I just want the people to listen to me. And we have an amnesty, given a chance. And I want the mothers and fathers and the uncles and the friends in the area to help. The Honorable Member for Central Kingston said something this morning that all of what we are doing here, there are some people who just simply tune out. Well, and he called them a particular name. They tune out. Well, the rest of the society is responding. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting you approvingly. I'm quoting you approvingly. If I disagreed with you there, I would have said it. I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't necessarily want to use the word what you call them, but I understand fully the import of what you said. Huh? Yes, 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 which I've used hitherto. But, but you, have, you, you, you have even carried the, a word higher up the chain. Um, I'm, not, I'm not opposing your use of it, you know. Yes. It's only that I'm not using it myself. Um, then, so, so those two new provisions under section 19A, in the insertion of 19A, about with the ghost gun and the 3D gun, and the trafficking in firearms, those are serious additional offenses. Clause 8, section 20, subsection 4 of the, the principal act is amended, section 20, 24 is amended. This one deals with the restriction on the sale of firearm. That moves from $7,000 to $10,000 or three years to, to five years. Section clause nine, amend section 22.2. 22.2 is if you purchase, acquire, sell or transfer a prohibited weapon. Summarily, it moves from five years to seven years. And on indictment, it moves from 20 years to 25 years. And section 23.3 is amended by clause 10. And I, I'd like to read that one, converting firearms. And it is one way persons try to be ingenious. Subject to section, subsection to a person other than the holder of a valid firearm license shall not. A. Shorten the barrel of a shotgun to a length of less than 20 inches. B. Convert into a firearm anything which is not a firearm. C. Convert into a restricted weapon anything which is not a restricted weapon. D. Convert into a prohibited weapon, anything which is not a prohibited weapon. And a person who acts in contravention of this section on summary conviction, the term moves now from five years to seven years, and on indictment before judge and jury from 15 years to 17 years. You will notice that you can therefore be charged depending on the weapon, if it's a prohibited weapon, you could be charged for that, as well as you could be charged for converting it, depending on the facts of the circumstances. Or the prosecutor may choose one or the other, or go back to 4-3, as the case may be. Amendment of Section 24 of the Principal Act, Clause 11 does this. This is relating to import and export, export permits. 
in respect of prohibited weapons. You import or export summarily, it moves from 10 to 15 years. Indictment, it moves from 20 years to 25 years. These are stiff penalties. In the case of a restricted weapon, in terms of importing and exporting without the permit, the import or export permit, restricted weapon, summarily moves from $10,000 to $50,000 and five years move to 10 years. And the restricted weapon or ammunition on indictment, the fine will move from $25,000 to $75,000 and 15 years going to 20 years. And in any other case, summarily, $7,000 to $12,000 and jail, and jail term, three years to five, to five years. I mean, three years move to five years. And on indictment, the fine moves from $20,000 to $50,000 and the term of years will move from 10 years to 15 years. All of them significant increases. Now, Section 43 of the Principal Act is amended. Um, you notice Section 23 deals with the collection of firearms. Um, 43, sorry. 43. The Governor General may by proclamation order that within any town or district specified in such proclamation all firearms shall be given up to the Commissioner or other police officer authorized by him which is the framework really for, the, for an amnesty, the, that whole provision. But what, if you look at the law carefully, it, in subsection one, you're inserting the word ammunition after firearms, and in subsection three, after unlicensed firearm, you're including unlicensed firearms or ammunition. And by oh, and under wherever you see firearms, you also put or ammunition afterwards. So what is happening? This collection under the law is done for the firearms, but you can administratively, the prosecutor can say, well, look, if you're taking the, 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 the bullets to during this period, we're not, we wouldn't charge you. But this is, all, this is making it pellucid that they will, it would be fine to bring both the guns and the ammunition. And uh, Clause 13 was, is, is just a, a typograph, just a, a, a general, the, the amendment of that particular section, Section 44, General penalties. If there is no prescribed penalty in the act for anything, well then, it would be a fine not exceeding $5,000, which moves from 2000 or three years, move, which moves from 12 months. That, that kind of sweep of provision. But all the, That's just a drafting matter, but all the, 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 the major offenses, all the offenses there have their penalties um, prescribed. Madam Speaker, I think that is my role as the... To number three. In the bill itself... Yes, well, that's, that's, that's just a, a typographer, typographical error, and we just simply do the numbers 
Okay, I'm obliged. So we, I move that that correction be made and all the, all the numbers follow in, in, yes, yes. I'm obliged, Madam Speaker. For the debate, for the debate, yes, I recognize the Honorable Senator Bruce. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, honorable members, there's a slight feedback in this microphone. Sorry? Uh, okay. Thank you. Madam Speaker, honorable members, I rise to make my contribution to this proposed or this series of proposed amendments to the Firearm Act Cap 386 of the laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, for those of us who had an opportunity to read through the proposed amendments, and the added benefit, if I may so put it, of listening to the Honorable Minister of National Security as he expounded on a number of the proposed amendments. We will come to the obvious conclusion that the principal objective of these amendments, Madam Speaker, is to make for stiffer penalties associated with the possession and dealing with illegal firearms. And in a much smaller regard, it brings into legal focus where persons who have license to carry firearm could find themselves on a particular section within the cross grains of the law. In the face of what has been happening in St. Vincent and the Grenadines over the last few years, and I speak particularly to the spate of gun-related crimes, one ought not to be surprised that this particular measure or this move is being taken at this point in time. We listen to the Honorable Minister of National Security. He intimated that there were previous amendments that sought to make the penalties stiffer, harsher. And we were advised that those were at the urging of the Court of Appeal. It can be safely said today, here, and now that the current amendments that we are seeing that are before this Honorable House today are at the yawning of the court of public opinion. The people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines have cried out loud that they are tired, that they are fed up, that they are saddened, that they are brokenhearted over the number of crimes that we see in committed in this country by use of guns. And I speak to illegal firearms. 
Madam Speaker, honorable members of the listening public, maybe it's important that we have some backdrop to what we are dealing with today. The statistics that are available to us suggest that between the years 2012 and 2023 that we have had a number of murders in our country. In fact, 408 of them. Stabbings, responsible for a number of these killings. And the statistics show that 87% of persons who have used knives or similar weapons to commit the offense of murder, but 87% of these have been resolved. Persons charged, taken before the court, and the court adjudicated accordingly. But, as it relates to firearm-related offenses, Madam Speaker, and the members, members of the Vincentian public, only 15% of firearm-related homicides have been properly addressed. 44 out of a total of 288. I want that to sink in, you know. Sorry? You want me to repeat it? I, I am saying that only 15% of the firearm-related offenses where, where, where firearms are used to commit murder, that only, yes, only 15% of that, or of those, or where we had persons charged and the court properly adjudicated on them. 44 of 288 such cases. That is what speaks to the yearning of the court of public opinion that says to this government, something must be done and it must be done now. And before there is any thought, before there is any embrace of any idea that so far that this presentation seeks to go in the directive of the negative, I wish to put on record that we, on this side of the Honorable House, Madam Speaker, that we are supporting the measures taken to make penalties stiffer and harsher to respond to the spate of illegal gun offenses in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, this approach is not novel. So let's accept that. Countries, other countries in the region, other countries the world over, have used this approach where they increase the penalties with the hope for particular outcomes. Some have had great success. Others have had limited success. And we have those whose success are within the margins. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, I want to dissect what happened between 2011 and 2020 as it relates to firearm-related offenses. In 2011, we had 64 of those offenses related to firearms, 29 
as it relates to ammunition. 2012, 23 in relation to firearms, 22 in relation to ammunition. 2013, 41 related to firearms, 27 in relation to ammunition. 2014, 28 firearms, 39 ammunition. 2015, 32 firearms, 36 ammunition. 2016, 32 firearms, we didn't see an increase there, and 54 ammunition. 2017, 38 firearms, 33 ammunition. 2018, 36 firearm, 27 ammunition. 2019, 16 firearms, 28 ammunition. And in 2020, 32 related firearm offenses and 21 um, in relation to ammunition. Madam Speaker, in 2015, not too far from us, the government of the British Virgin Islands sought to implement a similar measure. One of their weekly publications, the BVI Beacon, captioned the editorial, Firearms Bill sends strong message. In a similar way, they sought to increase the penalty and with the hope that the result is going to be a significant decline in firearm, especially illegal firearm-related offenses. The assessment could be done. I'm not saying this to suggest or to in any way indicate that I would not want to see the obvious success of these measures because it is important to all of us. To me, to us, to all of us on this side, it is clear that the obvious intent of this piece of legislation is to take a combative approach by bringing on harsher penalties, Madam Speaker, that would serve the sentencing principle of deterrence. We heard it earlier on when we discussed the, um, the amendment to the criminal code and, and with matters particularly related to sexual offenses. You heard the speaker spoke to the principle of deterrence. The ultimate objective is that it is hoped that by persons recognizing and I think the Honorable Minister of National Security, as he was preparing to wind up his initial presentation, sought to poke it in, in a very clear way. That if you have firearms, bring them in. If you have firearms illegal, you could spend time in prison. If you have firearms illegal, you could end up in, 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 the, in the grave and so forth and so on. The ultimate objective is to send that message, that stark message that says to young people who have illegal firearms, this is not the place for us to go. But I also recognize, Madam Speaker, that there are two significant messages going out here. One, going to magistrates and judges, that the legislators of St. Vincent and the Grenadines are not happy with the extent of illegal firearm offenses. And one way that the legislators are proposing or they're now putting in place to combat that particular problem is to allow now for magistrates and judges to inflict greater penalties on the perpetrators or the violators of the act. So there's a clear message to them. The Honorable Minister um, of National Security is correct that when it comes to the sentencing exercise and the sentencer enters upon an understanding of the sentencing guidelines, and ever so often you have to try to explain this to 
to persons, you know, Madam Speaker, that a magistrate or a judge has to operate within the framework of the guidelines that are given. And it is true that the guidelines have suggested that these sentences can depart from the guideline. But there's a proviso if they can justify that departure. I have had both the fortunes and the misfortune as a criminal um, law practitioner where sentences seem as if they are pigeonholed by the guidelines and don't look at the particular sections and the practice directions that say to them that look at the peculiar sets of circumstances of the offender and you can therefore walk away from the guidelines and give sentences that are more lenient or that are a bit harsher. So we, we take that for what it is. The second message, Madam Speaker, I spoke to two messages. The second message is a message to the lawbreakers. It has a double caption, cease and desist. So if you are in the practice of holding illegal firearms in your possession, there is a message here today. Avoid the prisons. Avoid pauperizing your parents, some of whom don't have it, but because they don't want to see their children go to prison, have to dig deep in their pockets to find monies to pay fees as they are charged by magistrates and judges. I have seen the plights of poor, poor parents. Madam Speaker, you know, not too long ago, there was a matter in one of our courts where a young man was charged a fine. I felt the fine was on the heavy side for the offense. And even in the face of the amnesty, I thought that the sentence could have been a little more lenient. But again, if we are going to send a clear message to those who are engaged in these type of activities, then we must make sure that our message is clear. Madam Speaker, this brings me to something that most of us may have heard in our primary school years. That a, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. We, this government, has two baskets from which to seek out measures aimed at addressing gun crimes and illegal gun possession. There is, Madam Speaker, the preventative basket, and then there is the curative basket. These measures were clearly plucked from the curative basket. That basket is talking about punishing people who are found in possession with the illegal firearm. In, in, in essence, they have already committed the offense. So this is trying to cure the problem. I say that we need to spend some time to look to see how, Madam Speaker, what programs we can design and execute across St. Vincent and the Grenadines that dips a few more items out of the preventative basket. I am sure that all of us in this chamber, Madam Speaker, in this legislative council, We must all agree 
that an increase in prison time and fines would not be enough. I repeat, an increase in fines and prison time alone, so let me qualify that, alone as a measure will not be enough. I respectfully say to this honorable house that these new and emboldened punitive measures, Madam Speaker, must be accompanied by sustained community efforts with targeted interventions to root out the underlying causes of violent crimes. I remember almost 20 years ago when the current government was in opposition, as it made very strident bids to get into government, and it touted what became a popular slogan that the ULP will be tough on crime and the causes of crime. I am sure right now a lot of primary school children will be able to recite that without making any mistake. The statistics that I have read so far, however, have suggested to me that crimes have been tough on this ULP administration. Whilst crimes have been tough on this ULP administration, this ULP administration has been soft when it comes to addressing the root causes of crimes in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So I say that that represents respectfully another failed promise. Madam Speaker, all of us here need to appreciate first and foremost what are the root causes of these criminal behaviors of our young people in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Caribbean and this gunslinging culture. We have to appreciate what are the causes before we can fundamentally begin to address them in a targeted way. If we fail to do so, Madam Speaker, I say, without fear of being contradicted, that we will be done in the same old khaki pants in search of glittering results. Therefore, herein lies the multi-billion dollar question, Madam Speaker, honorable members. Have we satisfied ourselves? Have we? That we have done enough to assist with the social intervention programs that can assist us in responding to the social deviants as contributors to violent crimes? How we, are we satisfied that we have done enough? If the answer, which I believe for all of us, ought to be no, that we have not done enough, then we need to then say to ourselves, we need to make greater investment Greater investment in social organizations, girl guides, boy scouts, brownies, pathfinders, and other CBOs and NGOs that could assist us in this collaborative effort. I remember this morning, I, I think as the, the, the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs in addressing the criminal code said that there has to be a collective effort in responding to issues of crime. And as it relates to gun, illegal gun crime, there has to be that collective effort. I am teased by my friend, my honorable friend, the Honorable Minister of Sports et al. And he asked, so that the, the persons in, in Rio de Land could hear what he asked me, what about the homes? Well, maybe he's not intending to speak, so he has, he has a right to, 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 to push that little question. 
But let me see that, Honorable Minister. We on this side agree that the home has a role to play. Just as the school and the churches, NGOs, CBOs, as I named them a while ago, they all have a role to play. I am saying, though, that the state which has at its disposal greater facilities must play a greater role in giving the enabling capabilities to these organizations and to these institutions. If you, if you object to it, then it might be a good reason for you to say so publicly. Madam Speaker, if we want to do our fair share in these possibilities that I spoke to, then I say it is time for us to put in the matching financial and human resources in these type of entities to, so that they can assist us in fighting crimes, especially illegal gun-related crimes, and most importantly, addressing the issue of conflict resolution amongst young people in particular here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This suggestion is not unilateral. And so I come to the question, the answer. You teased me before it. My argument, our argument on this side is that there must be a multidisciplinary approach to go along with the stiffer penalties that we are passing in this house today. And in that sense, we can help to wrestle the problems of illegal gun violence in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, though we on this side of the house have clearly indicated our support for the increase in penalties as one of the tools which can be utilized from the crime fighting toolkit, we, we are eager to caution that the legislation and the legislative amendments must not be considered in isolation. There are other things to consider. And we hope that from this side of the house, that sufficient consideration will be given to the overall sets of impact of this act on St. Vincent and the Grenadines. My recollection earlier this morning, I think it was the Your Honorable Senator Shaquille Bob who spoke to, she didn't stay on it for any, any length of time. In passing, she mentioned the issue of the current prison population. It, it is not a point that is worth mentioning and gliding past as if it is not significant. Because if, based on the penalties that we have, harsher penalties, significant increase in fines, and significant increase in jail time. Where you have lots and lots of young people involving themselves, again, I am, I am upholding the request that we are talking deterrence. But remember that deterrence has always been used as a sentencing objective, and people are still engaging themselves criminally. What implication? There are for our prison system. So that whereas someone would spend previously three years or five years in prison for a particular offense, that now goes to ten years. It means that the taxpayers of this country would have to foot the bill of breakfast, lunch, dinner, security, and the likes for that same person now for ten years instead of five. I'm saying that there are cost implications. Honorable Minister of Finance, you understand clearly what I'm talking about. Because you have to now go and find the monies to satisfy the budgetary allocation of the prison authority when they make their request for the next financial year. We're talking about 
A number of our young men been trapped in prisons for years. And again, because we are pushing for deterrence, we should not form the view that there are not those who still will be caught in the midst of all of what is happening. This country, Madam Speaker, will only earn maximum benefits from these amendments to this, to this law only if we have accompanying measures to go alongside with the legal amendments, but these measures must be long-term and consistent. Right nearby in Grenada, Prime Minister Mitchell announced that the Grenada government seeks to strike the laws against gun-related crimes, September 2023. But Madam Speaker, as Grenada sought to do the same thing that we are seeking to do here today, one of the things that Prime Minister Mitchell said when he spoke to the Grenadian people, he said, fundamentally, we have to address the root causes of violence. He understands that they are inseparable, that there is an integral interrelationship between these root causes and the ultimate offending. And so if we don't appreciate and address the root causes, then we may find that like some other countries, we will not have the level of success that we anticipate. One of their, part of the approach for Grenada is to enhance surveillance and border security. We heard the Honorable Minister of Security said, Argyle, Camden Park, and soon to be Kingston will have some necessary gadgets to deal with surveillance and border security. Our borders are very, very porous. So we need to advance in this direction to make sure that the Grenadines do not become the hotspot transshipment points for bringing in illegal firearms into the country. Amnesty we are onto it. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Prime Minister, during his independent speech, made reference to the gun amnesty and then said that the acting commissioner of police would provide further and deeper details as to how um, we would address these problems. Listen to the Honorable, sorry, to the Commission of, Commission of Police in Vincent, and while he spoke to the amnesty, we didn't quite get the details that we were expected from him as we thought we would get as suggested by the Honorable Prime Minister then. This is not a new call. I have seen St. Vincent and the Grandies made the call before. Most recently, Prime Minister Philip Davis of the Bahamas didn't just make the call, but took a delegation to meet, to meet sorry, with Vice President Kamala Harris to discuss the issue of reducing the flow of guns, illegal guns, entering the Bahamas from the United States of America. We don't make guns in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We don't produce guns. Save and accept maybe the imitation ones. People, some people put a, a banana green under the shirt and try to commit an offense. Apart from that thing that looks like a gun, we don't make them here. We need to either independently or collectively with Caribbean colleagues to intensify that request on our friends in the United States of America to do more 
to ensure that they stem the flow of illegal firearms coming to the shores of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. That is an additional approach that may earn us some results. Madam Speaker, it is important to note, you know, that when we look at the allocation of donor funds by the United States of America as part of their crime fighting mechanism in the region, one of those initiatives, the Caribbean Basin Initiative, has seen a reduction in the allocation by the U.S. government. It, that sends us a damning message because it is from that envelope that security support was had for countries like St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We cannot sit on our laurels and hope that by making measures stiffer, that that alone is going to give us the results that we desire. Madam Speaker, honorable members, I noticed that significantly during the presentation of the Minister of National Security, quite a bit of energy, if I may put it that way, was spent. Um, he didn't say that I was trying to do this, but there were several references to it, which suggests to me that there was a preference um, for judge alone tribunal in certain matters as opposed to having um, judge and jury. We understand the implications of both possibilities. The general practice is that persons in the high court system are tried by persons of, of their own peers. In the magistracy, the magistrate is the sole arbiter of fact and law. It doesn't make the job, thank you, Madam Speaker, it doesn't make the job any easier. I hear the argument that lawyers who get on their feet and may be able to convince jurors not to accept certain evidence, to, to give very little weight to certain evidence, to disregard certain um, evidence and so forth and so on, may be successful in convincing the, the jury. But a judge alone who is seasoned, tested, and tried may not easily give in to those defense attorneys as articulate as they may be. It is a very delicate subject matter. And whilst I recognize that it was not placed in the discussion as a point that, look, this is what I am pushing, I recognize that it was mentioned quite a few times. That suggests to me um, that it is a preference that is being pushed. Madam Speaker, I looked at the Clause 3 of that particular, of the amendment, and, and, and it raised a question in my mind. That clause deals with persons who have a license to carry the firearm. But it says where, where those persons contravenes any of the terms or conditions, then on summary conviction, there are certain penalties. And I wondered for a while whether or not going to find and possible confinement was the only way that we can go. And I know that the select committee would have had several discussions on this. I mean, I unfortunately did not make it to that meeting. Of course, it was shifted on the first date, so it didn't fit my schedule on the second day. And, and I asked the question whether or not a, a punishment mechanism cannot be built in where there can be 
the suspension of the license for right for well, well I will tell you where my mind is on it where there is a an expanding system in that suspension so if there's a first violation if there's a suspension for six months second violation a suspension for a year and a half and on the third violation we say no man you're not serious you don't deserve to have a license to carry a fire I am just saying whether or not we would want to give some consideration to that as, as an alternative to, a to, alternative to somebody who breaches, can't pay, and then find himself or herself in prison. Not, not that I don't appreciate that sometimes some persons who have a license to carry a firearm find himself or herself very careless with it. And it could become a, a licensed firearm in the hand of an unlicensed person, and that can reap havoc. And, and I imagine that it happens. You know, I am just saying that whether or not it is a something that we may want to give consideration to down the road, as opposed to fine and confine. I, I couldn't help but quickly scribble the name Benjamin Exeter right next to that section of the, the bill, when I heard the Honorable Prime Minister said, you know the terms, some terms of the, of, the, of the license, you either have it on you or you have it safely in your vault at home. And I remember, I couldn't help but remember that Ben Exeter had it on him. I couldn't help, I couldn't help, to, remem help to remember that. He wasn't in his vault at home, he couldn't leave it in his vehicle and go to the protest. He was on a protest line. But he had it on him. But he suffered the consequences for having it on him. Not in breach of the terms of his license. I couldn't help but ponder upon it. I noticed, Madam Speaker, at clause, what should be clause 4 that you, Madam Speaker, quite rightly recognize? That, deal, that paragraph C, which deals with the amendment to the original B, subparagraph 2. Honorable Member, you have four minutes remaining. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is dealing with the current section 14 of the law. That's 14.4. It says, any person who possesses a firearm or ammunition in contravention of this section commits an offense and is liable if in possession of a prohibited weapon, on summary conviction to a term of imprisonment not exceeding 10 years, the amendment here now is to, well, it's B, if in possession of a restricted weapon or ammunition, on summary conviction to a term not exceeding five years or fine not exceeding $10,000. See now that those are increased. In paragraph B2, where it says, on conviction and indictment, a fine not exceeding $25,000 or to a term of imprisonment not, in, not exceeding 15 years. That has now changed, where $25,000 is, is deleted and is replaced by $75,000 and 15 years is increased to 20 years. I, I don't know when the Honorable Prime Minister, Minister of National Security, winds up. If you can speak somewhat to the justification why there is a 33 or thereabout percent increase in the custodial time, but a 200 percent increase in the fine. Quite there, I find that there's quite a disproportionate move in fine and confine. I would be happy to know if there is a particular reason for that, for that um, amendment. Madam Speaker, I, I, I recognize and accept that time is not with me. But I want to close by saying that we in the New Democratic Party want to ensure that the streets of St. Vincent and the Grenadines are safe for men, women, and children.
We understand the importance of combating crime in this country. We support the need for measures that would send a message of deterrence for the commission of crimes in this country and the possession of illegal firearms. Whenever there are bills placed before this honorable house that advances the cause of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and protect the lives of our men, women, and children, that we on this honorable side of the house, we will always lend our support. It is for that reason, Madam Speaker, that we lend our support to the amendments to the Firearms Act, Cap 386 of the laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, I am much obliged. For the debate. For the debate. For the debate. I recognize the honorable member for East Kingstown. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, I rise to, just like my colleagues before me, lend support to this bill here being debated. <clears throat> and I wish to say that the expression of support for this bill is not and should not be interpreted as mere political cosmetic because as Vincentian citizens, we all in some way, shape, or form have come into contact with criminal activities, some of us even being victims to some degree, and much of which involved gun violence. So we are very sensitive and very aware of our realities, hence the reason for our overwhelming and emphatic support of this bill. Madam Speaker, it has been well established that this bill seeks to increase the penalties for illegal firearms possession and related activities. And not only is it a signal in the right direction, but to coin the expression of my honorable colleague from Central Kingston, it is an important step in the right direction. However, Madam Speaker, I wish to also associate myself which, with much of the commentary made before, by speakers before me with regards to this particular bill not being a panacea for our crime situation in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, particular, particularly gun violence and gun-related crime. Madam Speaker, it is no secret that crime and violence in this country arguably pose the biggest social challenge to our people, closely contested by, I would say, poverty and unemployment. Indeed, the daunting but telling statistics of unprecedented high levels of poverty unemployment, cost of living, incidents of mental illness, corruption in public office, highlight our reality here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And all of this, Madam Speaker, all of this is happening under a government who, when they came to office in 2001, as my colleague Senator Bruce before me mentioned, a government at the time in waiting 
guaranteed the people of this country that they will be tough on crime and the causes of crime. A government who promised us integrity legislation in the first hundred days after getting into government and after my recent calculation of 8,490 days, we are yet to see anything close to integrity legislation. And we wonder why there is widespread speculation about the level of corruption in public office in this country. I was reading something on social media not too long ago, and the author is unknown, but I made a note of the comment, and it goes like this, and I quote, the worst disease in the world today is corruption, and there is a cure, transparency. Madam Speaker, the crime situation in this country is out of hand, and I might add that that is a gross understatement. We have reached an all-time low when, having heard of the frightening experience of innocent, sick people lying in their hospital beds only to hear gunshots ringing out in the said hospital from an assailant who entered the ward of the hospital in an attempt to finish off a previously attacked, survived victim of a gun murder attempt. I shudder to think, Madam Speaker, honorable members, that we can get any worse than this. Why am I saying all of this? Where am I going with all of this? Well, <clears throat> we recognize on this side of the house that there is no single strategy nor policy that will adequately address the, the occurrence of crime in any country. And I want to re-emphasize at this juncture that the bill to amend the Firearms Act to basically increase the penalties for the violation of the act is, as my good brother, friend, and colleague, Honorable Bruce said, is one of the tools, I believe, you, you, the word you use, in our tool basket to address, in our toolkit, to address the issue of crime. So we get it. We understand that there are, there's a myriad of, of issues at play here. And I wish to commend all of, our, all of my parliamentary colleagues for not only supporting this bill, but in an unadulterated way, sending a very strong signal to the people of this country, and in particular, the criminals and the would-be criminals. Madam Speaker, this bill today is also an indication that the government recognizes the far-reaching nature of crime and violence, particularly gun violence in this country. And they must by extension, accept and take responsibility for such. The primary role of government is to protect and safely secure its people. And you must do so with authority, vision, and foresight. Your approach must be smart and inclusive, inclusive, if meaningful progress is to be made in the fight against crime. Crime in St. Vincent and the Grenadines has been a significant concern, and I wish here to refer to the rise in homicides and various criminal activities. The country has experienced an increase in what we call intentional homicides over the years, reaching a record high of 55 murders in 2023. Let me just draw a comparison real quickly, Madam Speaker. In 2001, when the ULP administration came into government, the homicide rate in St. Vincent and the Grenadines was 11, 11 per 100,000. 11 per 100,000. Today, 
it is over 40 per 100,000. More than tripled what it was when they came into office. The surge in crime has been attributed to factors like the gun culture, the cocaine trade, and the involvement of criminal gangs and groups specializing in drug, drug trafficking. We have also heard, and I wish to emphasize, that the most common types of crime in St. Vincent and the Grenadines include homicides, gun-related violence, drug trafficking, particularly cocaine, domestic violence, robbery, and pradial larceny. Pradial larceny is something that we seem not to be given a lot of attention to, and I think I can speculate as to why, but in a little bit, I will touch further on that issue. Additionally, Madam Speaker, gun violence has been a significant issue with firearms being used in the majority of murders recorded in the country. For example, 2022 and 2023 combined saw St. Vincent and the Grenadines experiencing 97 homicides. 97. We had 42 in 2022 and 55 in 2023. And of the 97, 71 of those were gun-related. 71. I have heard repeatedly our Minister of National Security calling for a united effort for us to address the problem of illegal firearms and violence and urging our citizens to cooperate with law enforcement to make our streets safer. And I wish to use this opportunity to echo that call, but that call must be meaningful and that call must be genuine because we here in the opposition, we feel that we have just as important a role to play in addressing the issue of crime and violence in this country. The Minister of National Security, Madam Speaker, repeatedly, and in my view, irresponsibly and, and flippantly attributes the source of crime, particularly gun homicides, to a handful of young men whose motive is to take care of their high-maintenance women. There are, in my view, yes, I'm going there. There are, in my view, several illogical and irrational derivatives from this, Madam Speaker. For example, how do you know how many or who are the criminals perpetrating gun violence and homicides when very few arrests are made? Secondly, if it's only a handful of young men, then it should not be very difficult to find them and arrest them and incarcerate them. I don't think my level of logic is that bad that this question doesn't hold merit. Find them and try them if it's only a small handful. Over the past 10 years, we have had over 400 homicides in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and less than a quarter of them have been arrested, and even less, and I think Senator Bruce touched on it in his presentation, have, have been prosecuted and convicted. So are we to assume then, Madam Speaker, that the gun homicide criminals are repeat offenders who are not caught? Because if it's only a small handful, and we have so many incidents taking place, then it stands to reason that the small handful are repeat offenders who are not caught. And if that is the case, that is extremely worrying for me. Extremely worrying. In my own constituency of East Kingston, Madam Speaker, we experienced the only mass shooting in the history of this country, to my knowledge, 
where sometime last year, five men were gunned down in one shooting incident in the Uptown Quarry area. Only mass shooting in this country. Has anyone been arrested? If so, what is the status of the investigation and the legal process? Or are we to assume that the authorities can only throw their arms up in despair and say there's nothing we can do? And we must hope for the best but brace for the worst. This points to the much needed, the much uh, real situation, not much real situation, but the real situation facing our law enforcement personnel in this country. Resources and support for our law enforcement personnel in this country is woefully inadequate, woefully inadequate. And I, I don't want to start to give examples, but when was the last time any of, uh, any of you walked into the CID department and looked up in the roof? Very small example, but it is important. It is important because if our law enforcement officials are not motivated and do not have the will and the passion because of working conditions, lack of resources, and lack of support, then how can we ask them? to conduct their work effectively. I am not trying to give the impression that nothing at all has been done. So I don't want that to be miscon I don't want to be misconstrued to that extent because we know some people like to get into the habit of doing so. But nonetheless, I am simply saying that if we want results, we have to do much more, much more than what we're doing today. Madam Speaker, we cannot be happy, proud, or even socially comfortable when St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the last United Nations Office for Drug and Crime survey, St. Vincent and the Grenadines was ranked number seven in the world number seven in the world, and that was the last official survey for homicide rates. Number seven, the only English-speaking Caribbean country that's ranked higher than us was Jamaica. 40 homicides per 100,000. Who, who wants to bear that dubious distinction, Madam Speaker? We have what, about 200 countries in the world? And we are in the top 10 for homicide rates in the world. You can't play politics with this stuff. You can't. This harsh reality, Madam Speaker, drives home the fact and the need for more than just talk. Drives home the fact and the need for an inclusive approach to addressing this issue as best as we can. And whilst the aforementioned addresses crime after the fact, Madam Speaker, it is critical, and again I refer to my good Senator colleague Bruce, when he talked about the importance of recognizing, understanding, analyzing, and addressing the causes of crime. And I would say that a proper analysis ought to be done. I heard the Prime Minister make mention of a, I, I, I'm subject to correction here, Prime Minister, because I can't remember exactly, but I think he made mention of a 14-point plan um, in the fight against crime, or something to that effect, which is a good initiative, but clearly, given the trajectory of crime in this country, that is inadequate. So, at the risk of repeating myself, if there's nothing else I am remembered for after this intervention, is the need for us to be more inclusive in our fight against crime in this country. The involvement of the parliamentary opposition 
cannot be restricted to only debating a bill. We have to be more involved. We represent the majority of voters in the last election. Whether you like it or not, it's a reality. You could look left, you could look right, you could laugh, you could giggle. That is the harsh reality. So how can you exclude us from a meaningful, how can you exclude us from a meaningful approach to fighting crime and violence in this country? You need to rethink your strategy. You need to rethink your efforts and be practical. Madam Speaker, the causes of crime are multifaceted. We know that. I'm not going to spend time going through um, all the sociological facts. But permit me, Madam Speaker, to mention just a few so that I can contextualize and further emphasize the serious nature with which we are confronted with regards to crime. For example, various factors contribute to the causes of crime. One of them, the sociologists refer to as biological. And I want to pause here for a minute, Madam Speaker, to talk about the issue of mental health in this country. Just a couple of days ago, a young man was sentenced to 12 years for the murder of my good friend and brother and literally a family member, Lance Wilson, who was bludgeoned to death by the said individual who I referred to a while ago was sentenced to 12 years. In, Lance was in the market square and this gentleman basically walked up to him with a piece of pipe and killed him. My other good friend as well, Cedric Cadogan, he's living in so much pain, literally and mentally, because he was also a victim of those attacks. Fortunately, he did not succumb to his injuries, but he's living in serious pain. His face is dented in. One of his, he's lost vision in one of his eyes. He has mental issues going on because of that. He's not able to work. He has lost his home. And he's basically homeless on the streets. He doesn't have the ability to fly out and, and, and get medical attention. But those are just two of the very serious issues that I wish to mention here today. Of the impact of mental ill health, if I can call it that, in this country. We have, I believe, around 100 medical doctors in our system, or thereabout. How many of those are mental health specialists and practitioners? Don't, let, let's not play politics with this, man. Let's not try to make Bramble look bad and Bramble don't know what he's talking about. This is a serious issue, Madam Speaker. The last time I checked, I, 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 I believe we had one clinical psychiatrist here. And I think this morning some mention was made of her no longer being here, of her departure for whatever reason. We got to be more serious than this. We have to be more serious than this. We have people walking around with men mental health issues in this country that we will never even suspect they're suffering from mental health issues. It's a serious problem. And we have to do something better than that. We have to address it, not only in the context of fighting crime and violence, but in the context of the health of our nation. It's all interconnected. You can't separate them. Poverty, for example, is another well-established cause of crime. And I recall some time ago I had asked a question in relation to this and the response in this honorable house and um, the response from the Minister of National Security seemed, well, didn't convince me, 
that he was convinced that the extent to which poverty contributes to crime is as alarming, and I'm using my own term here, as I would like to make or have people believe. But the fact of the matter is that poverty is one of the main causes of crime. You don't have to be poor and pull a gun and go out and shoot a man and thief his money. But there are other connections, there are other related um, reactions because of poverty. Thank you, thank you, honorable colleague. Desperation. I mean, we, we see it, we feel it all the time. I am a tongue man. I, I get around in tongue all the time from since I was a little boy. And I am telling you, I've never seen more indigent, desperate, homeless, hungry people on the streets of Kingston than, than now. That, that didn't just happen by coincidence. Didn't just happen by coincidence. Drugs, Madam Speaker, is another of the causes which contribute to the incidence of crime and particularly gun violence and gun crime in our country. And I really would like, I wish I would have, we would have the benefit of access to proper data and proper information with regards to the connection between these causes and the actual incidence of crime. Because if you, if you can't properly diagnose the problem, if you don't have the evidence on which to base your decision and to base your policy, we're spinning our top in mud, as the old people say. We gotta have the information. You can't continuously speculate that it's only a small handful of young men or that this or that. We have to have the data. We have to have the evidence. If we are to make meaningful inroads in addressing this problem. And I know that colleagues are going to speak after me. And <laughs> I am not that optimistic. But it would be good to get that support. But Madam Speaker, there are so many social issues which we, I think, sometimes play too much politics with. Unemployment, for example. The lack of employment opportunities is an issue faced in countries such as ours. It's a reality. And we can bring all kind of draft labor market survey telling us that unemployment in St. Vincent is now 10%. Well, I don't know what world we're living in, but I can tell you that unemployment in this country is at, is at an unprecedented high. And there's no doubt in my mind. There's no doubt in my mind that it is at least, at worst, correlated to the incidence of crime in this country and at best cause crime in this country. Think about it. I encountered a young man in my constituency not too long ago. He's in his late 20s. Went to the community college and I can't remember how many CAPE subjects he got, but he has a couple of CAPE subjects. He's in his late 20s, eh? So it means that he would have grad he, he graduated from the community college close to at least 10 years now. And he has never, ever worked in his life. Never worked in his life. And it's not for lack of trying. When I spoke with him, you know what he told me? He said, Bramble... Buy me two rabbits. I want to start raising rabbits. That's what he told me. It's wrong? Well, if, if he graduated at 18, if he graduated at 18 and he's 28, 29, at least that's close to 10 years. But, but I, 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 I am guided accordingly. I, I appreciate Madam Speaker. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not backing down, you know. But, but, but the point is, the point is, amidst, amidst, all, amidst all the comedy from the other side, I consider this to be more serious than pretending to be on comic view. This is no joke. This is no laughing matter. You can laugh and kick all you want. 
But the reality stays with us. What do we do? What can us do? To use the quotation from a famous parliamentary colleague. It's serious. It's serious. I'm not a comic. I'm quoting your colleague. I'm quoting your colleague. That's, I'm not being a comic. I'm quoting him. <laughs> so, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, the point is, this is a crisis situation in my view. Our crime situation in this country has reached... To, let me tell you something. I have, I, I have a very good friend of mine. You know what? I'm, I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. Hold on, Major. I have a friend. And he said to me, he said, Bramble, this situation has gotten so bad. He said when he comes out in his yard at nights to feed his dogs, he's trapped. His gun is in his waist. I kid you not. You can't make up these stories. These are our harsh realities. And I know amidst our wanting to look and sound macho as men, I know that every single male member of this house has at least an inkling, if not more, of fear in this country because of our crime situation. You can, you can say what you want. It's a fact. So, we need to, we need to, we need to extend, we need to extend our efforts, and we in the New Democratic Party, we, we believe that there are many things that can be done, and I am going to take the liberty to appeal, to appeal to the government to be more inclusive in our fight against crime. There are so many things we can do. I think the Prime Minister in his introduction, in, in introducing the bill, referred to multilateral mechanisms and partners. And, and I myself, as a former representative of this country in our multilateral space via the OAS as the Deputy Permanent Representative to the OAS, I am also fully aware and I'm quite sure my, my honorable friend, the Minister of, of Finance, as a former ambassador of the UN, to the UN, sorry, is also fully aware of these mechanisms. And we know, we understand the significant role that they can play. I don't believe that we are utilizing those mechanisms enough. For example, we cannot do it alone, literally and figuratively. We cannot do it alone internally, regionally, nor internationally. We have to collaborate. And I am making that strong appeal. I am making that strong appeal that we do so. Um, again, I want to reiterate the fact that we support this bill. We believe, and by the way, I heard reference being made to the lack of response by the public, by stakeholders and what have you. And I myself have a problem with that. But I am also of the view I am also of the view that if they don't come to us, why can't we go to them? I am not, I am not by any stretch of the imagination, watering down the responsibility of the public and our stakeholders. But I am of the view that this crime situation in, in our country is, is so grave, it's at a crisis level, that sometimes you have to act outside of the box, to use the cliché. And I think it is something that in future we, we should consider. You can't continue to, if something doesn't work, you have to try to change it. You have to try to adjust it and make it work. And so, again, Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, I conclude by repeating and emphasizing our strong for support for this bill, but also encouraging a more robust approach to a more comprehensive strategy and approach to solving or fighting crime in this country. I'm much obliged. For the debate, 
I recognize the Honorable Member for Central Kingstown. Just a moment. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute further to this most important conversation that is taking place in this Honorable House this evening. Madam Speaker, there's much on the plate for us to digest. I want to say how pleased I am with the quality and the depth of the contributions. I want to say how pleased I am with the contributions of the Honorable Senator Israel Bruce. The research, the depth, the clarity, the innovation, the creativity, and the factual matrix in which he set out his presentation. I also want to applaud the Honorable Member for East Kingstown, notwithstanding the chagrin of the Prime Minister, Minister of National Security, and really identify myself, and he's more seasoned and accomplished in this regard than I am, as seasoned elder statesman in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. veteran politicians in this honorable house. Quite naturally, the honorable prime minister comes with an advantage in that there are many experiences, many of them would have been heart-wrenching, that he would have, that we are not privy to. But as painful as that would be, it does not negate the veracity or the quality of the contributions or thus far. This is a conversation that perhaps is overdue. And I really make a very passionate appeal to the Honorable Prime Minister. Not to rubbish or to get even or disregard the expressions coming from this side of the house, difficulties that it might be to swallow, or do what oftentimes takes place in this house. You open with accommodating an appealing presentation, and then you wrap up. You sweep everything like a raging volcano out of the way because it was not very digestible to your taste. There comes a time in which you have to stand back and listen, Mr. Prime Minister. I'm really surprised that I, I listened to colleagues scoff on the other side of the house. Some joked about it, some found it comic relief, and some questioned the accuracy of the conclusions of the Honorable member for East Kingstown, as if once a conversation emanates from other quarters, it's of lesser value than when it emanates from themselves. But there are some harsh facts that we have to come to grips with. There are harsh facts that we have to come to grips with. And they're scientific. They're, the statistical evidence is there. There is an unacceptable level of crime and violence in St. Vincent and the Grenadines that is stinkifying this country in public places and public spaces. And there isn't a member of parliament or a constituency representative here this evening who is not dismayed or alarmed in this 
uncontrollable escalation of crime that now pervades the land almost to the point of being a pandemic. Well, an epidemic. Pandemic is too strong, an indefensible expression. This is far too much. The Honorable Member for East Kingston cited the shooting of the five in the quarry area, the area which was born, just about a minute and a half from there. Let me tell you something, and I've said this, not in the house, you know. I had people come forward to me and offer to be provide evidence if they could go into witness programs. And I reached out as best as I thought that they couldn't get assistance in that. And the information that came back is that they don't know why. But the poor is that they say, leave them if you're dead. I know of one woman who sold down to her $16,000 cooler to find refuge in England. In fact, if you go there today to England, I'm told many of them up there with screw faces. Because the trouble is that many of them, after they've perpetrated the crime, they still want to have their 50,000 virgins. And none of them want to die in return, and they eventually they take off and leave it to others down low in the totem pole. But a serious crime in this country, very, very serious crime, very. And the honorable member for East Kingston, who lost a son to crime, violence, has authority to speak on the subject. But he has even more authority, like myself, MP Cummings, South Leeward MP Nature, and to an extent, other colleagues in the East and West St. George's area, which would include the Minister of Finance. Because that southern belt, that southern horn of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, is where perhaps 80% or so of the gun violence takes place. I don't claim to know why. I don't think the Minister of Finance knows why all my colleagues in the other city centers. But it's a harsh reality. I, as a member of Central Kingston, have more than my fair share of gun-related incidents. And sometimes when I think I'm in the ascendancy, boop, boop, Fitz clipped me. Before Fitz could say that I have more than anybody else, Daniel Cummins constituency jumps in, and they take the lead. It's like musical chairs in the Kingston, so who is carrying the most crime? I, I reference that, you know. I reference that simply to make the point that that is not the experience, to the best of my ability, of my knowledge, of what we call rural St. Vincent, farm community St. Vincent. Invariably, when they have their crimes, or the murders, or the homicides, you call it what you want, choose your word, Oftentimes it's crimes of passion, sometimes over food. Fellow use a cutlass, stab up, or some kind of blunt weapon, but less that the gun that obtains in the south, and more of something else in the north of St. Vincent, Madam Speaker. So that even when recently there was one in South Rivers, the Prime Minister's home constituency, as an aberration. It is something you have to cock your ears to and open your eyes wide because you want to know why the migration or if it's an exception to the rule or if it's a member of the so-called gangs. Years ago, the police didn't even want you to use the word gangs in the service. They said it didn't exist. The fact is that it is taking place and we have to address it. The Honorable Prime Minister is uncomfortable with the fact that he's reminded at times with his off-the-cuff remark, which I will not repeat here. But no, everybody knows you, you can't speak sweeter than him. And his famous Toussaint 
and Mitchell and cocaine and so on and so forth. The tapes must be gone soft now. And if this and in that, you have to blame him to see, you have to blame Mitchell, it's Mitchell's fault. But the same thing's happening today. Nobody's saying it's Ralph's fault. Maybe it's all of us' fault. The fact of the matter, when the rain falls, it falls in all of us' house. I know of situations, you know. And, and believe you me, it is getting even dangerous for us as politicians to speak to the subject of crime and violence. I remember once the late E.G. Lynch addressing crime and violence on a radio station in Dorset Hill, just outside of my gate. And by the time he left downstairs to come up to go to his vehicle, the gunmen waited there for him. They dragged him up against the wall and they asked him what he knows about the subject matter in a threatening way such that he must not repeat himself or he may become a victim himself. I can tell you of very many other close calls it is something that informs even the way I do my politics these days. I'm no longer sitting on a block with the same comfort and safety as I did 25 years or so when I did politics in my constituency. Because there have been so many near misses. Only this morning you bought pumpkin from the guy there. And two hours after, at the same place, the shed, where killing take place. He just drove off from here, and Bobo there it was. Last, earliest night I left home to go to church. First of all, I got pulled off because I had up in the hospital. Before I could leave the hospital, there was a call. There was a gun shooting in my constituency, Central Kingston. Young man, and we all say they're innocent, and I believe he's innocent, shot dead. We had a vigil for him. We thought that had gone away. A little after that, three weeks, another, two minutes away, the brother of somebody who had been killed, or a relative of somebody who had been killed up in Gibson Corner, he'll swear to you he knows who killed his brother. But if he talk, he too will be a dead man. He asked if he could get those bushes cleared for him, if we could have more police patrols, and so on and so forth. We had yet another vigil. And while we have individual, the disorderly conduct of some was as such that I said, look, I'm addressing you here tonight in this visual conversation. I said so in the parliament before. Go down this star lift panyard. All of you, I invite you. And I wasn't trying to score political points because my uh, political opponent in the constituency, um, you won't remind me of his name, Madam Speaker. I don't call his name. The guy who's run against me. Any help? Sutherland, thank you very much. I can't. Sometimes he's so removed from the politics, I don't often remember. But bad memory. Bad memory. I, as I said, elder statesman. He joined me, and we invited them to go to the panyard. And think truth, think hard. Meet that night, meet another night, meet any time. And come back to say to us, in what way we could help them to look at an alternative way of organizing themselves. Block making, learning to walk the land, to go to the sea, apprenticeship programs to repair shoes, watch, television, you name them, whatever creativity. We believe that between both our reaches, we could lend assistance. I haven't heard from them since. I haven't written them off. One spoke a little bit more detail, and all his ideas helped get me on the oil rig. Well, nothing's wrong with that. It's a quick way out. But the fact of the matter, they, like others, constitute what I've come to the conclusion of, that there is a too large a body of young people, men and women, in this country, who have given up on the lifestyle that we are thinking and are promoting for them whether it's an education opportunity, whether it's the opening of this hotel, whether it is going on this ship or whatever. Many of them want a quick buck, a quick dollar, and they have chosen or made the wrong decisions as far as I'm concerned. So what do we do with them? Incarcerate them all? 
Minister Bramble made the point, or was it um, Senator Booth, that if we double the sentences at the prisons, then we double the cost for the taxpayers. I think it was 10 or 15 years ago I came to this house, you know, and I shared the startling statistic then. It costs $13,000 a year to keep a person in prison. $13,000 it was. And we were contributing at that time only $5 to keep a member in the Girl Guides Movement. You brought a number of them here the last time, Madam Speaker. I think we gave, um, and I did the crunch, we gave $1,500 to the Girl Guides Movement and about 300 Girl Guides. All, well, they have a large number, so if, if I lose my argument, is that the sentence is worse than I'm presenting. But look at the disparity. That $13,000 per prisoner now has moved to about $17,000. I crunched the numbers again when we had the last budget for which I didn't present. In other words, the gap between those who can commit themselves or, and or committing themselves to constructive life, mainstream, contributions are getting less and less, and those who we have to incarcerate is costing more and more. Madam Speaker, this is something that I could speak to experientially. The young senators are there would not know. The gray hairs, the bald in here. They would not imagine that there was a time when I was the commandant of the cadet force. I had the privilege in that period, you know, to run up and down the Caribbean, train with every defense force in the region, almost from A to Z. And that is something, Mr. Prime Minister, by the way, let me, let me, let me strike while you're in this hot in that matter now. Because what happened then is that Canada provided an aircraft. It dropped off Canadian cadets from Jamaica right down to Trinidad and Tobago. And on a sudden trip, it picked up cadets from each of those islands in an extensive training program. And in the North Bung, North Bung journey, it returned if it took up the cadets who went north. People like St. Vincent and Grenada, who didn't have international airports, had staging points. We either went to Barbados to catch the plane or went to Trinidad to catch it. But they produce quality men. People like Richie Robinson and a whole list of names I couldn't tell you in this society. I don't know why the program ended. But it is something that can, we can think again. Don't have to be the Canadians. Could be some other funding source. But they are ideally placed. It can go well with one of the solution measures that I have in mind but we need to begin to think of an annual boot camp for a number of our young people where they can be exposed to serious discipline, not just totally military, but can introduce them to other lifestyle possibilities. I say that tangentially, Madam Speaker. But in that same program, you may not believe it, it was yours truly after I came back from jungle training in Guyana that brought two soldiers here from the Guyana Defense Force in the days of Latchman, who was the superintendent, to introduce them, and I think Minister Prince will understand because he knows me a little bit more in terms of my military history. Introduce them to certain weapons training and replace the old, what used to call the red squad those days, in the khaki pants and the steel hat, to the more modern type of outputs that we have now. So I speak as one who wore the uniform. When I was at Vinlec, I lectured at the police training school. The superintendent of police now, right, was a recruit in my program when I lectured at the police training school. Bright, promising in individuals who have gone on to Fort Bragg and other places. Very qualified, very decent young men. A number of them are still in the force. Lectured to the police sergeants. I became commandant of the auxiliary police force at one time. Interestingly enough, I've asked the, that question, you know, because I, I don't know some things. I'm staying on the subject matter, and I haven't lost my way. You know. One major coach who also was a commandant of cadets and came here from Barbados also did emerge to be the commissioner of police. First and only time a commandant of cadets was elevated to commissioner of police. Now, we have others who have done fairly work. Well, Richard Brown became a cadet, and he became an assistant commissioner of police. Colin John himself was a cadet and became a commissioner of police. And there are several other cadets, Tannis, who went to Grenada in the, um, the, the Grenada Uprising. And I can go through and call names after names after names. But 
I don't understand why more of the people who are in the opportunity of being cadets don't find more of them in the police service, in the leadership programs. But I got them, Mr. Madam Speaker, speaking to you just, the Honorable Prime Minister, who was raising the question, justifiably and rightly, what is it about this fascination with guns? And in the same process, advising a lot of our young men that they're mashing up their lives. And he's right. What's the fascination? Why that choice of the alternative lifestyle? Why are they mashing up themselves? And he went on to suggest that perhaps they use this amnesty that we're offering as an opportunity to turn things around. Even when I sat in the parliament today, I just speed check um, the net on amnesties. Most of it that they had was carried about in the United Kingdom, and there's no end of stories about amnesties. The truth of the matter, in the Caribbean, out of the Caribbean, around the world, amnesty seems not to have worked. Not that I believe that something is inherently wrong with it. I don't know what other ingredients needs to come along with it for it to work, but we don't have any track record of amnesties delivering the results for the investments that we're making in it. But I do not feel that we should exclude it. Still try. Because even if it's one gun taken off the road, it's one life perhaps to save, or maybe many more lives of the one gun. So let's give it a try and give it our best, bet and promote it. But the Honorable Senator Bruce, the Honorable Senator Bruce was on to an important expansion of the conversations that should consume all of us on both sides of the house. It's not a time for scoring points. You're losing family, I'm you losing family. You're losing relatives, I'm losing relatives. It's not safe for women, it's not safe for children. It is bad for investment opportunities. Let's solve it. Let's come together on this matter. Senator Bruce expanded a team which I have been given thought to. And I repeat myself as I said earlier today, no honorable prime minister. And this is your part of your strength. You're an academician. I don't know what kinds of work is going on with our university institutions or the resource institutions. Do we still have an ISER, for example, as you had in your time at UA? I don't know if it is as reputable now as it was then where all sorts of important social conditions were examined and important propositions put forward as you did in your day as an academician. But we clearly seem to have a need to have a parallel program. The language of Senator Bruce was on the one hand, we need to have a curative program and I have a, not the same words as him, one in which the long, legal long handle is at work. Some people may say a big stick, where you try to beat people into submission. Don't interpret me literally. But that will yield, yield so much and so much results only. Um, we all know the stories. And some of them are stories of cowardice. I know me couple me school and put down I ain't afraid to go back there. And some of them <laughs> do mean that. Um, I have had enough experience in the constituency myself where I've had to carry in people to the bars with cutlass, with this and with that, and come out of hiding from the police, having to do it for myself. I sit in the blocks, I hear conversations, and we have some real strange conversations. You know? The guy showed me that day a little pack of weed for four dollars. It's a major we can't get the sell, you know. The ten dollars weed killing weed. The four dollars weed can't sell, the ten dollars weed, processed weed, legal weed. So I said, boy, the best thing for you to do is to apply for one license to sell weed too. And see if in the process of having a license to sell weed, you can sell weed. 
The Prime Minister understands that conversation. A lot of our young men are lost. A lot of them are lost. Sometimes I can't even find any money to deal with some of these situations. When, when I run out, I say, go around by Bruce and see what Bruce could do for you. And Bruce say, well, at least just pay this minimum cost and I'm going to carry the rest. And so on and so forth. And he has helped. But all over my constituency, peaceful neighborhoods, Green Hill, when I started my politics day, crime was unheard of. We have new language in the lexicon of St. Vincent de Grandin today. Huh? Minister Prince, when you were a young man, you didn't know anybody who was described as a shooter. Am I incorrect? There were no such individuals, no such characters. Madam Clark, I can't ask you because you know you're neutral, so you can only look at me and put your fingers on your, your lips. But the word did not exist. Shooter. No. So many people want to be a shooter. And you hear the conversation, he's a good shooter, he's a bad shooter, he's a poor shooter. Who does shoot then miss? He didn't even want to kill him. He been right over the man and he missed. I've been shooting as a conversation. And who has been recruited for shooting is a conversation. How did we get here? We built on the President Belial and they didn't stop shooters from emerging. All this is not to dismiss the amendments that are proposed and so well presented by the Honorable Prime Minister. But it is that we have to dig deeper and deeper. I went to a consultation like one or two hours, he might have gone to the Methodist Church Hall a few years ago. And the professor of criminology who spoke then warned that if we did not arrest the decay in our society and the rising crime and violence, that we would not be long off when we would surpass that of Jamaica that had long itself established itself as a crime citadel in the Caribbean. It seemed that so said, so predicted, so achieved. And I am not saying that that is as a consequence wholly and solely of the absence of opportunity. It may be so. But too many of them have given up on the society. And so what we have to do is attempt to see how many of them we can save. Because for me, the question of crime and violence is now something cultural. The, the behavior is gone. Thanks for the nodhead. It, it is something deeper. It's a, it's a kind of insanity that is difficult to explain. Sometimes you and I are sitting right next to the person who will be transforming in the next few hours in the evening or the night. And you can't believe it. And there's always the best one. He's the one who brought in this. He brought in that. He don't trouble a soul, eh? The only thing you don't see is altar boy. Huh? And sometimes they say that too. You know? It's an amazing experience, you know? You know, he who fears his life would lose it. Are we waiting for any one of us? as a politician, as a member of parliament, lose our lives, that we say, well, we have to do something like this, that we have to have a curfew, we have to bring a new regional security system, we have to close down this community and that community. I was so glad when Assistant Commissioner Boudreau, who I have great respect for as a crime fighter, said that St. Vincent will never become a place in which the police can't go there. That is said in some communities in the region, you know that the police can't go here or they can't go there. Let's pray, God, that never, ever happens in our beloved St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It must never happen. It must never allow it to happen. And so, I subscribe, and maybe I don't get a lot of currency for it, but we still have to remain 
a second chance society. We still have to remain a second chance society. A lot of our women have missed the fourth, second, and third rope to hold on to climb out of the situation and circumstances that it, that it is. Bruce, I'll leave out the senator because you don't want me to ask you a story that may you witness a time when a woman made a statement that she trusts a man a piece of wife and you won't come back. <laughs> you prefer it. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> you don't want to say it again. But it may sound hilarious. But it speaks to where we are as a society. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we have to be a second chance society. And those young men who dropped out of school for whatever reason, you know, and are not inclined to go through the the drudgery. What's the word if I'm going back into class and so forth and standing up when the master coming and being disciplined and regimented and all them kind of thing? School is something is only the best is when you're done with it. You know? It's not always when you're inside the school or school is the best, you know. So I'm not saying that is. But we have to find a way to get them back into some meaningful opportunity. I throw out some of them. And they're not out of place and out of hand. And maybe now our collective wisdom, the, the, the government, brought in some aspect of it. I said, here's a country. Here's a country, a lot of land. Idle ha lands all about the place. And if you have all these idle lands, cattle, grass, like joke, and we have idle hands. Let's try and put the idle hands to the idle lands. And now that we have aggregators and alligators and all sorts of things around the place, and we want to produce more, that's probably an opportunity. The old days, you know, when your child didn't make it, you send him by Mr. Warren to learn to fix shoes. You send him by Miss This to learn to make clothes. You send him by that to learn to run blocks. This one went there to learn um, carpentry. Uh, this one went there to learn how to milk cow. They did all kinds of things, all kinds of unstructured without large institutional arrangement and mechanism that created a lot of our young men to become artisans of yesterday and of today. Make something of themselves. Don't dismiss them. Let's give them a chance. All of us speak about apprenticeship programs on the, that side and on this side. Boo speaks about it. I spoke about it. Dr. Lowe spoke about it. Ferdinand, several others of so many talented people we have in our society. We want to wait on CUSO and base of British Executive Services overseas or Canadian Executive Services overseas to come in here to help our own people. When we have so many retired public servants, so many retired private sector executive business persons, that we can't get them into a framework to hold the hands of those who have fallen through the, the cracks to give them a second chance opportunity of some kind of skill that they can make some use of themselves. Our marine potential are within $5 million worth of fishing. Yeah, we need to do 150. We need more trawlers. St. Vincent has, and it's gonna get worse before it gets better, you know, if we don't do something about it, you know, because you see, See, you see the economic equation that is changing? It's sandals that's on the ground that can buy up all the food stuff that we're talking about. And that I am on this side of the equation talking about a $50 million food processing plant. All those dynamics change, you know. Because if you can't even get the raw material to supply the hotel, where you'll get the raw material to go into a factory to process. Hmm? You understand? So we have, first of all, to come squarely to grips that we must have a production problem. So we should not have an employment problem of any magnitude side by side with a production challenge. When we have the land and we have the people and we have the resources and we have the know-how and we have the experience and we have the market opportunity. 
whether it's on the land, whether it's on the sea, whether it's in the factories, we can do it. Whether it's in the utility companies, we can make investments. And all the utility companies can do something better with the HR departments to have turnover programs to make people certified plumbers at Water Authority, certified mechanics at Vinlick, certified electricians, wiremen, whatever it is, bring to bear on the utility experience. And I can get into that too, to do what we're doing. I'm saying that some of these, all of these are possibilities within our second chance opportunities. It's not exhaustive, but it's stimulating the thought patterns. We have to come with the carrot, side by side with the long handle approach, the curative approach, as, you, as one friend spoke about it, to deal with the situation. It wasn't as far fetched, therefore, when quite some time ago, when I had recommended to Anne Musa, then leader of the opposition, that we have something called Social, Spiritual, and Redemption Charter. Prime Minister scoffed at it, but I came back and I listened to him himself said, it's not very likely to find a cadet in prison. I said, none do I ever go there. But it's not likely to find a Thomas on the student. I didn't go to grammar school in prison. Minister of Finance, you, you remember the days when you, you, you lived on the passes when even you had love football till you didn't feel you would never stop kickball. I didn't say you're a good football, and I say you love football. And you spent, you spent huge amounts of time. Huh? And you remember those days how the pastures was ram jam. You could hardly find a little space. The cadets up there, the cubs down there, the sparrow dunk them across the Frenches there, up street there, all kinds of community. I'm not emphasizing the sport that they were playing, you know, the football, the cricket, the flannel ball. But the mentoring process that was taking place, in some cases, men was getting vice, jamming up against the bigger and older men and learning how to deal with this situation, that situation. But all those things have dissipated. It's not happening up street on the plain field in a natural way. You could hardly drive past um, grammar school in those places in an evening. It's not happening at the Victoria Park. The rivalry between the guys them wrong park who want to see the guys them from up street on the national team and downtown who wants to see the Montrose who guys in it. But a combative place to be born your energy and involve yourself. These are challenges for the ministers of sports, social development, and of education, and for finance and the prime minister. And for those of our side, we have to put our great matters together to find solutions. But all of this to come back to the presentation of the Prime Minister, has to be anchored on something substantive. And what is presented here today is something substantive. It's tangible. It's not unreasonable. It's not punitive. But we can't prov provide people with incentives to live a life of crime. We can't. We have to stand firm on those issues and be united on those policies. But we have to see what is the best mix to save the generation unborn. The generation unborn. I thank God I say something that I got old early. Almost all of my family members have worn the uniform. It gives me some sense of pride and authority. My own son, who is a major, looking for a promotion that's called the world's finest fighting force. My niece, as a chemical specialist in the U.S. Army. My nephew. My brother, who served at one time a captain in the U.K. The reserves. So many of us. Dr. Cleve Scott, Melissa Scott. All outstanding in the cadet force. And I could go on with names after names after names. I see that to make the point. We have to strengthen those institutions that are working for us. If we had this morning the occasion where we would have done congratulations, I would have highlighted the Barbie Discredit Force that just had its 120th anniversary. And when some 400 of cadets were on parade, and the consequence of that in shaping the culture of that society, I would have alluded to a wonderful interview that I listened to by Wes Hall. In his colleague, his names don't make any sense to some of you inside of here, Charlie Griffith. 
in have, having a statue, statue constructed by the bar, it's critical league in the Hall of Fame, and he had come to town as an ordinary country boy and made his way through, just to sports. In other words, there are all sorts of avenues that can allow us to escape from these situations. And I'm not providing an easy excuse for anybody that we are here because of poverty and we're here because of this and we're caused because here. Lots of failure. We have had problems with school system, which is our socializing system. We have problems in our churches. When I go to church on Sunday morning, I'm a Catholic. I can count how many of us in church. We hardly ever reach 50. I could get a whole pew for myself. If somebody go before, so who going to sit down my chair now? In a church, you know? Who going in this spot? You know? Palm Sunday morning, when we had probably less than that. Palm Sunday morning. The bishop was lamenting the fact that we could have. Well, to tell you the truth, I came down to process from the market a little late because I had a late night overworking. So I came down with the metrics behind. If I found a dozen Catholics going down in front, I found plenty when I catch up with them. But he was lamenting the fact that here we are scrunting to get two people in the church. And he had red paint, blue paint, yellow paint, pink paint, paint fed, fed fed, street full of picnic nigger. That's government, that's home, that's family, that's decadence in the society, that's young people who have lost its way. I don't want to say in these things, you know, that we have a lot of work to do, whatever side of the aisle that we're on. We have a lot of work to do. Mr. Prime Minister, I don't know if it's a few days or a few months or anything going to be forever. And I don't know what row of the pew you're sitting in. We can't give up. We have to save our generation unborn. We have to hold hands in this place called St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Much obliged, Madam Speaker. For the debate, for the debate, yes, I recognize the Honorable Minister of Tourism. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable members, I rise to make my contribution to this bill, which is the amendment to the Firearms Act, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I don't profess, Madam Speaker, to be a major in the cadet force. I'm not an expert. On, on crime or from the bowels of the inner city. But I'm pleased to add my voice and naturally as a legislator, as a fair understanding of criminal practice, being a practitioner in the law, and my general experience of how Our social demographics has changed as a people. And Madam Speaker, this bill, it comes at a time when the region is facing what I would consider a major challenge as it relates to trafficking and the use of illegal firearms. Now, I listen to members on both sides of the house more particularly members on the opposition who are supporting this, this bill before you, Madam Speaker. But they took a sort of narrow view in the context of the domestic aspect of what is taking place as it relates to firearms. I think all of us, we have a fair understanding that this thing is beyond the borders of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It's a serious issue of illegal firearms that is a regional, multifaceted, 
and an issue that goes even up to the borders of the United States of America. So much so, Madam Speaker, that CARICOM, our regional bloc, has declared crime and violence as a public health issue. An epidemic affecting member states. And Madam Speaker, it's no secret that our region is awash with illegal firearms. And this is stemming from the illicit firearms trade between the United States and America, of America and the Americas, and where we are caught sandwiched in the middle. Because more so because of our borders, and as the Global Organized Crime Index puts it, our region, our poorest borders, make it a virtual paradise for black market dealers seeking an easy transit of illegal weapons. And that is simply what it is. Transnational firearm trafficking. And I'm looking at the numbers from impacts. They're showing that it's responsible for about 70% of the murders that are taking place within the Caribbean. That also includes St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So we are, in fact, experiencing a multi jurisdictional surge in trafficking and use of illegal firearms, criminality as it relates to the use of illegal firearms. And that also has a bearing and an impact on the implications domestically, which most of the members focused on here this, this evening. But it's, as you can see, Madam Speaker, it's, it's far reaching and beyond the borders of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Now, I like to look at the positives. Despite these challenges and what we've highlighted, the multi-jurisdictional surge, I like to look at the positives. Collaboratively, we are fighting this issue. Gun crime, as I said, is not a localized issue. It's not a government issue. It's not a PM Gonsalves, Minister of National Security issue. It's an issue that is affecting all of us. It's an issue that is affecting every single member of our society. And every Caribbean island and member state of CARICOM. So it has the social dimensions. It has this regional security considerations. And all of us, we have that collective responsibility to maturely address this in a fundamental way that all of us can have a wider and a broad understanding of what the issues are. First, with the trafficking, trading of illegal firearms and its use within our domestic space. So, what is the region doing? Madam Speaker, the regional crime and gun intelligence unit, a formulation, a unit was established, it's based in Trinidad to facilitate a greater level of cooperation among regional and international law enforcement agencies. And this also includes, Madam Speaker, a, name, a lot from the members on IMPACTS, which is the Caribbean Community Implementation Agency for Crime and Security, the US State Department, Interpol, the associations of Commissioners of Police across the region, 
the regional security service, all of these agencies forms part of that unit in terms of the collaborative approach in addressing and stemming this systematic growing epidemic of the illicit trade and the trafficking of illegal firearms within our region. And I'm happy that we have long had the conversation at CARICOM with the United States of America about how we are controlling the entry of illegal drugs in the U.S., but not so much the exportation of illegal firearms from the U.S. to the Americas and also the Caribbean region. So it has been a developing conversation over a period of time. And I want to, in very rare form, go as far as to even applaud the U.S., the U.S. Congress, for taking some measures. They have established, Madam Speaker, the Caribbean Arms Trafficking Causes Harm Bill, which is CATCH, the acronym which seeks to facilitate and help curb the illicit and, and trafficking of firearms from the U.S. to the Caribbean region. Just last year, two Caribbean nationals were indicted on federal charges, trafficking of illegal firearms. And those firearms, Madam Speaker, were recovered in concealed household items shipped from Florida to, the, to Trinidad and Tobago. Usually you will hear of the, the fines in terms of the discovery of these items, but not so much going far as to the investigation on both domestic soil within the region and also in the U.S. in a great collaborative way to move in towards a conviction these are some of the steps that are being taken both at a regional and intra-regional level in addressing and stemming this tide, this growing tide that all of us have seen the ramifications of these challenges in our domestic space. So we have seen steps being taken across the board multi-jurisdictional level, support of Interpol, the United States, and even within the region, member states within CARICOM, they have gone about just within the last two, three years. We have seen some um, four amendments to the Firearms Act and the regulations in member states of, within CARICOM, and could just point out some, Madam Speaker, just last year, Trinidad and Tobago, they had an amendment to their Firearms Act. Moving, stipulating first offense, second offense, moving sentences from up to 25 years to life, or second offenses. In 2022, in Barbados, you had a similar approach taking place. Moving first offenses up to 10 to 20 years, and second offenses, 20 to life. Right now, Grenada, some time ago, had a 90-day amnesty on firearms. Anguilla had one in January of this year. St. Vincent and the Grenadines is, is taking the same approach and measure in relation to an amnesty. Jamaica had their amendments. They're, they're now at 25 years maximum sentence under their amendment to the Firearms Act. St. Kitts had their amendment in 2023, just last year as well. And St. Lucia, they are also looking at measures and so on, dealing with summary and indictable offenses. So it's not just St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We're taking a broad strategic approach regionally. And there's a consensus among member states and governments within the region that this fight against illegal firearms and the trafficking of illegal firearms 
is one that has to be broad-based, systematic, collaborative, and one that has to be, there has to be some harmonization and unison in the approach, both in the data, the intelligence gathering, and also the legislative strengthening to address these issues. So we are at this juncture here in 2024 in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And we are taking that approach. And I'm happy that we have the full support of the, the House in relation to this. We have heard, we have gone through what the, the provisions in the, in the, uh, the bill, the clauses, have highlighted in relation to increasing of the sentencing. But I want to, Madam Speaker, look at some of the unique provisions of this amendment, which is, is a bit more modern and forward thinking, and a bit more comprehensive and detailed than some of the, even the other legislations and the legislative amendments in the other member states have mentioned. Some of them capture it, but not in fulsome. Addressing the use of trafficking of firearms or prohibitive weapon, a prohibited weapon under Clause 19B, the inclusion of that, I think is important. But also, Madam Speaker, there's this new phenomenon, the modern approach used by criminal elements who are using the technology that is at their disposal to develop more modern weaponry that even in its legislative form, in some instances, would not be considered by the letter of the law under the old act a firearm. And you're talking about 3D printing guns and so on. The ghost guns which we spoke about and the Honorable Prime Minister in his preamble and his debate mentioned ghost guns. But what, what is fascinating about that, Madam Speaker, is that these ghost guns are actually parts and pieces of a mechanism that is imported and they're coming to our shores within the region and in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in cereal boxes. They are coming in different hidden compartments, in barrels and in clothing. And they're coming in pieces, so they're easy to conceal. So you'll have the trigger and the component, the mechanism, shipped ship differently from the nozzle. And when they get here, what they simply do, Madam Speaker, is that they assemble these pieces together. So they are coming as manufactured parts. And then if you have enough resources to acquire a 3D printed machine, it is very easy now, Madam Speaker, the level of sophistication that is at the disposal of our criminal elements is that they can now clone and print these firearms. So they are printing them and they are using different means of transshipping certain parts of the firearm and assembling them here for their functionality. And we all know what the purpose in which they're doing this. This piece of legislation, the amendments, capture within it, Madam Speaker, the definition for ghost guns, 3D printing, printed firearms, and there are penalties associated with these pieces of ammunition and equipment. If you're found with them, because they are as deadly as the real thing and the real deal. 
So this is, this is a plus of this piece of legislation. And clauses 19A and B, Madam Speaker, speaks to that in terms of how we move in capturing in detail those definitions. The increase in the penalties, Madam Speaker, possession up to 15 years and summary. This is for those who don't understand the difference with summary and indictment, indictable offenses. Summary is at the magisterial level. An indictable offense, in some cases, is either way, can be tried at the magisterial, but also mostly at the high court level. And we have sentences ranging, Madam Speaker, from to 15 and 25 years, respectively, up from 10 and 20 years. Possession of restricted weapon and ammunition. We've gone up, Madam Speaker, to 10 years, and in some respects. But the Prime Minister highlighted in very great detail um, those increases and, and the penalties. But these are also tools in the fight against the trafficking and possession of illegal firearms. And this piece of legislation, which we are bringing before the Honorable House, Madam Speaker, does have, it does bear relevance and is important in the current context of what is taking place within our region, within our space, in fighting criminal elements among us. But I think I want to just look at on the social front. To share, Madam Speaker, that the fascination with illegal firearms, you know, we heard the, the, the conversation, members, they're asking, where is this coming from? And, and let us not pretend that we don't know the real, the real major issues here. And this fascination is largely fueled, Madam Speaker, by the illegal drug trade. And I will further add, Madam Speaker, the urban American hood culture of tough control, which comes with the illegal drug trade. We have how many tons of cocaine being transshipped through our region? Quite often, Madam Speaker, a lot of it. You will hear of the arrests. It's not publicized. But very often, there are times when even the joint operation of our regional security services and our police force, they don't capture every single ton of brick or ton of cocaine that comes through this region. A lot of it is transhipped to rare. And it is not a problem that is unique to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It is something that all of us within the region and every member state, every, in particular every small island state, but the amount of beaches that we have, we're not able to properly secure borders. It is a haven for illegal traffickers. And with the illegal drugs that comes, comes these firearms. And that is, that is a known fact. And you don't need a lot of science to corroborate and prove that. I suppose we're a small society, and we know, Madam Speaker, what these challenges are. So I want to commend the drafters and those who have lent their voice to this bill, and in particular, the support and the work of all of our law enforcement agencies across the region. We've been working in a collaborative manner 
to close in on the trade of cocaine, the trafficking of illegal drugs, and of course, this measure also facilitates having an additional resource in which we can put pressure on the trafficking of illegal firearms and illegal drugs. This is what we're doing. So, Madam Speaker, I don't want for us to, while it is important to address the domestic social issues, let us also not omit where the source of these challenges are coming from. And the question now, Madam Speaker, for all of us, how do we begin to address these issues and doing so in a, fundamental, in a fundamental and wholesome way? All of these provisions which we have here are by and large part of that process of fighting criminality and the illegal drug trade and the, the trafficking of illegal weapons. I believe, Madam Speaker, that it is a progressive approach in which we have formulated today on, on this sitting of the parliament, we formulated, drafted, took to a select committee, had a broad provision for consultation, though we have had a little uptick in the debate from the public space on these legislative measures that we have, we have documented here today for passage, Madam Speaker. But they're all part of an important nexus of connecting the dots and fighting crime. Both earlier, the passage, Madam Speaker, of the Criminal Code Amendment and also this Firearms Amendment Bill. It speaks to our mandate within the legislature to move forward in a progressive way having the, the, the legislation to protect first out the vulnerable people among us, but also importantly on this one, protecting our society, our national security, our sovereignty. And giving our prosecutors a strengthened tool in which they can prosecute in full force Persons who are involved in the illegal and illicit trade of firearms. But I, I want us, Madam Speaker, as I conclude, to focus on the broader conversation of one, this issue being a transnational one. Secondly, this issue requiring support across the board, which we have, we, have, we have secured here in this parliament today, but also collaboratively within the framework of what we have as a society. The youth groups, the churches, the community organizations, everyone, we have a role to play in this fight against crime, Serious crime and illegal trafficking, the trafficking of illegal firearms. We have to give more support to our law enforcement agencies. And this is what we are doing here, Madam Speaker. So I want us to broaden the concept of, of what we're debating so that the public who's listening will have a greater appreciation and understanding. That when we see an increase in gun violence, 
or murders as a result of the use of firearms. It's an issue of concern domestically, yes, but it is also an issue that all governments within CARICOM we are working to address, and it is one that is quite concerning to all member states. And I'm just out, I'll outline, Madam Speaker, all of the many countries that have passed amendments to their firearms act. It clearly means that within the region, our governments are expressing grave concern about the trade and use of illegal firearms. And it doesn't require a partisan, narrow view of the causes of crime and serious crime, but to address this thing in a systematic and greater way in which it captures a narrative, all of the elements I've highlighted there. Let us work together as a country to move this country forward, protecting our borders, protecting our citizenry, and ensuring that the region remains a zone of peace. And this piece of legislation, the amendment here with Madam Speaker, is part and parcel, a part of that exercise in so doing. Madam Speaker, I wish this bill a safe passage. And Madam Speaker, I hope and can only trust that all of us, we take a collective approach in the fight against the illegal drug trade, the trafficking of illegal firearms, and the use of firearms, illegal firearms, among the criminal elements of our, within our society. Much obliged, Madam Speaker. For the debate, so I recognize the Honorable Minister of Finance. Always say so. <laughs> Always say so. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker, Honorable Members. I, I didn't think when the day started. We had two bills. And I remember the Prime Minister saying, well, if we finish close, if we're almost done close to lunchtime, we'll push the lunch break a little late. Um, I, I didn't think that we would be here at um, this, this hour um, discussing, no, discussing a bill, discussing two bills that, that had consensus from the start um, in terms of the, the text of the bills themselves. The, I, I like the Honorable Member for Central Kingstown appreciated the, the, the work that went into a lot of the presentations today, um, the sobriety and the research in the case of the Honorable Senator Bruce um, that went into many of the presentations. I, I take issue and I share the view of the Honorable Prime Minister that there was one presentation that did not um, match the, the, the tone and context of all the others that were made. Um, reminded of a quote from Macbeth about sound and fury. Um, but I won't make the whole quote because told by who and signifying what, somebody might think I'm trying to insult them. But I was reminded of it. I want to make a very brief point in response to one thing that the sound and fury of the Honorable Member for East Kingston brought forth before I get to my substantive presentation. The Honorable Member for, for East Kingston can't have it both ways. He can't say that he wants data and then ignore data. He can't say that he's relying on data and when he receives data, he ignores it. And he can't then substitute non-data for data. He said, for example, that poverty causes crime. 
He said it twice. But he presented no data for that supposition. And there is, in fact, no data for that. A causal relationship between poverty and pride. In fact, if he had listened to the honorable member for Central Kingston, who made the very accurate point that most of the gun crime in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is located in the cone, I would say essentially between Glen and Otley Hall. But he said it in a constituency-based way, from East St. George wrong to South Leeward. However you want to say it. The Honorable Member for Central Kingston correctly said that that is where the most of the gun crime exists. But it is also correct to say that that is the wealthiest cone of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And when the Honorable Member for Central Kingston was saying, you don't see crime like that in rural areas. Well, guess what? The census tells us that the poorest areas in St. Vincent and the Grenadines are precisely where you see the least crime in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, so, and I don't want to get into that debate other than to say, don't make statements. Don't be, the, don't be Mr. Data. And then make statements that are unsupported by data. And on the employment point, Let's just take out our pencils and do a quick bit of mathematics, Madam Speaker. There are less than 100, there are fewer than 110,000 people in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The workforce in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is 55,000 people. Okay? Remember that number, 55,000 people. There are 30,000 people who are students. The Honorable Member for the Southern Grenadines would know that the primary school, secondary school, college, there's about 30,000 students. There are 9,000 pensioners. There are uh, a similar number of children who are before preschool, five and under. And there's a workforce of 55,000. There are, according to the NIS, 43,000 people as active employees on the NIS roads. If you divide 43,000 by 55,000, you get 78%, which means that formal employment alone, well, not alone, because there are some informally employed people who are, who are on NIS, but the majority of the NIS payers are in the formal sector. That is 78%, which leaves unemployment of 22%. That's basic math. But the NIS numbers don't have all your farmers. They don't have all your fishers. They don't have your van drivers and your conductors and your domestics and your market vendors and your blocks makers and your gardeners and your and the waitresses and waiters and so on. So the NIS number does not capture the entirety of the employed population in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. But at a minimum, at a maximum, sorry, the unemployment rate would be 22% if you, didn't, if you discarded every farmer, domestic, waitress, van driver, blocks maker, um, you know, fellow who have a little swiper cleaning up and so on. Now, when you add those in, another 6,000 plus people, you get the unemployment rate that we discussed of 10.8%. Now, you can have a conversation about whether people are underemployed. That's a different conversation to have. And wages, whether people are happy with their wages, and whether somebody who is a vendor in the market would prefer to be working elsewhere. Those are all legitimate conversations we can have about opportunity, about decent wages, about underemployment. I'm perfectly happy to have that conversation. But don't be Mr. Data and ignore the data. I digress, Madam Speaker, and I want to come to the bill that we're debating. And I'm not going to be as broad-based as, as some of the others. I, I enjoy the rich philosophical discussion, and I'm sure that the Honorable Prime Minister is going to take up, for example, the Honorable Member for Central Kingstown, and, and they can have their dialogue. Um, but I'm going to speak to the bill that we're here to debate and place the bill in the context of some of the things that the Honorable Minister of Tourism mentioned and some 
the, 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 the context of the internal and the external pressures that lead to the challenge of firearms that we have in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and makes this bill a part of the response. I, there, there were some people over there saying that, look, this thing is not a panacea. This thing is not a panacea. Not, nobody on the government side ever claimed that it was a panacea. So that is the flimsiest of straw men to say that nobody over here said that it, it, it comprises the government's anti-crime plan or in its entirety was a solution to anything. Nobody said that. So to say that it is not a panacea is to state the obvious. That is as if I go to the, I tell, I tell my, my brother, the, the member for South Wind, well, he and I go in by the gas station to put some gas in my car. And when I come back, he say, but you ain't change the shocks. You ain't fix the brakes. You ain't fix the tire. You ain't paint over the vehicle. I went to get gas. So I never said going to gas was going to give me a new car. I said that this, this is one thing that I am doing. And we have to understand context when we discuss the bill. Every country, Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, has a different set of historical or legal or political or geographic factors that lead to their challenges with crime and dictate their responses. For example, Madam Speaker, in the United States of America, they have something called the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. That shapes their battles against gun violence in a way that it doesn't shape ours because we do not have a right to bear arms in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. They also have a massive gun manufacturing industry in the United States and a war machine that hires a lot of people and makes a lot of money of the manufacture and sale of guns. That shapes their response to firearm possession and gun crimes. We don't have those contextual issues. And so our responses are different from the responses of some of our neighbors because we are a multi-island state that has implications. Because of culture, as the honorable member for Central Kingston mentioned, culture is a big deal. And there is an acceleration of what will make somebody draw for a gun in St. Vincent and the Grandies. When, when I was first going to, what was it then, aquatic club? Remember the little air conditioned room they had there? They, they danced it. Plenty of people don't remember them days. But back then, if I mashed somebody clerks, he might chuck me off. And a few years later, if I went to touch, or if I went, was he one of the upstairs medics in the name? I shall you remember that one. Maybe you don't know, come on, man. Um, if I mash somebody's shoe then, it might be more than a chuck off. Somebody might box me or slap me. And now, if I mash somebody clerk, somebody might pull a gun on me. There has been an evolution, a cultural evolution, in terms of, and I think Senator Bruce, uh, not, yeah, Senator Bruce mentioned as well, um, the escalation of conflict and, and settlement of, of arguments and those kind of things. And the, the, the cultural elements there. We have a police force which has to respond to gun crimes in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, five years ago, seven years ago, we had 830 police on the ground, not counting Coast Guard and Fire Engine and all of these people. Now, we've added 350 to that number in terms of police. That's a response to gun crime. We have the issue of detection. The Honorable Prime Minister alluded to the fact that right now in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we're installing cargo scanners at the port, led by the Honorable Minister for the port, Senator Brown, Senator Benava Brown. There is a cargo scanner in Camden Park that is operational and working well, and one in Kingston that has been installed, but the people to operate the Kingston one are currently getting training in Camden Park. 
And that is an expenditure of $2 million made this year. They installed this year to be another measure against guns coming into St. Vincent and the Grenadines because we know that guns come into St. Vincent and the Grenadines all kind of ways. The, Senator, um, the Minister of Tourism was referring to it. Dismantled parts coming in barrels and boxes and all that sort of thing. We are now installing cutting-edge, multi-million dollar technology to try to detect some of that at the port. There are social interventions and rehabilitations, and a lot of people have spoken to that today, and more people will speak to it. I don't want to speak to it um, as well, because I know the Honorable Prime Minister will speak to it. The Honorable Member for Central Kingston spoke to it. But that is a part of what we have to do, the correct mix of social interventions. But what was interesting in what the, the Honorable member for Central Kingston was saying when he was taking me back to my days running around on pasture. Nothing then, with the exception of the cadets who used to take up too much of the field. <laughs> with the exception of the cadets, all of the hundreds of people who were down there were down there without any government prodding or intervention. It wasn't, it wasn't a state program that placed them on those fields to interact and play and kick ball and hang out and everything. It was, it was a different cultural context. The cadets were definitely uh, an intervention, and a structured intervention. But I wasn't going down to play cricket and football and pasture when I came down from Frenchies because government had an anti-crime initiative going on down there. I was just going to go kick ball. But that now, the, the context now is different. And there, there is a need for interventions, you know, actual interventions to spur some of these things. And then, the reason why we're here, Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, the legislative portion of the construct, which is why we have the bill that we have before us today. Madam Speaker, I'm going to quote briefly from a case that, that the Honorable Prime Minister mentioned to give us some historical context. And I believe the Honorable Senator Bruce mentioned it. The opinion by the Chief Justice, then Chief Justice of the Court of Appeal. Um, the series of cases brought, Desmond Batiste v. the Queen, and a number of other cases. And it was a case, Madam Speaker, in 2003 when the appeal was held, that Chief Justice Byron was attempting to analyze sentencing in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and lay out some markers for what sentencing should involve in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And so they reviewed 12 appeals, magisterial appeals and high court appeals. All kind of different things, but the bulk of them were either drug charges or gun charges. And the important quotation, well, first of all, before the important quotation, Justice Byron laid out the purposes for which sentences must be imposed. To punish the offender to an extent and manner which is just in all the circumstances, so there's your punishment. To deter the offender or other persons from committing offenses of the same or similar character. To establish conditions within which it is considered by the court that rehabilitation of the offender may be facilitated. So you have so far your punishment, your deterrence, your rehabilitation. To manifest a denunciation by the court of the type of conduct in which the offender is engaged. Now I would broaden that to say it's not just a denunciation by the court. But when the legislature speaks through its elected representatives, it is representing society's view of what is a priority that should be punished and, and, and the manner in which they should be punished. To protect the community from the offender or a combination of those things. No. in analyzing the gun cases that came before the court in the late 90s, early, up to early 2000, the Chief Justice said this. I'm quoting the Chief Justice here. The concern of the public 
for the alarming incidence of firearm-related crime is not reflected in the penalties imposed by the St. Vincent and the Grenadines legislature. The current set of penalties prescribed by the legislature of St. Vincent and the Grenadines appears to be somewhat lenient. This is what Chief Justice Byron was saying in 2003, referring to cases that had come to him on appeal from a couple of years before. That at the time, our sentences for firearms were too lenient, and that the seriousness, the alarming incidence of firearm-related crime is not reflected in the penalties that were imposed at the time. And he said, the maximum penalty, this is at the time, the maximum penalty in St. Vincent and the Grenadines for discharging a firearm is, on summary conviction, a fine not exceeding $2,000 or imprisonment for a term not exceeding 12 months. So it was under a year, no more than two grand. In St. Lucia, at the same time, for example, the penalty for possession of a restricted weapon on summary conviction is a fine not less than $10,000 and a term of imprisonment not less than three years. So even then, or then, Justice Byer, the, the Chief Justice was saying, St. Vincent de Grenier said, look at its sentencing and to bring it up to speed to reflect the seriousness of the situation. In fact, Madam Speaker, in one of the cases he considered, it was a case of a 24-year-old man who was caught with a magnum, 357, and three rounds of ammunition. He reduced the sentence from six months to three months that somebody got for a magnum. He said, in the circumstances, and because of the leniency with which the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Parliament currently views this offense, we are of the view that a sentence of three months is appropriate. So he was guided. Now, there were other mitigating factors. I don't want to read the whole case. But he was guided by the fact that the legislature had put so low a punishment for firearms-related offenses that the court was guided by the legislature. If the legislature doesn't think it's a big deal, then who am I as a judge? Because the legislature is supposed to be reflecting the will of the people. So, and he goes on and he spells out in a way that became the foundation of a lot of the sentencing guidelines that still operate in the region now. To say, the, and, but the message is, the legislature must speak to the seriousness of these things and to guide the courts in that regard. Not to set mandatory minimums or mandatory this, or, but, but to guide and to indicate what is important and what is not important. And we have done that progressively over time. This is not the first time. I'm not saying that the Chief Justice said this in 2003 and now in 2024 we're getting around to, to responding. They have been uh, the, immediately after the judgment. There was a response that, that put St. Vincent and the Grandines roughly in the middle of where the sentencing was across the region. And now we are addressing it again. Madam Speaker, honorable members, the arrests in St. Vincent and the Grenadines for, violent, for possession of a firearm as one would expect, the numbers of arrests have been increasing year by year. And I want to salute the very strong efforts of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force in their attempts to address crime in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It is not an easy job for a largely unarmed constabulary to go out in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and to arrest violent crime. And, and, and these men and women perform their job bravely and with distinction, far more often than not. We focus very often on the bad stories or the shortcomings, but we have to recognize that the thousand plus uh, men and women of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force, by and large, do excellent work in keeping the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines safe, and I, I want to recognize that. I requested of 
the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution certain data related to firearm offenses. Between 2017 and 2024, there have been 420 firearm offenses. The Honorable Senator Bruce was talking about murders committed by firearm, but I'm, I'm not talking just about murders, I'm talking about firearm offenses. One hundred and twenty two of those matters to date have been completed. Possession of unlicensed firearm, possession of unlicensed ammunition, discharge of firearm in, a, in public prohibited, possession of firearm with intent to injure, possession of imitation firearm with intent. All of those have been cases that have been charged. The overwhelming majority possession of an unlicensed firearm, 62 of that 120 odd. There have been 108 convictions to date in that time period. 39 of those 108 have been by guilty plea, and 69 have been found guilty, which comes back to the point that the Honorable Prime Minister was making about the time taken to achieve a conviction. The Honorable Senator Bruce completely misrepresented the Prime Minister's point when he said that the Prime Minister is, is I don't know if afraid is the right word, that eloquent lawyers will bamboozle jurors um, with, with their flowery words. The Prime Minister was saying that if there's only a judge there, there is less need for certain lengthy processes. Not, not that he's afraid that the jurors will be bamboozled, but in a time sense, a judge will say, move along with that. I, I get your point. And let us get to this other matter. So the, the cases will conclude uh, more quickly. And as you can see in firearms cases, the majority of the cases, 60-something percent, are people who pleaded not guilty and were then found guilty. The minority of people who come in and say, all right, they catch me, I plead guilty. The majority of the people go to, do go to trial. There are currently 86 appeals ongoing. Um, there are 81 active matters separate and apart from the appeals that are working their way through the court system right now. Possession of firearm, 38. Possession of unlicensed ammunition, 27. Discharge of firearm in public, 9. Unlawful use of a firearm, 2. Possession of an imitation firearm with intent, 5. The data show, without, without, I could go further, but the data show that there is an increase in gun crimes in St. Vincent and the Grenadines related to illegal firearms. And if there is an increase, it requires a legislative response, in addition to all of the other responses that we've been talking about. Prevention, detection, deterrence, social interventions, um, different policing. I, I don't want to retread those things. I, I heard very little that I disagree with, with the exception of, of one presenter. So there's not a lot there that requires further intervention. But it is important, Madam Speaker, before I, I get to the, the final significant point that I want to make, it is important to realize that when we have these charges, these maximum charges, that sentencing guidelines almost always mean that the maximum charges are not achieved, are not, maximum penalties. maximum penalties, sorry, are not achieved. And there are sentencing guidelines, Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, issued by the courts related to firearms. A compendium sentencing guideline of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court for drugs and firearms offenses. And the court, no matter that we say in parliament, your maximum sentence is 20 years or 15 years or whatever the case may be, the court has set up its own set of guidelines within that sentence 
of how you construct a sentence. And the first step in constructing a sentence is to establish the starting point and you go forward, the consequences. And they have a sliding scale of importance. So, the highest category of consequences that the court lists, if you cause or attempt injury with a firearm, if you discharge a firearm to cause terror, if you rent or supply or deal or traffic in five or more firearms, if the firearm is particularly dangerous, for example, an assault weapon or, or a submachine gun or something like that. That is the very highest, and that, that is where they're going to put the stiffest sentences. Because what we're giving them is a no more than. You can't charge, you can't sentence me to more than this time or more than this amount of money. Then, after that highest level, there's a high level. There's more than one concealed firearm. You're renting or supplying or dealing or trafficking in firearms, but fewer than five. You're causing extensive damage to property with a firearm. You're carrying a firearm openly. Your pre the presence of a firearm, the a firearm was present during the commission of an offense. That's another level. And then they have a lesser level. The firearm was at all times concealed. So I catch you with your illegal gun, but it was concealed. There was no ammunition in the firearm or none of the other categories apply. So the court has said, I hear you, legislature. You are saying that 10 years, $20,000, whatever the case may be, is the challenge, is the, is the sentence. But we are going to then evaluate it within consequences and levels of seriousness. Other things they consider, gang membership, group activity, the firearm is associated with drugs, the firearm contains more than two rungs, the firearm had a rung in the chamber, more than 20 rungs of ammunition, those are the serious ones. Firearm is carried in a place of worship or an educational institution. So the court has laid this out, step by step. The medium level, the firearm is an imitation or brand and brandished. The firearm, though threatened, remains concealed. Boy, mine are shoot you, you know, the things on me. But you don't show it. That is different than if you point a gun in somebody's face. Um, then all the way down to the lesser one now, the presence of the firearm is not in a public place, it's unknown to others, the ammunition is not live, it's a spent shell casing and these kind of things. And when the court weighs all of these things up, they have a chart. The lowest place you can go on the chart is a non-custodial sentence. And the highest place you can go on the chart is 90% of what the legislature prescribes. Now, of course, as Honorable Senator Bruce said, there are grounds on which you can depart from your sentencing guidelines. But, but in their guidelines, all other things being equal, the most serious crime they will find, they will charge you 90% of the time that the legislature has prescribed. It means then that we have to up our charges if we want a particular response from the courts for serious firearms offenses. We can't say, why this man only get this amount of time for a gun and this man get that amount of time if we haven't adjusted the, the sentences and the penalties accordingly. Sentences in St. Vincent and the Grandines over the last five years for possession of an unlicensed firearm have ranged from being fined $1,500 to being sentenced to 18 years in jail for possession of an unlicensed firearm. Now, obviously, there are multiple circumstances in between there. The sentences for Possession of unlicensed ammunition goes from a fine of $300 to two years and 10 months in jail. For unlawful use of a firearm, 
from five years to 19 years, 18 years and nine months. These are wide ranges, and there are what the public might see as inconsistencies. How Johnny had a gun, and he got a fine, and Freddie had a gun, and he got in jail for 10 years. But there are guidelines within the judicial system to measure the severity of some of these challenges. And there are guidelines that must come from this honorable house to the court to reflect the seriousness with which we view gun crimes in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I am one more than likely a prohibited and I am an unworthy. Yes, and those higher ones would have been high court matters, they could have been in commission of another crime and all sorts of other things that, that are involved there. But that is the context in which we are setting the sentences that we set today, Madam Speaker, Honorable Members. Now I want to come briefly to some of the points made by the Honorable Minister of Tourism when he was trying to give some international context to our battle against guns in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Because let us not fool ourselves and pretend that we exist in a vacuum. As the Honorable Senator Bruce said, we don't manufacture guns in St. Vincent and Grenadines. As the Honorable Minister of Tourism said, we are in a dangerous neighborhood between the supply of guns in the north in the United States and the supply of drugs in the south, in South America. And guns and drugs traffic our region back and forth. And that adds context to our challenge with guns and, 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 and ammunition and our responses to guns and ammunition. Because, yes, we have, a, we have something to do with sentencing. Yes, we have something to do at the port with, with, with Senator Brown. Yes, we have to hire the police officers and pay them. By the way, Honorable Member for East Kingston, this budget, as we said in the budget speech, the government is spending $105 million on citizen security in all of its aspects. That is not an insignificant amount of money. But... We also have to be cognizant of our international context. And this government has been a leader by absolutely any measure of creating international pressure in support of attempts to restrict and manage small arms and light weapons coming into St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the region. We have been an absolute leader. Yes, Honorable Prime Minister. We had, Madam Speaker, St. Vincent and the Grenadines played a leading role at the United Nations. The Honorable Member for East Kingston said, oh, you're not doing enough in the international fora. St. Vincent and the Grenadines played a leading role in the UN program of action to prevent, combat, and eradicate the illicit trade in small arms and light weapons at the United Nations. And that is a globally agreed framework for activities to counter the illicit trade in small arms and light weapons. And then, having played a leading role in the UN program of action to prevent small arms, we played a leading role in CARICOM in negotiating the CARICOM position in the Arms Trade Treaty at the United Nations. And the Arms Trade Treaty places restrictions. Well, it says this treaty shall apply to all conventional, conventional arms within the following categories, and they list them. And one of them is small arms and light weapons. And that is your handgun, your assault rifle, your, your submachine, ratatatatata. And that arms trade treaty places export controls on countries that export firearms. Arms trade treaty says that a country should not export firearms to another country. If, among other things, 
the exporting country believes it would contribute to or undermine peace and security in the country that they're exporting to. Or if exporting the gun, it may be used to commit or facilit facilitate an act constituting an offense under international conventional protocols relating to transnational organized crime in which this exporting state is a party. So we signed a treaty, negotiated it hard, fought. I, I, I may have had something to do with it at the time, so I'm very familiar with it. That said, an exporting country cannot or should not export firearms to a country if they believe it can destabilize the peace in that country. So it's one thing if you're sending it to my police force. It's another thing if you're selling it to somebody to unsell or to a militia or something. And if the countries are located in the neighborhood that I was located in, between the guns and the drugs, we have to watch that. And there are controls on export, and there are controls on reporting, and there are controls on licensing. All of that in a treaty that we negotiated at the UN level because we recognize that the forces that, that drive guns into our region are not simply located within St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In fact, the majority of the forces are located outside of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I'm not saying that we don't have a role. Obviously, we have an important role to play. But the guns aren't coming from Trumaca. They're coming from Texas. And the cocaine ain't coming from Calico. It's coming from Colombia. And we have to understand the things that transit our area and the responses that we have to make. Additionally, and, and most recently, Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Members, St. Vincent and the Grenadines was one of the early supporters and advocates for a case that the Mexican government is bringing in the United States of America. Yep. The case is called Estados Unidos Mexicanos, as the United States of Mexico, versus Smith & Wesson brand, Barrett Firearms, Barretta USA Corp, Glock Incorporated, Ruger & Company, Whitmer Public Safety Group, Century International Arms, Barretta Holdings, and Colt Manufacturing Company. And we at the request of the Mexican government, we're one of the first countries to say we will support this litigation against these United States companies in the United States of America. Is it, is it like Come into that, Prime Minister. Yes. Mexico brought the lawsuit in Massachusetts seeking damages and injunctive relief. They're asking for $10 billion from the gun companies. Mexico made the point that in all of Mexico, they have one gun shop. One. But 500,000 guns enter Mexico illegally from the United States every year. And they said, the United States of America is making these guns, is marketing these guns, is exporting these guns, is, is allowing for these guns to be transshipped, is creating guns that can easily be converted from from um, semi-automatic to automatic and is flooding Mexico with guns to the tune of $170 million annually so that they can make a profit. And, and the court first said, look, man, in America, we have a lot of say could build gun and sell gun. So we train out that case. And the Mexican government, again, with our support, appealed that and that case is ongoing because the appeal court said this is a good case to answer. And it is there partially because of the strong support of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and other countries in the Caribbean. So let's not say that, oh, they want to raise the, 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 the sentence from 15 years to 20 years. That's not a panacea. Obviously, it's not a panacea. But it is just one plank in a multi-plank platform that we're using to try to address the issue of firearms in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, honorable members, we just had 
a summit, the largest diplomatic event ever in the history of St. Vincent and the Grandees, the Silak Summit in Bukament. And negotiated by our Honorable Prime Minister was not just a recognition and support now by Silak for the Mexican litigation. But this following element in the declaration, we commit, we the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, commit to deepen cooperation mechanisms in the fight against transnational organized crime, corruption, illicit drug trafficking, and the illicit trafficking of firearms, ammunition, and explosives, the trafficking in persons, migrants smuggling, and crimes that affect um, the environment, money laundering, and other related crimes. This man placed the issue of illegal firearms squarely on the agenda of Latin America and the Caribbean and said that we have to cooperate as a region yes. in the fight against illicit firearms. Because we know they're not coming from here, but we know they're coming from other countries that have their own struggles with gun violence. And the recognition by the Honorable Prime Minister was that we all have to work together. It's not just we all have to work together on both sides of the house. Of course, all right-thinking Vincentians. I don't know any right-thinking Vincentian who is in favor of gun violence. None of us are. But it is bigger than the people in this room. And it is bigger than the population of this country. It is a global scourge with a regional focus in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean, Haiti, Jamaica, Latin America. So we have structured this particular piece of legislation, Madam Speaker, within that context. We came from a position where the court said we weren't serious enough. We were too lenient on gun crimes. We have addressed that on multiple occasions. We're addressing it again today. We come from a position where we recognize that there are multiple things you have to do to combat gun crime, and that we have done many of them, um, from the port to pan against crime to, to you know, social activities and all the rest of it. We have recognized that there is a regional component. The Honorable Minister of Tourism mentioned the CARICOM declaration that gun violence is a public health emergency. It's a public health issue in the region. We recognize the, the role that the United States plays in sending guns to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It might not be the government of the United States. Might not be. Not saying it is not. If you do your history and you learn about something called Iran Contra, you remember that the U.S. was actively shipping guns into countries, the U.S. government. But we recognize that U.S. gun manufacturers and illegal operators in the U.S. are filing, filing down PIN and filing off serial number of a gun and making gun kits to send guns down here in pieces. You get the muzzle this week, you come down with some tools, the man in the port don't even re recognize they have a muzzle among the spanner and the wrench and everything else that come down. Next week, the trigger come down. The week after that, the next piece come down. You, you assemble it down here. U.S. sources, we recognize that. We recognize as well, I'm wrapping up, Madam Speaker, but we recognize as well that there are people in St. Vincent and the Grenadines who are active gun traffickers. There's some people who take a joyride in their yacht up to one island and come back with something else in the hole. And there are people who are legal owners of guns who do a brisk trade in ammunition with people who don't have license for guns. Don't worry, I go buy 10 rungs because I have a licensed firearm. I go squeeze off two for you. And if anybody asks me where I put them, I go tell them I shoot them down by the range. That happens. And we recognize all of those contexts as intersecting and overlapping and complex. And this piece of legislation is but one tool in a big toolbox 
designed to combat guns and gun crime in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We all agree that it is important to reflect this parliament's anger with the issue of gun crime in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It just takes one man with one gun to create havoc in our society. And one gun is one gun too many. But we know that this is a battle that requires, as everybody has been saying, all hands on deck. I'm hoping that political hyperbole aside, a few people couldn't resist a little bit of politics. I don't want to engage them on it because it's a serious issue that doesn't need that. And I also remember the prayer that you give us at the beginning of every parliament that we're here for the peace, prosperity, and welfare of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. That is what this legislation is about. It's about peace. It's about love amongst our brethren and neighbors. And it's about an eradication together of gun crimes and gun violence in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Not an easy road, but it's a road, as the Honorable Member for Central Kingston said, we have to try to walk together. I'm obliged, Madam Speaker. For the debate, for the debate, for the debate, yes, I recognize the Honorable yeah. Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, I'd like to thank all Honorable Members for their contributions. Half an hour. And you're going to hear me for half an hour. You're going to hear me for half an hour. I listened to you for 45 minutes. Okay, fine. Um, I know you love me, you know. Uh, Heavenly Father. Yes. Madam Speaker, I want to begin with a metaphor. And I want the entire country to understand that the Prime Minister... is not impartial, metaphorically, between fire and the fire brigade. I'm not impartial as between fire and the fire brigade. That's the metaphor. So if anybody has any doubt that you have a choice between the fire and the fire brigade, I'm always going to side with the fire brigade. I also want to say this in the light of many things which have been said. There are some sins, Madam Speaker, which have been codified in law, as, in civil law, as criminal offenses, and others which have not been, sensibly. One of the sins which has been codified as a criminal offense is that of murder. I don't know that any pastor, any theologian ever said that the reason for the sin of murder, of killing unlawfully with intent, that the reason for that is poverty or unemployment. I also want to say the following. That sin is normal. The absence of sin is abnormal. But we know that there is redemption from sin. Before we die, we can all be redeemed from whatever sin we have committed. 
But the reason why Christ went on Calvary Cross and died there for our sins, including the sin of murder, is to help us who live after that to be redeemed. So sin is normal in human civilization. The absence of sin is abnormal. But those who sin can be redeemed. Crime, I'll follow the logic, is normal. The absence of crime is abnormal. The critical question which faces all of us in this society and in all other societies, what is the level of ab abnormality of crime that it is tolerable? We all conclude across here, both sides, that the extent of the crime of murder homicide in St. Vincent and the Grenadines today is not tolerable, it's unacceptable. And that is one of the reasons why we are here with this bill. Madam Speaker, in 2003, we presented to this parliament a 14-point strategy for addressing crime. And it has been refreshed over the period since then. And a year, two years ago, we put it in a booklet and we relaunched it. And many of the things which have been spoken about here today are included in that 14-point strategy. And we have been following it. And we have been spending lots of money in following it. In relation to citizen security alone, as the Minister, the Honorable Minister of Finance just pointed out, is $105 million. The police alone is about $44 million. I'm talking about the Coast Guard, I'm talking about the prisons. The police alone, I'm not talking about contributions to the RSS, to impacts. I'm not talking about those kinds of things too, in the 44, because they all add up towards getting you to the 105 million. What you spend on the judiciary is part and parcel of the fight of the law and order component, citizen security component. It's a lot of money. And we have pretty much doubled the police force since 2001. And on the 25th of this month, we are having a passing out parade at Victoria Park for 110 police recruits who are going to be inducted as police officers. The quality of persons educationally entering the police force is getting higher and higher. The level of training is improving. But that level of training, initial training, could even be better. The salaries and working conditions of the police, though they can be improved, are better by far than that they have ever been. And as we had in the budget, there are some important capital elements for security, citizen security, we we're hoping that we would have signed that loan, which has some with Saudi Arabia, the new loan, but that's going to be signed on the 18th of this month in Washington. Minister of Finance will sign it there. Just got the information. God, there were some 
exchange of, of drafts, where there's some differences here and there, but all those have been sorted out. Now, Madam Speaker, the Coast Guard The Coast Guard today is better equipped, better staffed than at any time in the history of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Still, we have to do more. For example, we have the offshore patrol vessel. I'm informed that we are the only country in the OECS that has an offshore patrol vessel. Cost us nearly $20 million from Damien Shipyard in Holland. In fact, there's going to be a big international conference of small states in Antigua. And I've given the Coast Guard permission as part of the security arrangements for that, for our Coast Guard or, or Captain Hugh Mulzak, that vessel, the offshore patrol vessel to be there during the three, four days but we all cooperate within the framework of the RSS. I've dealt with the prisons earlier. We have established certain control mechanisms at the port. As we say, don't we have at Arnesville, we we have at sorry at Argyle, we have down at Camden Park, which is the largest, the larger of the two ports of entry, the, the container port. I just want to say, Madam Speaker, sometimes bureaucracies can hold us up. When it was reported to me that customs and port were having discussions among themselves and even arguments as to who should be controlling the, this particular piece of equipment. I had to tell them, I said, guys, listen, cut the crap out. Huh? Customs and port don't have a suicide pact. Let's get this thing organized, man. And thankfully it was done. But I should not have to intervene there. We have established a National Commission on Crime Prevention and we are strengthening it. The police is using a number of new approaches, including on to today, the, the acting, the Deputy Commissioner informed me where they were going out and doing some additional community policing and having the meetings and meeting the people and so on. And, and things were, 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 were going well because I also asked them when they were going in South Rivers because I wanted, and that is probably in two weeks' time, because I want to know. I want to, the community is very irate about, yes, I think Lomans is this evening. Community is very irate in South of us about this murder, this killing, this homicide. And um, I want people to turn out with the police and to be speaking to some of the issues. Social protection has been strengthened as never before. The education revolution, which is also a crime-fighting measure. The cadet corps, very dear, naturally, to the member, the honorable member for Central Kingston. He, he knows that after he had left the leadership, that there had been a decline. And when we arrived, you had just about 100 cadets. Now you have over 1,200, maybe 1,300, including a marine wing. We need to even do better, and we have to 
provide them with a headquarters. Overdue, yes, I agree with that. Targeted measures, pan against crime, all the sport initiatives, yes, set on site, prime, police youth clubs, all of these things. All those are what Senator Bruce talked about, the, the preventative basket. Specifically in relation to dealing with firearms. Madam Speaker, we amended the law to establish the firearms, the licensing authority. Rather than having the commissioner of police alone determining it. We invested two and a half million dollars in a shooting range. And this is very important, particularly for women. A lot of women own their firearm, you know, they have licensed firearms because they do training at the shooting range. Because if you're going to provide guns legally, people are going to buy guns and you give them license for them. You have to learn to shoot. You don't want it to be a danger to yourself when you own it. All these things are, which we have had there, the Honorable Minister of Tourism and the Honorable Minister of Finance spoke to us, the representations which we have made with the USA. We are working very much in the region through the IRSS, the Implementation, Implementing Agency for Crime and Security in CARICOM, the CARICOM leadership itself. We in CARICOM added security, citizen security, as the fourth pillar of CARICOM, joining with foreign policy, economic integration and economic trade, and generally the functional cooperation in all the other social and other matters. All of these things, we are strengthening the economy, diversifying it, building it. I just want to say this, factually, there is less indigence by far today, Less poverty today than any time in the history of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. There are more people employed today than, in Saint Vin than ever before in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, in 2022, I've just saw the statistics. There were 1,600 and something more persons who are active registrants in, in, in um. 2022 at the NIS as employees. In 2023, about 1,800 and something. And you can feel it. You can see it. Know that we have people on the, the streets. We have people on the streets. When we came to office, we did a count. Um... There were 29 young people who were living on the streets in Kingston. Most of them had come out from the countryside. How many young people we have living on the streets in Kingston now? Perhaps a number, the same in the region of 29. People change and they, some come in and they go and so on. Huh? Transient. No. As far as I'm aware, none of the persons who are living, who are living on the streets has ever been accused of murder. The persons who, many, many persons who have been engaged in, in, in being charged for murder, many of them and many who provide leadership for particularly, particular associational groups, if you don't want to call them gangs because some of them have not been solidified into gangs, and they, have a, they are more fluid in their organization. They're not rigid like in some structures like, like gangs. Like in some countries like gangs. Many of those pers young men, persons who have gone to secondary school, including the grammar school. And this is where 
Do I, do I heard the honorable leader, sorry, the honorable member for Central Kingston. He had to naturally say that Senator Bruce and the honorable member for, Central, for East Kingston that their presentations were excellent, though he scaled Senator Bruce's own a little higher with his language than that of um, the Honorable Member for East Kingston. But his analysis is the analysis which I have been given. He says that there are these young persons, the small group, he thinks it's larger, but this group of young persons who have this, who go to, to, to crime, he says that they have chosen to go so. I've been making this point. And why have they chosen? Important question. And yes, proffered some ideas, some hypotheses, and maybe even some theories beyond hypotheses. Seeking to ground them in causal relationship between facts, between phenomena, to give us some predictability in that regard. But that's the difference between a theory and a, and a hypothesis, which is a tentative relationship between two sets of phenomena. No. Why? Every single person, from my experience, and, Madam Speaker, in 20 years of practicing law across the region, I did close to 50 homicides. And other than a couple of cases where I had to plead the defense of insanity or diminished responsibility. That practically every single one of the others wanted to be somebody. Just like how all of us in here when we were young want to be somebody. And it is natural but we here, and others like us, and I don't know how many of us were born with a silver spoon in our mouth, in our respective mouths. We decided, among other things, that education and training and discipline will help us to be somebody. But there are some persons who have chosen not to go for education and discipline and training and hard work to be somebody by listening to their parents, their teachers and community guidance and all the rest of it. No. No. They have taken a decision to eschew all of that and to take for themselves an easier path, drugs, a hustle, money, easy with with, with um, stealing. You think these young men who are intelligent enough to know how to use noxious substances and go and obtain noxious substances and break in people's houses with these noxious substances, knocking them out and robbing them, you think they are not intelligent people who want to make something of themselves, who want to be somebody, sorry, but they have chosen a different path. And I want this to get in 
to our heads. And we must not excuse people with killing and say that it is because of poverty make them kill. We must stop that. This is why I said, I began with the metaphor. Between, Madam Speaker, the fire and the fire brigade, I'm not impartial. My knowledge, my study, my experiences all around have brought me to this particular point. Because in one home, there would be two boys from the same mother, the same poor circumstances. One of them will end up as a professor at a university and another one will be inside of his majesty's prisons. We have to give people second chances. But we must not make the excuses. By the way, that is what underpins the suggestion. It would be interesting to hear more about it, how it would work. The suggestion by the Honorable Member for Central Kingston about a boot camp. It's a second chance, maybe a third chance, but implicit and arising, implicit is that, in that, is his own analysis, which is correct, that they have chosen to go on a particular path. And we have to try to intervene to help them. He says he's not sure whether this will work. And, and, and I agree with him. It may or may not work. It may work for five people out of 20. But we have to do like in the book of Ecclesiastes. The ancient Hebrew people. We try something in the morning. And if it doesn't work, we try a different thing in the evening. Because we do not know which one will work whether the one in the morning or the one in the evening or whether both of them will work. Precisions in this matter we cannot find. And then I heard the honorable member and I'm always very sensitive about this. We have explained the issue in relation to integrity legislation. But then when he goes and says that one of the things which fuel crime is corruption in public office. Well, I'm in public office. And when you put the brush so, brush so wide, it includes me. Or at least the innuendo is that it includes me, even though it's not expressly said. Well, I'm not going to do anything personal here today, this evening. But I may at some time. Because I don't like when anybody makes any, make any such suggestion. False, wrong, should not be done. And while he's saying it, he's saying that we must not be political on this question. Yeah? No, no. Those kind of cheap politics. We, we, we got to leave them when we're discussing serious business. Madam Speaker, Transparency International, the recognized global entity in addressing transparency across 180 countries which they, you can check it out. We are less than 20% of the countries in the world which Transparency International said among the ones who have the most transparency and who has the most hygienic of the political systems. That's not me. That is Transparency International. 
and I've made this point repeatedly, there are several offenses in the criminal code relating to official corruption. In fact, there's a section in the code, Madam Speaker, and this, this is given, it, it, it's, it's given as though there, there's no, no legislation, and I'm not saying the legislation should not be tightened, and we're trying to get one for across the whole of the OECS, and we have had difficulties for all kinds of reasons. Um, let me find it, Madam Speaker. And I, 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 I have to answer this. People in St. Vincent and the Grenadines would accuse Ralph of many things. But one of the things I've never heard it said, that Ralph is corrupt. Once when they tried it with BBC, the BBC people resigned because they were being fueled here by a, some information which was politically jaundiced. And I dare them. It's one thing I don't do. I don't get involved in that sort of a activity with people who know me. He didn't, nobody said me personal, but when you, when you put the net so wide, and I'm, a, I'm the head of the fountain, they might want to drag me in that kind of foolishness, foolish allegation. I wouldn't stand for it. Um... I'll, I'll, I'll find, I'll find, ah, chapter five. Offenses against the administration of lawful authority. 85, official corruption. 86, extortion by public officers. 87, public officers receiving property to show favor. 89, abuse of office. These are some of the offenses, you know. And there's a common law offense called misbehavior in public office. The particulars of which, the particulars of which are as wide as the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean put together. And you're found guilty of that indictable offense? <laughs> you're going in jail. You hear me? So I, Madam Speaker, What I've done here is to show you what we have been doing within the framework of the 14-point strategy. I've outlined every single one of the elements. I've dealt with the general issue, broad of causation of crime. Madam Speaker, it doesn't mean that there's not a milieu in which hardship may prompt someone to do something. You're hungry, you'll go inside a supermarket. You, you may try, you may take a, a, a loaf of bread. But that, that will make you kill somebody. That will make you rape, so, rape somebody. Eh? That would make you break somebody's house. That is the kind of sophomoric analysis which serious people addressing crime, including Professor Anthony Harriot, who headed the unit, the department, honorable member for Central Kingston at the University of West Indies in Jamaica. And there's, a, there's research work doing there, and I, I, can, I, can, I can lend you one or two of the books which he has written. Um, so long as you sign that, you'll return them to me in a reasonable period of... <laughs> I'm sure you would. Um, Madam Speaker, we are in a dangerous neighborhood. And this dangerous neighborhood is not only with the ease of the guns coming, but the coke and greed of people. And I'll, I'll say this. 
there is a species of music. And on social media, certain things, and on YouTube and so on. I'm not deaf and I'm not blind. I go on social media, I go on YouTube, and a number of things pop up. I listen to the music and some of it. If you don't have the maturity of mind and the understanding of things, and all of this thing with this fascination with guns. And intermingling, Madam Speaker. And they don't like me to say this. Many of these young men are a tiny minority in this country. But they're intertwining of all of that with some young ladies who also want easy money. When I say that, they say that I'm talking against women. I'm not talking against women. I'm, 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 I'm talking about facts because the vast majority of young men and young women in this country are doing fantastically well. There's a case and I see Superintendent Bailey has come inside here. And yet I have discussed this and we share. He, he agrees with my perspective on this, you know. I ask him if he thinks I'm wrong. He tells me no on the basis of his experience. Get, <laughs> and he... <laughs> the assistant commissioner, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, Madam, <laughs> Madam Speaker, the... This, this matter... There's a case. There's a fellow who went to grammar school who took a life of crime. He's in prison. He had three women living with him. And when the tenth of the month comes, he's like a lord and king with the three women, you know, three young women. He will then say, and the evidence emerged, how are we going to pay for this house rent and the food and buy all the nice things, the, the nice dan dan them and all kind of various things? Deciding which drug deal to be made, which place to be broken, who to get to do which job. And the ladies spill the beans after because they, they saw the light. They saw the light. So don't you see this man who is 77 years old? I have experiences all about. And I came from the root of this society. I know the rural folk. I know the urban because I lived many years as a student in the depressed communities in the city. And one of the reasons why I have survived in politics for, for so long, Madam Speaker, and been here for 23 years and counting. If you wake me up any morning and put something to me as to what I think the people will accept or not accept, I could tell you with accuracy what they will accept and what they don't accept. And sometimes I will say, when I tell them this first, they wouldn't accept it. But when I explain it to them, they will accept it. And leadership also has to guide people. And I'm making one final plea here in the parliament today, Madam Speaker. I'm saying to the young people, and I want the media who hear me, I want them to repeat it. Going to guns and going to follow greed with cocaine and breaking people place and robbery and fraud these things are going to end you up in jail or in the symmetry there are some madam speaker who are realizing this right now or no they want to get out of the country And I make this final point. You go to the magistrate court. 
You go to the high court. I don't see anybody who in the cadet corps there. I don't see anybody who finish in school there. I don't see people in the yes or the set or in the sports or on site or police youth club or prime. I don't see any of them pleading guilty to any criminal offense. They are being charged with any criminal offense or being found guilty. The, the opportunities galore to be taken. And for the young man who I believe is entirely mythical who graduate from the community college and who hasn't worked in 10 years. I said to him, if you're not mythical, you might be a needle in the haystack. Come look for the comrade. I ain't got two rabbit to give. And I wouldn't demean you by giving you two rabbit. I will talk with you about funding a program for your degree at the University of the West Indies. Coming to improve your skills. Coming to the apply to go to university for September. Let we together help to lift you higher. Not to rabbit for a community college graduate. I don't believe it though. <laughs> but if you exist, come look for the comrade. Madam Speaker, I beg to move the third reading of this bill. Beg to move, Madam Speaker, that a bill for an act to amend the Firearms Act. Chapter 386 of the Laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines be read a third time by title and passed. Honorable members, the question is that a bill for an act to amend the Firearms Act, Cap 386, be read a third time by title and passed. As many as are that opinion, say aye. Aye. As many as are the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Madam Clark. Firearms Amendment Act 2024, adjournment. M Madam Speaker, there are some important bills which we are trying to get together for um, including the, including the, the bill the, the agreement which the Honorable, Prime, uh, Honorable Minister of Finance would be signing in Washington. And I think he's going to be there. He comes back on the 20th. Has, that has to be formatted. While we do other things, I'd like to see that one. I will say comfortably the work which we have to do, the preparatory work and to give, par to give parliamentarians the requisite notice of the bills. I will say Tuesday the 14th of May at 10 o'clock. We'll therefore have about five weeks to have everything together. Accordingly, Madam Speaker, I beg to move that this Honorable House do stand adjourned until Tuesday, the 14th of May at 10 a.m. Honorable Members, the question is that this House do stand adjourned until Tuesday, the 14th May. 2024 at 10 a.m. As many as are that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. House stands the journey.